Chapter 1101 Plastic Stone Joan noticed that his friends were all looking at him, and he nodded, saying that Billing really did not brag. Joan, how did the demon spider and Voris find you, and how did you defeat these two monsters? Evelyn asked curiously. It's a long story, but ask Billing. Kiaan digressed. Since it's safe here, I'm out of escort. I have an urgent matter to deal with. We'll be back soon, Evelyn, Cassette and Billing looked at Joan's back and turned away, looking at each other inexplicably. Don't care, Joan is of this character. Try not to speak without speaking. Holden smiled and excused his friend. Our genius mage is full of academic questions and creative ideas, so we are too lazy to worry about vulgar and trivial things. We better not bother him. Evelyn nodded deliberately and turned to Billing to ask what happened to him and Joan in the hilltop garden. Dot. Joan turned back and went back alone to the place where he had just battled the giant stone spider. The broken body of the giant stone spider is still lying on the spot, surrounded by a circle of biting fingers looking at the lively little gnome. Joan squeezed through the crowd, and with the gnome watching curiously, he took out his pen and painted the number 4 Un Rune Ansues on the belly of the giant stone spider, analyzing the attachment of this superlad structure spells. As Joanne wished, a set of spell configurations was successfully resolved. He glanced through it first, and could not help secretly staggering. The configuration of this spell is very complicated, the level is too high, with his current spell casting ability. He can only barely understand some fur. Joan didn't waste time to study this seven ring spell called plastic stones into spiders. He sat on the chest of the giant stone spider, and the spell book was spread on his knees. Let's copy this spell first. It took about half an hour for Joan to write down the complete configuration of the spell configuration of plastic stone into spider. Putting away the pen and spell book. Joan stood up and stretched out with satisfaction. At this moment, the boulder underneath trembles suddenly. Joan glanced down and found that the giant stone spider stepping on his feet was shrinking sharply. After a few seconds, it had shrunk from its original huge mountain shape into a small stone just the kind of common stones everywhere. Dot. Joan picked up the stone under his feet and looked closely. He could not detect the fluctuation of the magic power. It seemed that Claudia's magic on the stone had been exhausted, so the giant stone spider returned to its original form. Throwing away the stone, Joan secretly rejoiced, but fortunately, when he came back in time, before the giant stone spider exhausted its magic power, he copied its spell plastic stone into spider copied it, and finally there was no busy seeing the lively little gnomes around. There was a fierce argument. Some people think that it was Mr. Master who shrunk the giant rock spider into a stone. Others firmly believe that there are no boulder spiders, but that they are nothing more than illusions applied to small stones to scare people. Mr. Mage cracked the illusion, and Xiao Shizi recovered his original appearance. As for the dispute between the two sides, Kiao and Fu smiled, did not express any opinion silently turned around and walked back to his friends. Joan, you are just here. I have something to discuss with you. Audrey saw Joan coming back, his face dignified, and finally a little smile appeared. Just now I and Evelyn discussed the causes and consequences of this attack, and the conclusion is very optimistic. Joan nodded and motioned for her to continue. Olnil underground city and garden town are hundreds of miles away. The Dark Elves and the local residents have always had no grudges. Claudia will not run for destruction for no reason. She is likely to follow us. The purpose is to kidnap Billin and recapture the treasure map. It is indeed possible. Joan agreed with the analysis made by Audrey. Her Royal Highness looked back at the Dwarf Mage, and took a step closer to Joan, almost leaning to his ear, lowering his voice and saying, Berlin. The Disaster Star. Take the disaster wherever you go. If he is allowed to stay in Garden Township, the Dark Elves will come to trouble sooner or later. We might as well take Billin, leave here immediately, teleport to the camp of the Jin Lungian mine, and then transfer back from there to the school. Billing uses the mine's teleportation ray to return to his hometown of Sudri Rock. This is what I think. What do you think? I have no opinion. 
Just do what you say. Joanne felt that Audrey had considered it properly, especially in the current situation, and it was indeed inappropriate for everyone to stay in Huayuan Township, and to bring disaster to this rare and quiet place in this dark area. Audrey shook his hand vigorously, seeming to be relieved by his support, turned back, and in front of everyone announced the decision she had just made. Evelyn and Cosette listened to her and said she was about to leave. She was shocked and stayed. Although Holden and Hayala were also a bit reluctant, they knew in their hearts that staying here would probably cause more trouble for the people in Huayun Township. Audrey proposed to leave immediately, which was a wise decision. Among all, the most fierce opposition is billing. Why are you in a hurry? Isn't it good for us to play here? I don't want to go home. The gnome mage couldn't help but protest loudly. Audrey stared fiercely at this guy who had no point in her heart, and her beautiful sapphire eyes were murderous. Billing was terrified by her fierce eyes, and threw out her tongue, daring not to talk again. Now that the matter is over, Evelyn and Cassette no matter how reluctant they can't stay. They tearfully hug and say goodbye to everyone and promise to contact each other in the future. Joan hugged the girl with the red eyes around her eyes, and whispered to tell her to take care of the blood moss, and then launched the last teleport scroll. The teleportation beam soared into the sky, and after a short dizziness, Joan opened his eyes and found himself and his companions returning to the familiar Jin Lungium mining area again. Next, Joan, Hayala. Audrey and Holden will return to the school directly through the local transfer station. Berlin's hometown of Sudri's Rock City has already signed a covenant with the colonial government of Midgard, so Blin can borrow the mining station to send it directly back to his hometown. When it came time to break up, Billing was still unwilling, complaining with a sigh, the splendid adventure has just begun. How are you going to go home? Too disappointed. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest. Chapter 1102 Back to the surface when he was about to return home, Billing also tried to encourage everyone to accompany him to find the treasure of the dragon Fafernia. However, Everyone has already seen through the essence of his disaster star mixed with this dwarf boy, surely there is no good thing. What is the treasure of Fafna? Forget it. Except for the brave Bilin, there is no second person here who wants to die, all decisively rejecting his invitation. Billing disappointed with his face and disappeared into the teleportation array. Until the last moment, he repeatedly told Joan that they must communicate with him frequently. Seeing Billin's figure disappear in the transmission of light, Joan couldn't help but feel lost. Although everyone doesn't like Billin's self-contained disaster star attribute, this naive dwarf boy has regarded these passers-by who have met each other as real friends. Billin's personality is too lively and optimistic, too tumultuous, and inevitably gives people the impression of provoking trouble as if fearing the world is not chaotic. But conscientiously speaking, this little gnome has absolutely no bad heart. On the contrary, during the side-by-side -side battle on the hilltop garden, Joan discovered many valuable qualities from him. For example, enthusiasm, kindness, and extraordinary courage, not to mention his generosity and generosity. Except for stealing the Dark Elves' treasure maps. Billin did nothing wrong with them during their time with them. The reason for the difference in this slightly regrettable way may be that he is too naive to treat anyone it is a sincere, do not understand the world. Dot. Later that day, Joan and his team returned to the school and handed over the biological specimens and new maps from the trip to Mr. Locke. The settlement was finally completed, and each person received ten internship points. Joan, their underground trip. Adventure is only a secondary purpose, the main purpose is to look forward to the old friend Evelyn. Did not have high expectations for internship points. Even so, there are still many gains from this trip. The new lie mapped maps include the mushroom field, the area around Orkney underground city, and the blood tundra. The collected biological specimens include tentacle monsters, phantom mushrooms, air spore eyes, dark elves blood moss insects, purple mushrooms, 
and various rare plants and fungi in Garden Township. The only regret of this trip is that no valuable or specimens were obtained and no points were credited for this project. Fortunately, there are already a lot of 10 internship points. What's more important is that everyone returned to the school peacefully according to Mr. Locke. It is worth their thanks to the gods for blessing. 200 miles south of Huayuan Township, a dark beam of blood tundra suddenly raised a beam of teleportation light, and a large, dilapidated figure emerged from it. Cough, it, where is the old lady? With an aura of anxiety, the demon spider Lingaling struggled to complete the teleportation and jump back to the material world from the spirit world. The biggest shortcoming of the ability of outbound transmission is that it is difficult to accurately locate. The real landing point always has a random error from the expected transmission point. When Lingaling is in good health, the transmission error can still be within her controllable range, not too far away from her destination. However, at this moment, she is already in danger of life, and she is unable to control the delivery point. Lingaling's face was left with a single eye intact. The rest of her eyes were exploded by Joan and her eyesight was severely damaged. She barely opened her blood-soaked eyes and looked around. The blood moss growing everywhere, and the undulating mushrooms around her, made her feel a little calmer. It seems that the transmission deviation is not too big, at least here is the dark area, and most of it is still in the blood tundra. Lingaling tried to stand up, but just moved her body. A sudden pain forced her to fall to the ground, and she spurted a large pool of blood. The body that was hit badly moved slightly as if she were about to fall apart, and compared with the physical pain, what made her more unbearable was the mental torture. Brain wave gun and dominant insect unite to make waves in her mind, tearing her will in half and forming two opposing personalities. The personality conflict made her at a loss and the bursts of nerve tingling made her worry that her head might explode at any time. Lingaling -ling lay on the blood tundra and gasped hard. Just as she was about to fall into a coma, she suddenly felt a mental wave from Claudia. Her mistress, by blessing the two rings of care on her in advance, sensed that she was in a terrible state of life and was surprised to summon with magic and ask her what was going on. Lingaling -ling wanted to respond to Claudia's inquiry, asking the hostess to come to rescue herself, but in the end, the deputy personality controlled by the dominant insect jumped out and warned her not to do such stupid things. Stupid Lingaling, -ling. the task that Claudia has delivered to you has failed. If you go back like this, the cold-blooded and ruthless black-skinned will definitely not spare you, and at least ask you to eat a whipping. Depending on your current physical condition, eat a whiplash, I am afraid that you will be beaten alive. Instead of looking for the vicious drow woman, it is better to go back and look for the younger brother of the master. The younger brother of the master is a kind-hearted person and will treat you gently. Shut up. What are you shit? Lingaling's master personality roared to interrupt her deputy personality. Don't you fall into such a state, or into you all the poisonous hands of the little mage? He treats you so cruelly and beats you like garbage. If you go back to him, isn't it tantamount to finding your own way? Don't think about it anymore, ask Claudia for help only her magic can save your life. No, listen to me, shut up, don't lie there. Dot. The antagonism between the two opposing personalities made Ling Ling's headaches unbearable and moaned in despair. The blood that had penetrated from her diffused in the air, exuding a strong gas attracting predators in the deep forest. There were rustling movements around the mushroom forest, and countless strange figures emerged from the forest and gathered towards Ling Ling's collapsed area. It was a group of purple mushrooms rooted in the nearby forest, with a total of no fewer than 40 or 50 strains. All were crawling towards Ling Ling under the temptation of gas, and tentacles soaked in acid were found from the holes in the cap. When the first purple mushroom approached, Lingaling, -ling, motivated by her survival instinct, reluctantly waved only one catch. Ah, a cold light flashed through the air, and the purple mushroom broke its waist. The rest of the mushrooms stopped in shock and hid outside the attack range of the giant scythe of the gargoyle spider, struggling to throw out long whip-like tentacles and whipping crazy towards her. Like Master Mr. Joan. 
please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1103 Soul Gem The knife just now has exhausted Ling Ling's remaining physical energy. Faced with countless long whips lashing over, she was unable to resist or evade. She could only lie on the ground and endure the whiplash of purple mushrooms. If it is in a healthy state and it takes less than two minutes, Ling Ling can cut the poisonous mushrooms in the community's underground rocks into pieces, and at the same time ensure that she is not injured. But now she has been seriously injured and is dying. The original strong exoskeleton carapace has been smashed by Joan, which can't help her resist the whiplash of purple mushrooms. The acid that comes with the whipping is a deadly threat. The demon spider naturally possesses a physique that resists acid erosion and most of the whipping mushrooms cannot damage her. However, there is always a limit to the resistance. As long as the mushrooms break through Ling Ling's resistance every 10 attacks, she will accumulate less and more, and eventually her large and weak body will be corroded into a sour pus blood. The greedy poisonous mushrooms sucked. At this critical moment in life, the two personalities in Ling Ling's mind are still in dispute. The master urges her to ask Claudia for help and the deputy personality insists on going back to find Joan. The extreme pain and hesitation caused her to split her mind again and produced a third personality. The newly born personality has completely lost its rationality. Like a frantic beast that has nowhere to go, its early will is to oppose both the master personality and the deputy personality in a self-violent manner. You too. Shut up for me. Ling Ling's third personality growled hysterically. I don't want to choose between the two roads, I would rather die here alone, and return the soul to the embrace of the bottomless abyss. After this decision was made, the dispute in Ling Ling's mind suddenly ended, and the three personalities were reunited into a complete will, recognizing the final choice of embracing death. On the verge of dying, Ling Ling felt a long absence. Now she can finally be relieved and the soul can return to her hometown bottomless abyss. Although it may be able to bear the cost of downgrading, it is always better than wandering. Dot. On the blood tundra, another beam of light was raised, and Claudia's figure emerged, and her gorgeous face was as dark as ice. Today is really a bad day for her. The plan to attack Huayuan Township had a good start, but unfortunately it immediately turned sharply first encountering unexpectedly strong resistance, and then two bad news came, completely disrupting her mentality. The tragic death of the general sophist Voris is indeed regrettable, and Claudia is even more depressed that the demon spider not only failed to complete the task of kidnapping the gnome Bilin, even she was seriously injured and was forced to flee to the desert. Dot. Through the care technique. Claudia sensed that the demon spider had escaped from the garden town with a wound. At first, she was very angry and sent out a mental response, asking Ling Ling to make a reasonable explanation, otherwise she would never be spared. However, she waited for a long time, and did not wait for the reply of the demon spider, the life symbol of the other party was rapidly declining and the fire of life may be extinguished at any time. All signs disturbed Claudia. Although she was annoyed by the incapability of the demon spider, she didn't want to lose this forever to summon the powerful people around her. Now that the failure of the overall battle is a foregone conclusion, Claudia will immediately make a decisive decision, give up the destruction of Garden Township, and send it directly to the area where the demon spider is located, to see what happened to her. Claudia soon noticed the huge body of the hunter spider crawling on the field, surrounded by dense purple mushrooms, dancing wildly with tentacles, whipping the hunter spider that was unable to resist. Claudia flashed a killing intent, waved his hand and released the sword blade barrier. Innumerable twirling force field blades, pulled open a circle of circular walls circling and dancing around the demon spider. With a sneering sound of cutting, the purple mushrooms that besieged the demon spider were all shattered by this sudden blade storm. Claudia's stiletto heels and high-heeled leather boots glowed with golden brilliance, automatically opened a pair of atmospheric wings, supported her to take off, flew over the debris of purple mushrooms, 
and fell lightly on the demon spider. Claudia looked down and couldn't help changing her face. The scars on Ling Ling's body were crisscrossed, the flesh and blood were blurred, and the original appearance could hardly be seen. Blessing the care technique on Ling Ling, I don't know when it has been automatically resolved, which means that after all, one step later, even if there is a healing magic, it can't save the dead demon spider. Claudia looked at Ling Ling's body silently, and the beautiful and cold dampening eyes showed a little regret. At that moment, the huge body under the feet made a rustling sound, like a rapidly disintegrating iceberg, which first melted into pus blood, then evaporated into blue mist, diffused in the air, and was blown away by the wind. Claudia remained expressionless as she stared coldly at the anomaly in front of her. All this did not surprise her, of course. She knew that the demon who was called to the world would automatically decompose after death, and the soul, which represents the essence of the demon, would break away from the shackles of the flesh, return to the bottomless abyss, and be born again in the blood pool. The bizarre scene that occurred on the body of the demon spider at this moment is a sign that the demon soul spirit has returned to his homeland. As the blue mist in the sky gradually dissipated, most of Ling Ling's souls have returned to the bottomless abyss, and will regroup in the blood pool to absorb the magic of the abyss and generate a new body. But for demons, rebirth after death is not without cost. Usually, this cost is reflected in reduced order. All demons have corresponding ranks. When the high-level demons are reborn after death, they will often lose part of their power and be reduced to low-level demons. Take Ling Ling. For example, it is possible to reduce her rank to a demon type that is not as powerful as the monster spider, such as her favorite food. Succubus. Claudia frowned, as if hesitating. Seeing that the blue mist in front of her was about to completely dissipate, she gritted her teeth and finally made up her mind to quickly remove a reel from the storage bag, plus a sapphire. Claudia carefully unfolded this extremely expensive nine loop soul binding scroll, chanting the spell casting whisper. The reel radiated a strong negative energy, turned into a pale vortex absorbed the blue mist remaining in the air, and then escaped into the sapphire. Claudia cast aside the scroll that turned into dust, spread her palms, and stared at the sapphire that contained part of the soul of the demon spider. A part of the soul of the demon spider was forcibly sealed in the gem by her and could not return to the abyss, so what will happen next? Thinking from a good direction, some souls still remain in the world, and there is a possibility of being resurrected. Ling a Ling cannot be regarded as a real death. When she is reborn from the abyss blood pool, it is possible to retain the form of the demon spider, escape the reduced order penalty. However, it is speculated from the bad side that an incomplete soul may not be eligible for rebirth at all, and is directly swallowed up by the will of the abyss. It is not necessarily that there is no Ling a Ling creature in this world. Like Master Mr. Joan, Please collect, www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1104 One are you in plain weather waiting for Ling Ling's final destiny is good or bad, Claudia will not suffer anyway. She tossed the sapphire high in her hand, and then raised her hand to catch it, her lips raised a strange smile. With this gem that seals the spirit of the hunter's spider, she can make a more powerful killing machine than Ling a Ling, enough to make up for the loss caused by the loss of the hunter's spider. Dot. The first floor of the bottomless abyss, Pazunia, Puinia Plain Pazunia, is the top of countless layers of the bottomless abyss. This is a barren land where there is no grass and dust. The swarms of demons hover in the air, and the shadows cast by the magic wings cover the mountains. In the endless years of the past, a depressing red sun bathed the entire surface under the intense heat and harsh sunlight. Dark clouds cover the plain, hiding potential dangers, and huge deep pits can be seen everywhere. Those deep pits are the entrance to the deeper level of the bottomless abyss. Most deep pits are tower portals, but some are only a new way doors. Without knowing exactly where the deep pit leads to, 
Jumping into a deep pit is no different from suicide. Most deep pits lead to areas where the environment is extremely harsh and not suitable for survival at all. Many ancient and majestic steel fortresses stood on the edge of a huge deep pit. The Obiris demon, who built the Iron Fortress group in ancient times, has now withdrawn from the power center of the bottomless abyss. The upstart in the abyss, the powerful Danari demon lords became the new masters of these ancient fortresses, and the fortress barracks were always filled with all kinds of demon minions. These fortresses are often used as a staging ground for the demon army to the endless blood war, and in the history of blood war, many large-scale battles took place in the Wali Yuan plains, where countless demons and demons flowed here last. A drop of blood. The demon and the devil kill each other to shed blood and countless blood rivers converge into a big river, combined with the chaotic origin of the bottomless abyss, and eventually evolved into a so-called Styx. The squalid river water flowing in the black meanders on the Waniyuan plain, and the tributaries of the river flow into the deep pits leading to other levels. At the same time, the sewage from other levels also continuously flows out of the pits into the Styx. The river that leads to the deeper abyss becomes even larger and choppy. Numerous chaotic blood pools are distributed along the Styx. These huge ponds full of Stygian waters are a rich area of chaotic magic, rolling and boiling all day long and restless. All souls that have fallen into the bottomless abyss will flow along with the waves of the Stygian waves and will be randomly diverted to a chaotic blood pool on both sides of the Stygian river, just like entering the nursery room and hatching as larvae in the blood pool, the lava transformed by the soul looks like a disgusting worm, and the worm's face still retains the appearance it was in life, it's like caterpillars are the larvae of butterflies, these larvae crawling in the evil blood pool are the prototypes of demons so they are also called devil chicks. The vast majority of abyssal larvae can't live to develop into a real demon on the day they are devoured by other more fierce kind, and those engulfing more kind of larvae will of course grow bigger and thicker, so there is more opportunity to develop into a real demon. This is wrong. The bottomless abyss is an extremely chaotic and disorderly place. In many cases, rational thinking logic is not applicable here. For example, the strongest larvae seem to have a greater chance to mature, but in fact, they tend to die faster than those weaker larvae. Chaos blood pool is by no means a safe nursery room. The larvae living in the blood pool, in addition to guarding against the mutual swallowing of the same kind, the bigger tragedy is that there are often adult demons coming to the blood pool. Sky implemented a dimensionality reduction strike. Most low-level demons, such as original demons or inferior demons, are at the bottom of oppression in the world of adult demons, and are always driven at will by more powerful demons at random, even killing for fun. However, it is these low-level demons, these creatures in the demonic world that are in a position comparable to those of the insignificant goblins in the material world, are precisely the natural enemies that the abyssal larvae are unable to resist. The lower level demons use the chaos blood pool as their dining table. Whenever they feel hungry, they come to the blood pool, select the most fat larvae, and stuff them into their mouths to chew. After a full meal, these little demons grew away in the eyes of the trembling scared larvae with fear, hatred and envy. Each chaotic blood pool is a perfect ecosystem. The abyssal larvae living in the shadow of death are at the bottom of the food chain but the little demons who use the blood pool as a table are not high on the food chain. The chaotic blood pool rich in larvae always attracts many low-level demons to forage, and the middle and high-level demons that feed on the low-level demons will also notice the active prey near the blood pool. The little demons devoured the larvae greedily, slapped their heads in a slap, rushed around the scene, or dragged away as reserve grain. In addition to being a hatchery for larvae, the chaos blood pool has two more important functions for adult demons. First of all, the chaos blood pool is also a testing ground for advanced demons, whether it is through personal practice or plundering others to increase strength, as long as the devil's strength reaches the critical line of the current rank, 
he can jump into the blood pool and try to break through the infiltration of chaotic magic. The demon who successfully breaks through the bottleneck will rise to a higher level and gain more powerful power. The Baluo flame demon at the top of the demonic group, and even the more powerful Abyssal Lord, mostly started from a humble lava, first developed into the original demon, and then advanced into the inferior demon. Step by step to grow and grow in the blood pool continue to advance in the middle, and eventually grow into a higher demon in the king's abyss. Contrary to the advanced situation, the chaos blood pool is also the birthplace of the demons. Those demons called to other planes, if they die unfortunately, their flesh and soul will automatically return to the bottomless abyss and be reborn in the chaotic blood pool he was born in. Newborn demons still have the original flesh and soul, but they often lose part of their power during the rebirth process, causing them to degenerate into a weaker demon form, and their appearance changes accordingly. Of course, not all demons will suffer punishment for demotion during the rebirth process. The bottomless abyss is a chaotic environment with no rules. The only truth here is the random rate. No matter how irrational strange things may happen in this evil and chaotic land. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1105 Defamation in the remote area of the Wan Yuan Plain, under the blazing sunlight, the Stygian water flows. A chaotic blood pond on the riverbank is boiling like in the past tens of thousands of years. A pot of gruel like blood in the pool of blood wriggling countless abyssal larvae. At this moment, a whirlpool suddenly set off in the middle of the water, and a haggard hunter spider floated from the whirlpool, swinging eight long legs, and quickly swam to the poolside. The demon spider climbed up to the dry shore, shook its wet body, and shook all the larvae attached to it on the ground, allowing the maggots to be dried up by the hot sun. Ling Ling looked at herself up and down and couldn't help but be overjoyed. Ha ha. The old lady's luck is really good. After dying for a while, she didn't step down. Patted her head, Ling Ling found another thing that was gratifying. After the rebirth, she no longer felt a headache, and her split personality was unified. And finally she got rid of the spiritual shackles Joan and Claudia imposed on her and her will returned to freedom. Excellent. This is the life I want. Ling Ling nodded contentedly, moved her footsteps, patrolled around the blood pool, and decided to use this place as her recuperating territory. She found a bare rock mountain near the blood pool, brandished a sharp sickle, and dug a cave at the bottom of the cliff. Ling Ling burrowed into the head and turned around again, protruding a flexible catch foot from the entrance of the cave pulling the stones scattered around to cover the entrance of the cave, leaving only an arrow gap as a channel to monitor the outside dynamics. In the following time, Ling Ling was lurking in the cave, as if she was in a long sleep. The chaotic blood pool still boils. Little demons come and go, prey on larvae, and occasionally will be hunted by powerful demons around. Cruel survival competitions are staged in this small world every day. Ling Ling turned a blind eye to the dispute outside the cave. It wasn't until one day that a rare demon appeared beside the blood pool, and there was a lot of interest in her eyes. This is a Babu demon, the weaker of the mid-level demons. It looks like a skinny humanoid creature with dark red skin tightly wrapped around bones secreting disgusting mucus, and a long barbed tail dragged behind the buttocks. As a demon spider, Ling Ling is quite picky. The frivolous, sticky and wet baboo is not ranked high on her menu. Unless she is extremely hungry, she disdains to eat this skinny guy. Ling Ling is indeed very hungry now, and it's not bad to kill a baboo to be hungry. But the abnormal behavior of this babu has caused her curiosity and she has restrained her appetite. What do you want to do? Babu demon seemed to be in a hurry. The little demons who were burying their heads and praying on larvae at the edge of the blood pool turned blind, and jumped into the blood pool, splashing a cloud of turbid waves. The little demons by the pool were frightened, only to realize that a fierce babu demon came in and turned around to escape. Ling Ling stared at the babu demon sinking into the blood pool, the curiosity in her eyes gradually transformed into a trance, 
and finally a sinister smile appeared. Very well, patience always pays off. Wait a few days, it will be delicious. Ling Ling gathered her spider's feet and returned to the cave again, squinting her eyes, paying close attention to the movements in the blood pool. Time flies, and ten days pass. The chaotic blood pool that was calm for many days suddenly set off a fierce vortex, and a graceful figure surfaced. The Babu demon who jumped into the blood pool ten days ago has faded the original insignificant image and advanced into a glamorous and succubus. She stretched out a pair of black bat wings, suspended above the boiling chaotic blood pool, and looked up and down at her slender carcass her charming eyes filled with joy. This beautiful body upsides down the body of all beings, even she sees it in her eyes, can't help but indulge in it, how can the world not be hooked by her soul, and fall down under her pomegranate skirt? The newly born succubus raised her orchid finger, and pulled her long, dark, soft hair back, and her lips rose slightly. With a longing for a new life, she looked at the vast sky, the vast earth, and couldn't help but burst out. My age is finally here. Just then, there was a roar behind him. The succubus froze for a moment, then looked back in amazement. The rock piled under the cliff suddenly collapsed, and ugly and ugly blue giant spider rushed out of the pile of rock, with eight eyes shining in a cruel light. The succubus screamed in fright and loss, flapping its wings hurriedly trying to stay away from the monster. But the demon spider snatched her before she fluttered her wings, spraying a thick sticky web, covering her from head to toe, and then dragging the silk, forcing her to force herself. No, can't treat me so cruelly. The succubus struggled desperately in the cobweb, wailing in despair. Ling Ling was unmoved, swooping up and holding her, wiping her head with a sickle foot, and hunting like a cloud of water. All at once, the succubus head fell to the ground, his frightened expression solidified on his beautiful face. Translate the translation for me, what's your own? You want to eat fat? Oh, really, it has grown into a bells and whistles of virtue, but the result is not useless. There may not be an interesting soul under the beautiful skin, but there must be delicious ingredients with fine skin and tender meat. Ling Ling's mercilessly ruthless hand destroys the flowers unloads the succubus, eats a polish from head to toe, and finally licks and cleans the blood stains on the feet, rubs the full stomach, and turns and drills back to the nest. After a good meal, take a good night's sleep. This day is too comfortable. Ling Ling curled up in the nest, yawned greatly, narrowed her eyes, and took a nap of satisfaction. Dot. I don't know how long I slept, Ling Ling woke up from an uneasy sleep and it took a long time to find the sense of reality. Then she found in horror that her body had become very strange. She lay on her back, with two pairs of soft and transparent membrane wings spread out behind her, crumpled and crumpled by the narrow cave, very uncomfortable. She looked up at a loss and saw her bloated, swollen spindle-shaped abdomen, surrounded by a circle of black and yellow stripes, compared with the large body drive. Her six thin legs are really thin and pathetic, far from being able to dance helplessly in front of her eyes compared with the original strong and powerful spider legs. Dot. What's going on? What's going on? Why did the old lady become a buzzer? The cave cried out buzzingly. Somehow, Ling Ling panicked. She barely kept calm, thought about it, and finally came to a conclusion the problem is likely to be the little mage. The abominable little mage once turned into a buzzing monster, piercing her with that big needle on her ass. I am afraid that some strange disease was transmitted to her, causing her to also become a buzzing monster. Damn little mage, you wait and see for me. Angry Ling Ling gritted her teeth and secretly vowed to wait for herself to adapt to this buzzing body and she must try to return to the world and seek revenge from the little mage. The little mage must cure Ling Ling's parasitic disease, or he must pay the price. Overnight, Ling Ling, who was inexplicably changed from hunting demon spider to giant bee, curled up in the abyss nest with full of grievances, thinking viciously. End of volume 4. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, 
www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1106 Meditation Capsule The night was dark, and the neighborhood where Meadgad University was located was dim. There was only a window on the second floor of a street-facing apartment, and the dim light still showed through. The magic candlestick on the desk illuminates the white and handsome face of the young mage. The dark left eye is clear and dignified, and the pupil of the right eye is slightly bluish, showing magical aura. Today is June 21st, the second day after the end of the Dark Land expedition to return to the surface world. Joan is like a clockwork full of clockwork, busy from morning to night. At the moment, he is immersed in writing and painting designing a set of experimental molds. Picking up the vernier caliper on the table, Joan carefully measured the size of each part on the drawing to ensure that the error was within the allowable range. Then he put away the ruler and nodded in satisfaction. Joan is currently designing a set of molds specifically for processing capsules. The pure hardwood structure does not require tenons or nails. In addition to wood, the only auxiliary material needed is a piece of beeswax. Joanne picked up the drawings, scrutinized them under the light, and checked that there was no problem, then laid the drawings on the table, opened the storage bag, took out the hardwood and beeswax prepared in advance, and placed them carefully on the drawings. Everything is ready. Joan begins to cast spells. Carrier, singing out the mantra representing creation and processing. Joan radiated a beam of golden magical power in his palm, illuminating the drawings and materials on the table. Under the effect of the three red level spell second ghost axe artifact, the wood on the table seemed to melt into a liquid, which was rubbed and shaped by an invisible pair of hands, and in an instant it became exactly the same as the structure on the design drawing. At the same time, the mass of beeswax also dissolves on its own and evenly adheres to the inner surface of the smooth wooden mold, applying a thin layer of wax to the mold. When the magic aura converged, a rectangular wooden mold appeared on the table, two feet long, one foot wide, and one inch thick. The elliptical grooves in a crisscross pattern are evenly arranged on the mold to form a 20 times 20 matrix. Each groove is one inch long, half an inch wide and the deepest part is also half an inch, which perfectly meets the design data. The surface of this mold covered with honeycomb grid is waxed, smooth and delicate. When the mold is filled with melted gelatin, this layer of wax film can prevent the gelatin from sticking to the mold. After the gel is solidified, a whole plate of oval capsules can be easily removed from the mold. Of course, the capsule must be hollow and it must have a good seal to prevent the drug inside the capsule from leaking out. With this simple mold, the above precision requirements cannot be achieved. Fortunately, with secondary axe skills, these delicate operations have become no difficulty. Joan opened the storage bag again and took out a large piece of translucent jelly-like colloid, as well as some other bottles and jars, all on the table. The gelatin used to make capsules is boiled and refined from seaweed called stone cauliflower. In addition to being used in pharmaceuticals, it can also be used as a food coagulant and used in the processing of pudding and other snacks. Ordinary gelatin is not resistant to high temperatures and will soften around 30 degrees. This piece of gelatin purchased by Joan also added some harmless alchemy agents which greatly enhanced the high temperature resistance of the colloid. Even if it is placed in boiling water, it will not melt in a short time, but in an acidic environment, for example, soaked in stomach acid, this gelatin will quickly decompose. Joan hollowed out the flexible gelatin and left a lid at the opening, and then weighed the large hollow gelatin on the scale. If it is found to be slightly heavier than the calculated component on the paper, Open the lid and cut it down with a knife until you ensure that the remaining gelatin component basically meets the calculated theoretical value. Next, Joan placed the bottled mine spore on the balance. Put on the mask, open the bottle stopper, use a small spoon to scoop out countless light and tiny spores. Just like scoop a spoon of silver powder with glittering silver, Carefully pour it into the hollow gel container. Repeat this operation until the total amount of mind spores scooped out reaches the pre-calculated weight. Next, 
Joan performed the same operation on the bottle of spirulina until the two spores transferred into the gelatin container were equalized. Joan put away the two medicine bottles and closed the lid of the gelatin container to prevent the light spores from being blown by the airflow and escaping the container. After completing these elaborate operations, Joan can finally take off his mask and gasp for breath. After taking a short break, Joan picked up the square hollow gelatin container and placed it in the center of the mold. Using the two supernatural spores mixed in the mold, the gelatin container and the container as a whole, he once again performed the secondary ghost work. Under the golden glow that symbolizes the magic of the change school, the large piece of gelatin on the mold quickly melted, as Joan expected. It was broken down into 200 uniform sized spores, each wrapped with equal amounts of mixed spores, and the mold the elliptical grids on the top are filled one by one. Joan made a magic trick to the mold, prompting the gelatin to accelerate the cooling and solidification, and finally set it as a capsule with uniform specifications. Joan lifted the mold, placed it in a large wide emoth glass dish at an angle, and gently patted the bottom of the mold. The capsules embedded in the grid were along the inclined surface, and the capsules rolled into the glass dish. Joan put the mold aside and randomly picked up a capsule to examine it carefully. The oval-shaped capsules are smooth and symmetrical, without any cracks, and they are perfectly sealed. Joan was very satisfied with his work. Two hundred capsules were put into two medicine bottles, covered with cork stoppers, labeled, and the words meditation capsules were marked on the labels. Taking one such capsule before meditation every day can double the efficiency of meditation. With the experience of making meditative capsules, Kiaan then took the medicine according to the prescription, and made 200 pieces of shock capsule, paralysis capsule, sleeping capsule and anmian capsule. Inside the capsule, encapsulated are stunt spores tentacles toxin, drow toxin, and drow toxin after dilution and attenuation treatment. The first three capsules are all used to match the poison strike casting materials. The last kind of sleeping capsule is basically harmless to the human body and has the effect of calming sleep. After taking it, it can relax people's spirits and sleep. Good sleep. Joan packed the four capsules in bottles, labeled them and put them in storage bags. He took out his pocket watch and glanced at it. It was already one o'clock in the morning, and he was still not asleep, so he decided to continue his work. The last dangerous material obtained during the underground expedition was also handled properly, and it was not too late to rest. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1107 Good News Joan took a large glass plate out of the storage bag and the bottle of acid squeezed from the purple mushroom tentacles. Mushroom acid will corrode gelatin and is not suitable for encapsulation. Joan intends to encapsulate mushroom acid in hollow glass beads as a casting material for poison strike or other spells that require acidic substances. Before starting, Joan looked at the grid mold on the table, hesitating. He is still not sure whether the wooden beeswax can withstand the mycolic acid corrosion. If the process of making capsules is copied, will the mold be damaged? But thinking about it, he realized another problem. Judging from the magical configuration of the subordinate ghost work, it is possible to shape the raw materials into any structure desired by the caster, no matter how complex. From this point of view, Joan actually does not need to use a mold to directly cast glass and acid solution, and can generate hollow glass beads with a size and thickness that meet the design standards and perfectly seal mushroom acid. In fact, Joan also hesitated before whether it is necessary to process the capsule with the help of molds. It's just that he didn't know enough about the effectiveness of the secondary axe artifact spell at the time, and he decided to use the mold for reasons of stability. After the practice just now, he has deepened his understanding of this spell, and has accumulated some production experience. I feel it might be a good idea to try it out and process directly from the mold. For the sake of stability, 
Kian will do an experiment first, replacing my colic acid with clean water, so as not to mess it up and waste precious materials in vain. Carrier Joan casts a secondary ghost axe in a glass filled with a small half of water. In an instant, the glass was twisted and deformed, as if melting, and split into ten hollow glass beads wrapped in clear water on its own, scattered on the desk. Joanne took a thumb-sized glass bead and looked at the water droplets encapsulated inside against the light. The crystal clear hollow glass beads, compared with the ones processed by the mold, cannot see the obvious difference. It can be seen that the mold is not a necessity for secondary acts. In this way, it's even easier. Kiaan smiled, and cast second ghost axe again on the glass embryo and a bottle of mushroom acid, which was converted into 100 hollow glass beads encapsulating the acid liquid and received in the storage bag. After finally finishing today's work, Joan stretched out and went to bed after a brief Washington. Before going to sleep, one hour of meditation as usual. Joan sat on the bed and swallowed a freshly baked meditation capsule, promoted by the power of medicine. His spiritual probe became particularly sharp, and soon immersed in the exploration of the deep magic web, completely ecstatic. Dot. The next morning, Joan had just entered the school gate, and he received a short message sent by his instructor, asking him to come to the laboratory as soon as possible and said that there were good things. The professor really applauds, and he deliberately does not make it clear what a good thing it is. Although Joan had guessed eight or nine points, he was still a little excited, trotting all the way to the Moriarty laboratory. Just about to knock on the door, the door of the laboratory room opened with a crunch, and Dewar stood in front of the door with a smile, proudly telling Joan, I heard your footsteps. My ears are smart, Duo usually dresses up very hot, and now it is a hot summer day, of course, she is dressed especially cool. Joan felt wronged for the pink suspender skirt on her body, only a pitiful amount of fabric, she had to cover all the places to be covered, and the skirt was very hard. The new skirt looks pretty. Thank you for the compliment. I will wait for you this morning. Duo smiled like a flower and couldn't help but say he took his arm and dragged him into the laboratory. Perhaps as Holden said, distance produces beauty. When you get along for a long time, you will feel dull, and you may not even notice the obvious charm of the opposite around you. Holden himself, for example, has never understood why other boys regard his sister's super controlling housekeeper as a goddess and if he stays with his sister for more than two hours, he will feel completely unwell, comfortable, full of thoughts about how to escape from the elder sister's claws and rush to freedom. Joan occasionally feels similar. After nearly six months of getting along with him, he has basically been immunized to duo as temptations. From the initial dare not to look directly to now being calm, Everything has changed unconsciously. Professor Moriarty was having breakfast when he saw Joan coming over. He put down the newspaper in his hand and pointed to the chair exclusive to Joan across the table. After Joan sat down, Duo fire ran into the kitchen and quickly brought him hot milk and bacon omelette. Is this underground adventure going well? Professor Moriarty asked casually. In general, it was smooth, but some accidents occurred on the way especially in the area of Ocken. Mentor, Arnold Level, did you hear? Joan whispered. Professor Moriarty nodded. I heard that, fortunately, it was treated in time, and it is now fully recovered. The professor took a sip of his coffee, looked at Joan, and said half-jokingly, yesterday morning at the teacher's club, old Franklin chatted about this with me, and I said to him, if my student encountered this things, there is a good show. What do you mean by that? Joan was blank, I can't act. Silly boy, if you are turned into a spider-like elf, you will have a temper, and instead of rushing to the doctor, you might be happy. Why use me to say why you are happy? Of course, because you can take the opportunity to use yourself as an experiment, and study the spider curse in depth. Research has yielded results, and a core journal article cannot run away. After that, you may be reluctant to completely remove the curse, 
and you will surely come up with some wonderful ways to retain the ability to become a spider elf at any time under the premise of returning to normal form. Just like dealing with insecticide, am I not wrong about you? Ah, uh, I really think so. Joan scratched his head embarrassedly. So I said, Arnold is still too weak. What's so scary about the curse of spidering? Professor Moriarty leaned back on the armchair with his left hand on his hips his face proud. My students are not afraid of this kind of trick, but the spider curse should be afraid of you they are afraid that the last trace of the use value will be squeezed out by you and become the research material of a paper. All the secrets are published publicly, like a woman who has been stripped away from the public. Joan couldn't help but wipe away the cold sweat and quickly digress. Mr. Dean may not agree with your unique insights. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1108 Bonus Yes, old Franklin was very angry and scolded my brain for water. Professor Moriarty shrugged and spread his hands, suddenly sneering again. Mr. Dean warned me that if he still talks like this in the future, he will not let me be your mentor, fearing that I will teach you bad. Actually, I have seen it for a long time, the old man is jealous of me, trying to get you genius under his door. Of course I will not let this old fox succeed. Professor Moriarty shook his head proudly, thinking that he had gained insight into Dean Franklin's tricks. I think you think too much. Joan sighed helplessly. Okay, don't talk about these boring things. There are two good news during your time exploring underground. Professor Moriarty walked to the desk opened the drawer, and took out three new journals from it to Joan. This is the sample journal of Journal of Austrian Law published last week. Your paper on insect disease was published in this issue, earning you 50 academic points. Professor Moriarty patted the student's shoulder with a smile of relief. Old man Tennyson is a stingy ghost and a total of five sample magazines were sent. Old man Franklin took one copy. As the application materials for the Academic Rising Star Award, I will keep one copy here to commemorate, and you will have three sample magazines left. It's very commemorative. Kian holds three beautiful iron-closed journals, and his mood is extremely complicated. When he published his first paper, the process was not smooth. After being rejected, he was ordered to amend it, and was tossed to death, almost wanting to give up. At the time of the final draft, Joan was still not at ease, suspiciously worrying about another accident. It was not until later that the article was officially published in the journal that he was relieved and felt that he was not busy. Compared to the first paper that went through ups and downs, the publication experience of Joan's second article was completely reversed by 180 degrees and the success was simply beyond imagination. He originally expected to be published in the Austrian Law Review. After receiving the manuscript, Mr. Tennyson changed hands and recommended to the higher-level Austrian Law Journal. The opinions of the reviewers were also praised, almost wordless, published on the ground. All this was too smooth, making Joan feel very unreal. So until this moment, he dared not open a journal in his hand and look at his typographical article. He always felt that he was a bit unworthy of virtue and was not qualified to compare with other scholars who published articles in the same journal. Dot. Teacher, can you tell me the truth? My current level is really good enough to publish an article in Journal of Austrian Law. Joan finally couldn't help but ask. Is there any doubt? You have already published it. Professor Moriarty couldn't help laughing. Is it faked when printed on black and white? That was not what I meant. Joan sighed and could only speak his mind with his scalp. When I published my first paper, although I made a lot of low-level mistakes, but I was really confident in the content of the article, I really think that the article is absolutely qualified to be published in the Austrian Review, at least no worse than other articles in the same publication. However, the paper was rejected by the editor first, and then was picked by the reviewer's egg, forcing me to amend it. To be honest, I was not convinced. Although the paper was published in the end, it only gave me 20 academic points and barely reached the pass level of the Austrian review. I was very uncomfortable and felt that it was unfair. My paper, 
compared to other articles published in the same issue, can be ranked at least to a medium level. Why should they get 30 points? I only have 20 points. With a long sigh of relief, he calmed down the excitement a little, and Joan went on to say, but for the second paper, it's another matter. If I were to evaluate it myself, the second paper was indeed higher than the first one, and it was worthy of a high score when it was published in the Austrian Review, but it would be too much if it was published in the Journal of Austrian Law reluctantly, at most it is a passing level of 40 points. The results are not only published smoothly, but the academic points are as high as 50 points. Is this too exaggerated? I don't think my article has reached the mainstream level of Journal of Austrian Law. The reason why such a high score makes me have to wonder if there are any non-academic factors at work. Professor Moriut nodded deliberately. You suspect that you are being used by someone with heart and force you into a dazzling genius, but in fact you want to use you as a tool to seek ulterior motives? There is indeed such a worry. Joan nodded anxiously. He didn't want to be used by others, and was involved in the intrigues. Joan, from my point of view, I can't see any signs that you are being used, and at the beginning I asserted that the academic value of your thesis will not be lower than 50 points, and the facts have verified my judgment. If this is not enough to reassure you, we might as well do a small test. Professor Moriarty's smile revealed a hint of mischief. What test? Joan asked curiously. Yesterday you told me that you are writing a new paper recently. I suggest that you submit this paper to the Journal of Austrian Law under a pseudonym. If you can pass the review, it means that your academic level has indeed reached the standard, not the result of accidental or human manipulation. Joan nodded thoughtfully. This suggestion given by the tutor, although it sounds a little playful, is worth considering. Let's put these in advance and there is good news for you. Professor Moriarty touched the jacket pocket, took out a gold-plated gold certificate, and handed it to Joan. This is the first award you won in your academic career. Although it is not a big award, it is a good start after all. Kiaan received the award certificate and found the profile portrait of Mr. Dean painted on the cover, guessing that this was the Franklin Award award certificate named after Mr. Dean. Open the certificate which also contains a check, a full 3,000 gold dugger bonus. Professor Moriarty did not take this school award into his eyes, and the scornful scorn of the prize money was too small, but Joan was full of joy. It is the first time he has grown up that he won a prize by his studies. It is worth remembering. Moreover, 3,000 kinduga is really a lot for him. This bonus is handy, at least the tuition fees for the next two years have fallen tuition fees for the next two years. Professor Moriarty shook his head and sneered. Joan, at your academic level, how can it take another two years? If you don't have those messy restrictions, you can graduate now. Otherwise, how about a PhD by the way? Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1109 Gift Joan wanted to continue his studies, but he was admitted to the Olympic Law Institute of Meadgad University less than one semester. Now he thinks of a PhD, it seems so far. What's more, one of the admission criteria for doctoral students at the Austrian Law School of Meadgad University is that the master's level has reached at least level 7, and it has only been a few days since he was upgraded to a level 6 master. Now even the most basic standards have not been met. It's too early to think about it. Instructor, I have already written the first draft of the paper you just mentioned. If you can take the time. Can you help me review it? You have just finished your thesis within two days of returning to school. Professor Moriarty raised his eyebrows exaggeratedly. Your kid is too hard. Actually, I have been doing research on supernatural spores during the underground exploration. The experimental data have been prepared. The rest of the work is to consult the literature and write the first draft. Kiaan told the truth. A good idea plus a wealth of research samples, reasonable experimental design and date to analysis, the skeleton of a paper is built, 
and the rest is nothing more than filling in the blanks in a fixed format. After returning to school, Joan spent only two days writing the first draft of a thesis on spore biology in the dark area, and he felt very satisfied. Professor Moriarty took over the thick stack of manuscripts he handed in and said, I will look at it as soon as possible. If there is no big problem, you will vote for Journal of Austrian Law. And others, is it something? There is one more small thing. Joan took a bottle of meditation capsules from the storage bag. This is a medicinal compound made from two supernatural spores, which can effectively improve the efficiency of meditation. Professor Moriarty looked at him with a puffy look and couldn't help but be funny and surprised. Joan, would you like to give me a gift? If I remember correctly, tomorrow will be your 45th birthday. This. A small gift. No respect. I hope you don't dislike it. Joan said embarrassedly. Professor Moriarty's eyes widened and he couldn't believe that he was a lonely and introverted student who would not be a human being. He would also take the initiative to give others gifts. Joan, the kid, couldn't even remember his own birthday so he made jokes about it, and actually remembered the tutor's birthday, which shows that his tutor's status in the minds of students is extraordinary. With such a thought, a touch of emotion appeared in the professor's eyes and stepped forward to hug his students. Thank you. Boy, this is the best birthday gift I have ever received in my life. Dot. Three days later, Kiaan received a reply from the editorial department of Journal of Austrian Law informing him that the manuscript he submitted had entered the review process. Less than a week later, Kiaan received the reviewer's comments transmitted by the editorial department. For his paper entitled Spores in the Dark, the three reviewers gave more affirmation than criticism, and the overall opinion was published after revision. This means that your last paper on insectosis was voted in the Journal of Austrian Law, not accidentally, nor the result of the operation of the editor-in-chief of Tennyson. Your academic ability has really reached the level of publishing articles in Journal of Austrian Law. As for the Austrian Law Review... Hee <laughs> hee, sorry, Joanne, it's time for you to say goodbye to this preschool class in this Austrian academia. Professor Moriarty commented after hearing the reviewer's comments. Dot. After the paper was delivered, while waiting for the review comments, Joan was not idle, and immediately set out to carry out another work designing and manufacturing a magic guide. Winning the Franklin Award not only brought Joan an academic reputation, but the 3000 gold Duga bonus also greatly eased his economic pressure. In addition to real gold and silver deposits, Joan also accumulated a large amount of credits that can be used as money in school. Counting the 10 internship points earned in this Blood Tundra expedition, Joan accumulated 45 internship points, excluding the points previously consumed and leaving 26 points. In addition, he published two papers before and after, earning a total of 70 academic points. The two types of points add up, and the purchasing power on campus is close to 10,000 gold dugger. The campus of Meadgad University is itself a self-sufficient city within a city. The daily necessities for clothing, food, housing, transportation, and all kinds of materials necessary for academic research can be purchased on campus, and the price is more affordable than outside the school, so Joan does not need to worry about the depreciation of the nearly 100 credits accumulated in his hand. In fact, compared to money and credits, Joan valued magic crystal more. During the expedition in the dark area, he dealt with aborigines a lot and found that the currencies used by various ethnic groups in different regions are difficult to circulate among each other, but there is something that is recognized as the universal currency of the underground world. Happy to accept, it is the magic crystal. A pound of magic crystal, the market price in the surface world, is usually not lower than 10,000 gold dugger. Joan made a lot of magic crystals from this expedition trip, counting the original inventory, a total of 1 pound and 12 ounces of magic crystals were accumulated, which is 28 ounces this is his biggest asset. Joan doesn't care about Mojing's monetary attributes. He is happy to spend money or pay something else to buy the magic crystal from others, but the magic crystal in his hand will only have an end in the form of enchanting stabilizer, 
the value is condensed in the magic guide among. The pocket was filled with magic crystals, and Joan's mind came to life, and decided to design a brand new magic guide. His current economic situation is okay. He does not need to manufacture or sell magic devices for the sake of making money. He plans to make his own equipment. During this underground expedition, Joan had a clash with Claudia Bellamy the Dark Princess Inon. Claudia's powerful strength made him feel inferior, but what impressed him most was not the various high-level magical techniques that Claudia played, but her remote control dancing sky shield. Dot. After returning to school, Joanne still missed the magic shield, and was inspired by it. He decided to make a dance shield that would automatically provide protection without holding it. The core technology for making this shield is the once level spell dancing shield. This spell has no restrictions on the material and shape of the shield, but it has strict requirements on the weight of the shield. The specific upper limit of the weight is directly proportional to the caster level. Counting the two additional levels of mythical mana, Joanne is now equivalent to an 8th level arcane spellcaster. He can lift a tower shield weighing no more than 400 pounds into the air and remotely control it with his mind. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1110 Crystal Steel Joan also has a small shield enchanted with a flash burst. He originally planned to upgrade this small shield to dancing shield, but he soon gave up this idea. Since the dancing sky shield can carry up to 400 pounds, and there is no limit to the size of the shield, so instead of upgrading a small shield that is not much larger than the slap to the Wukong shield, why not start another stove and make a tower as large as possible what about the shield? The larger the size of the shield, the more comprehensive the protection provided, this is obvious. On the other hand, Joanne's small shield is made of hardwood skin, even if it is enchanted. It is very fragile and can't bear the violent blow. At the time when Joan's level was still low, his opponents were mostly low-level miscellaneous fish. The protection provided by this small shield was enough. However, up to now, as his own level and strength have improved, the enemies he has to face have become more and more powerful. This fragile little shield is no longer useful and can only be put in a storage bag to eat ash. With such a thought, Joan decided to eliminate the small shield and remake a larger and stronger shield. After establishing the idea of enchantment, Joan started two tasks at the same time. The first is to design the shield structure drawings, in addition to choosing the appropriate material for the shield. Joan listed three requirements for the materials used to make the shield. First, the material must be strong enough. Secondly, the material should be as light as possible. Finally, this material is preferably transparent, allowing you to observe the enemy on the opposite side through the shield. According to these three requirements, steel is eliminated first, which is neither light nor transparent. Blackwood meets the first two requirements, but unfortunately it is not transparent and can only be given up. Jones planned to make a shield encountered obstacles as soon as he started. He had to put the enchantment work on hold for a while digging into the library and looking up the relevant literature in the field of enchanting materials. He wanted to find a perfect material that satisfies all three requirements from the stack. Joan spent two days looking through hundreds of documents and finally found a new material that met his ideals. This material is a compound of King Bing and Quartz, and has a nice name called Crystal Steel. The hardness of Crystal Steel is similar to that of steel but the density is only an fifth of that of steel, and the texture is crystal clear like glass. At first glance, Joan was moved, and decided to use crystal steel as the shield's enchanting embryo material, but it is not easy to get this kind of material, but it is not a problem of high price, but mainly because this brand new synthetic material is still in the research stage. The papers that Kiaon consulted were all researching crystal steel samples prepared under laboratory conditions, but they were discussed hotly in the academic circle. At present, there is no factory that specializes in producing this new material. Can't buy it. What can we do? What else can we do? We don't lack Kingbing, 
quartz is a very cheap mineral, we don't lack laboratories. That being said, Jones' main direction has always been supernatural ecology. He has never dealt with the topic of synthetic materials. He walks like a mountain, and his eyes are black. I don't know where to start. Joan is a lonely and introverted person, and he doesn't want to beg someone if he can solve his own problems. Fortunately, he was soberly aware that it was okay to be lonely in daily life, but in the academic field, this concept of making a car behind closed doors was absolutely necessary. Rather than squandering a lot of time, wasting a lot of time, energy and money, and reinventing the wheel, it is better to seek help from professionals in the synthetic materials field. In the special environment of top comprehensive university, there is a unique advantage. When interdisciplinary subjects are involved, it is easy to find experts in related fields to help solve problems. There are several research groups in the field of alchemy and chemical materials at the University of Austrian Law School of Medgad University of which Joan is most familiar with a study chaired by Dean Franklin. His friends, Angel and Lane, were internships in this group. Even more coincidentally, under the guidance of Dean Franklin, Angel and Lane are currently studying the King Bing compound. Kiaun found a paper published in the Journal of Austrian Law in the library, studying the compound of green ice and sulfate, and the mailing address is the Franklin Laboratory. Of course, Joan did not find the signatures of Angel and Ryan in this paper. Both the first and second works are their doctoral siblings, two rookie Xiozuo, and can only do some chores in the research group, commonly known as moving bricklayer. Joan first sent a wind communication technique to Angel and Ryan, asked them to meet in the college cafeteria, and then took the journal with the paper and went to the cafeteria to make an appointment. Not long after Joanne sat down, Angel and Lane ran happily. When Angel met, he yelled at him for a treat. Why treat guests? The winner of the Franklin Award, the youngest candidate to win the Rising Star Award, a rising star in the Austrian and French academic circles. Do you not invite guests? Is it worthy of world conscience? Joan also felt that there should be some blood to let his friends share their happiness after being chopped up by Angel. He threw the menu over, let Angel and Ryan order whatever he wanted, and he ordered a glass of watermelon juice himself. Three young mages, drinking cold drinks around the table, the topic of chat quickly returned to academics. Joan opened the paper from the Franklin lab and pushed it to Angel and Lane, asking if they could spare their time and help them make some blue ice quartz compound, which is crystal steel. Crystal steel, we talked to our brother about this material in the laboratory in the morning. It was very hot recently. Consider whether to follow it, Lane said with a smile. Joan, since you are also interested in crystal steel, it is better to say hello to your instructor and temporarily seconded to our laboratory. The three of us will prepare crystal steel together and test the performance data. Maybe we can toss a paper. Come, send it to the core journal, let me and Ryan also have a good view. Angler said more and more excited, his eyes shining eagerly. He and Ryan saw Joan frequently publish papers in core journals. He didn't say anything. In fact, he was a little bit hot and eager to publish papers to prove himself. Crystal steel is a popular topic in the field of synthetic materials. It is a hot topic to follow the trend. Although it is impossible to publish the Journal of Austrian Law, there is still a good opportunity to publish the Journal of Austrian Law. In fact, Joan had the same plan. Since Angel took the initiative to invite him to join, of course it would be better. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1111 Corporation The three young men hit it off and decided to study crystal steel as soon as possible. However, before the project is approved, Joan still has to say hello to his mentor. On the other hand, Angel and Lane also went to their mentors to report, and with the consent of Dean Franklin, they were allowed to use laboratory equipment, and the ice and quartz needed for research can also be reimbursed by public funds. The Franklin Laboratory is supported by two special funds, 
and the annual research funding is not less than 100,000 gold dugger. For Joan, who has always carried out scientific research on bringing his own dry food, it is almost extravagant to the level of heartbroken, envious and jealous. The communication between the teachers of both sides was very smooth. Professor Moriarty agreed that Joan would go to the laboratory next door to help. Dean Franklin also welcomed him, granting them 2,000 gold dugger research funds and helping them find many kingbing compounds. The latest research literature and experimental data in the field are used as reference. As an equivalent condition for strong support, the dean asked them to send at least one core journal paper on crystal steel before the end of the semester. In Jones' view, the request of Mr. Dean is actually not high just add a copy of the Austrian Law Review. If every article of Austrian Law Review, in addition to academic points, can earn an extra 2,000 gold dugger research funds, Joan really feels that he can rely on this business to make a fortune. In this way, Joan, Angel and Lane, three rookie freshmen, formed a small research group under the wise guidance of the Dean, and they were busy all day in the afternoon. Dot. This busy is more than 10 days. In the blink of an eye, in early July, Kiao An's paper modified by the reviewer's opinion spores in the darkness was sent again to the editorial department of Journal of Austrian Law to wait for good news. At the same time, he and Angle, Ryan's cooperation has also made breakthrough progress. After repeated matching tests, the three young people successfully prepared the crystal steel with the best overall performance under laboratory conditions. What is even more rare is that they did not add any rare and expensive materials except for the two main materials, blue ice and quartz. The auxiliary materials and technology are not difficult to operate, as long as the formula is mastered. It is not difficult to mass produce this high quality synthetic material in the factory. It has a wide range of industrial uses and a good commercial prospect. Joan, Angle and Ryan, in addition to constantly adjusting the formula and testing the data corresponding to the Kingbing compound these days, another important work is the co-authored thesis. Joan is highly experienced in this regard and has provided a lot of advice to the two partners to avoid detours. Compared with the three papers independently authored by Kiaoan, the scope of this co-authored paper is limited to Kingbing quartz compounds. The subject is clear and the ideas are simple. With detailed experimental data, this article writes it's not difficult to get up and easy to publish. Joan and the two partners wrote the first draft of the paper in less than a week. How to sign a paper is a very sensitive issue. If the cake is unfairly distributed. Everyone will be unhappy. Angle and Ryan tied for one, and Joan thought it was not controversial. Angel took a small advantage in the attribution because his initials were A, and in all cases sorted by alphabet, he could always get to the top. Joan felt that he had only done a little work in the process of cooperation. The time and energy he invested was far less than that of Angel and Lynn. Moreover, he just wanted to do some crystal steel for his own use. The paper was just a byproduct, and offered to hang a second game on your own initiative. Angel and Ryan were very sorry for this, and said that the idea of the thesis was put forward by Joan, and he should be given a work to comply with the rules. Joan didn't care about it at all. He already has one paper in two core journals, and there will be a third one soon, two of which are published in the Journal of Austrian Law, and one more article in the Journal of Austrian Law. Even for him even the icing on the cake is not a big deal, it's simply optional. On the contrary, this paper is of great significance to Angel and Lane. If they can publish successfully, they will become first-year freshmen with a thesis in a core journal after Joanne, which is also rare in the history of the University of Mittergaard's Austrian Law School and is very helpful for their future academic development. Dot. There are indeed people in the world who pluck a hair to benefit the world without doing it. There is even such a kind of so-called celebrities in the academic circle. They obviously do not do any work, but they have to the right to sign the thesis of students or partners. Packaged as an elegant gift, used to bribe leaders or to please lover. But Joan is not that kind of person. In doing scientific research, his moral cleanliness does not allow him to be indifferent. 
not to mention the kind of indiscriminate activities that sees the achievements of others. Taking into account the very different meanings of this paper for himself and the two partners, Joanne will not even grab the first author with Angel and Lane. As they humiliated each other, Dean Franklin pushed the door in and smiled and asked, Children, how is the paper written? The mentor has finished writing the first draft leaving only the issue of attribution and a little controversy. After listening to Angel, the old man Franklin sneered. You don't have to give Kiao Ankian, in fact, you don't need to give him two works for him. This is not an honor at all, but it is suspected of self-reduction. Mr. Dean, don't joke. Joan protested weakly. This is really not a joke. I came here today, except to see how your work is going mainly to inform Joan of good news. Dean Franklin looked at Joan, a smile of relief on his kind face. Joan, this morning, I received a sensation from an old friend who served as a judge. Your paper on insecticide has been shortlisted in the New Star Award selection finals, and there is great hope for winning. Thank you for telling me this good news, but to be honest, I would rather you hide from me. Joan couldn't help revealing his inner tangle of emotions. The greater the hope, the greater the disappointment. If I don't hold on to expectations, I won't be too lost even if I lose in the end. Ah, your child is good at everything. The only drawback is that he is too inferior. Mr. Franklin glared at Joan, and angrily fell on him. If you always evade competition because you are afraid of being hit, you will entertain yourself in your small circle and entertain yourself. Even if your talent is outstanding, you will not be able to fully perform on the stage, wasting your talents. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1112 Iron Maiden 1 on this issue. Joan, you really should learn from your mentor. The guy in Moriarty, even with only 6 points of control, must show 12 points of momentum always full of confidence. Dean Franklin encouraged Joan while still not forgetting to talk about Professor Moriarty. A person can win the trust of others only if he has confidence in himself first. Joanne, do you understand what I mean? You are right, Mr. Franklin, I will keep your criticism in mind and try to change myself. Joan's ears were burned by the Dean's ears. He also knew that his mentality was sometimes too negative and lacked the ambition to compete for fame and profit, but it was too difficult for him to change his innate personality. Teacher, this kid, Joan, can't be counseled, but you can see what he does, like a person who lacks confidence. Angel smiled and held his friend in a grin. Don't dare to submit the paper to the Austrian Law Review just a few days after entering school. Is this something that people with low self-esteem do? Dean Franklin smiled and nodded in agreement. It's the same thing. Sometimes I don't understand. How can Joan, a seemingly introverted shy child, always do something that is surprising? Before the first semester, he has already published two core journal papers, one of which is still in the Journal of Austrian Law which is unprecedented in the history of our college. Actually, Joan recently wrote another paper, which was also voted on Journal of Austrian Law. If nothing unexpected happens, it will be published next month. Ryan couldn't help telling the instructor the gossip. As a friend and fan of Gzwiber, whenever he talked about Joan's achievements in front of others, he also felt proud and proud. People are more dead than popular, Angel said with a grudge. Joan, this guy is just a shiny fully automatic machine that continuously produces high-level papers. Is that the thesis on spore biology in the dark area? Dean Franklin smiled. Three days ago, Moriarty came to show off to me. I received a letter from my old classmate Tennyson yesterday. He specifically mentioned this matter in the letter, which shows that this paper has left a deep impression on him and several reviewers have also praised it. Kiaan heard the unspoken meaning of Mr. Dean, and the publication of his paper should not be a problem. Joan, your momentum is very good now, and you must keep it up. You still have to write more papers and submit more papers. Before the end of this semester, you have two articles in the Journal of Austrian Law in hand. Based on the experience of the joint selection of the six schools in the past, 
it is conservative to estimate that at least 70% of you are sure to win the annual Rising Star Award. Participating in the Rising Star Awards is just the beginning. I hope you will become a rising sun in the Austrian African academic world not a falling star. Dean Franklin's enthusiastic inspiration ignited a fire in Joan's heart, full of energy. He was not good at expressing gratitude in words, he could only secretly swear in his heart that he would never let down the earnest expectations of Mr. Dean. Dean Franklin encouraged two of his students a few words, and left with the first draft of the thesis. Joan also said goodbye to Angel and Ryan and returned to the Moriarty laboratory next door to start busy with his business. During this time, Joan participated in the research on crystal steel. In addition to the paper, a big gain was the purchase of crystal steel samples prepared in the laboratory at a cost price as a material for making enchanted shields. In fact, he could not spend a copper plate at all, first classify those crystal steels into scrap products and then take them for free in the name of processing garbage. Although this is the unspoken rule of the laboratory, but Joan thought about it, he still thought it was not good to do so. After all, he was working part-time in the Franklin laboratory. Except Angel and Lane, the rest of the brothers and sisters were not familiar with him. In case of a few unpleasant gossips, not only was he embarrassed himself, but also caused Angel to friends with Ryan. You can buy the crystal steel you need for 100 gold dugger. There is no need to save money and make a living. Standing in front of the console, Joan first spread the shield drawings he designed on the table. After several modifications, the device shown on the drawing became more complicated than his original idea and it was even difficult to call it a shield. The set of defense devices designed by Joan looks like a huge regular triangle, and this large regular triangle is divided into four small regular triangles of equal area, which are connected with complex hinges. A large triangle composed of four regular triangles, like a set of building blocks can achieve three different defense modes through simple folding. The first mode is to fold the upper triangle down and the triangles on both sides to fold inwards, so that the four small triangles finally overlap together to form a four inch thick regular triangle shield with a side length of about 9.6 feet. Although the shape looks different from the ordinary tower shield, Joan still named this folding method as tower shield mode. The tower shield mode has the largest thickness and the strongest defense against frontal attacks but also has the smallest defense range. In the second mode, the upper triangle is folded down, and the two wings remain unchanged. In this way, a trapezoid with a ratio of 1 to 2 and a height of about 8.3 feet is obtained. This trapezoid is composed of three regular triangles. The triangle in the center is actually formed by the overlap of two parts. It has double thickness and the strongest defense. The wings have only a single thickness and the defense is slightly inferior. Joan named this trapezoidal folding method shield wall mode, which is very vivid. The last folding method is to fold up the three corners of the large triangle at the same time and gather them together, together with the triangle at the bottom. They form a fully enclosed regular tetrahedron. The shape folded out in this way does not seem to be in contact with the shield at all, but it is more like a hollow pyramid. Joan named it Shield Tower Mode. Shield Tower Mode can provide Joan with the most comprehensive defense. The three modes require the crystal steel sheet to be folded to different degrees. For this reason, it is necessary to install a hinge that can be folded between each part. In this design, the detail that Joanne spent most of his time on is the hinge system. Not only the front and back directions can be folded freely, strong and durable, but also the hinge must have a certain elasticity to ensure that the sheet is tightly closed and tightly closed after folding. No matter how it is folded, no obvious gap can be left between two, three or even three overlapping triangular plates. If you just install a few hinge casually, you will be able to deal with it, of course, you can't reach Joan. Design requirements. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, 
www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1113 Iron Maiden 2 After some thought, Joanne finally got the hinge system. Now that the crystal steel is the enchanting embryo material is ready, he can finally start to transform the design on the drawing into a magic guide in reality. In order to make this magic shield with a very complicated structure, Joanne prepared a total of 16 cubic feet of crystal steel plate, weighing up to 2,000 pounds. Such a heavy embryo material is far beyond the limit load that a floating shield can carry, but it doesn't matter. Joan has already upgraded the floating shield spell in advance, and the load is not a problem. The 16 cubic feet of crystal steel, the experimental platform is certainly not able to be placed. Fortunately, Duoa is very diligent and cleaned the floor of the laboratory cleanly. Joan was simply enchanted on the spacious hall floor. Kiaan first moved the crystal steel to the center of the floor and piled it up neatly. Next, he will perform a secondary ghost work on the embryo material, which will be transformed into the shape on the design drawings. With Joan's current spellcasting ability, if he casts this three ring spell in person, he can only process up to 8 cubic feet of material, and his design requires that it must be formed at one time. For this reason, he specially asked the tutor to help. Professor Moriarty always responded to his only proud student, and gave Joan a three-ring secondary ghost axe scroll. With Mr. Professor's ability to cast spells, there is no difficulty in processing 16 cubic feet of crystal steel at the same time. Joan unfolded the scroll presented by his instructor, and cast a secondary axe on the crystal steel piled on the floor. A piece of golden light radiated from the reel, covering the steel piled up in front of him. In a blink of an eye, a lot of raw materials were transformed into four large triangles that are exactly the same as a regular triangle. The total area is 160 square feet. The thickness is 1 inch, and the adjacent edges of the plate are connected by a hinge. Before proceeding to the next enchantment, Joanne first manually folded the embryo into three different modes. In the tower shield mode, the area of the small triangle is 40 square feet and the thickness is 4 inches. The hinge shows the toughness and elasticity that fully complies with Joan's expectations. The four overlapping plates are tightly stitched, which makes him very satisfied. The shield wall mode and the shield tower mode have relatively low requirements on the elasticity of the hinge. But the shield tower mode requires high ceiling performance. The four planes that make up the shield tower must be closely combined with each other. If they are impacted, they will spread out, and the shield tower will become a flashy look. Joan turned into a mutated snow monster and picked up the shield tower for a crazy beating. The interlocking slot devices at the ridge of the shield tower withstood the test. After his fierce operation, he still clenched tightly together to maintain the regular tetrahedron structure without any signs of falling apart. Joanne was satisfied with the test result, opened a plane of the shield tower, and lowered his head into it. Standing inside the shield tower, Joan moved his hands and feet slightly, trying to make a set of casting gestures. The space inside the tower is relatively narrow, and the height is less than 8 feet. Standing inside feels a bit restrained. Fortunately, it is enough to straighten his waist bar, and normal casting is not hindered. However, when I thought about it, Joan had to admit that he could just stand in the narrow space of the tower, largely due to the thin figure of only 5 feet, and replaced by a 7 foot strong man. His head was almost when I met the top of the tower, I must have been stumped. Realizing this, he couldn't help feeling a little depressed. When I grow taller and stronger in the future, I am standing in the middle of the shield tower. I am afraid that I will feel handcuffed, like being locked in an iron virgin. Forget it. Anyway, you won't dance or turn your head inside the shield tower. Safety is the most important on the battlefield. The space is a little narrow, and it is not unbearable. But having said that, the shield tower really looks more and more like iron virgin. It is better to simply name this Alround defense system as Iron Virgin. The embryo is ready, and Joan will enchant him next. The core craft of Iron Virgin includes three spells. The first is, of course, 
to make a basic enchantment that is indispensable for any magic weapon armoring of enchanted armor. The shield that enchants this spell will become more durable, and other enchantment functions can only be added if the enchanted weapon is attached. Magic armor is an additional level of defense effectiveness of armor, divided into different levels. With Joan's current spellcasting ability, he can process up to level 2 enchanted armor, and the improvement effect is still very obvious. Joan's second spell for the Iron Virgin is the Third Ring Shrinkage. This design idea was actually inspired by Claudia Bellamy's Dancing Tower Shield. The shield that Claudia had pulled out of the storage bag was only as big as a slap. When a spell was pronounced, the shield floated up and quickly expanded into a large tower shield like a wall. The biggest advantage of adding a shrink function to the shield is that it is convenient to carry around. Take the Iron Virgin designed by Joan, even if it is folded into the tower shield mode with the smallest surface area, it still has an area of 40 square feet which has exceeded the storage size of the storage bag. Almost a ton of stuff on your back. If it were that way, Joan would not be able to move in one step, and was directly pressed down by the Iron Virgin. The effectiveness of the third ring shrinkage is also positively related to the cast level. With Joan's current spellcasting ability, the volume and weight of an item can be reduced to 164 under normal conditions. 16 cubic feet of crystal steel, under the effect of contracting technique, the volume becomes 14 cubic feet and the weight is also reduced to 25 pounds. Joan can lift it with one hand and can easily fit into the storage bag. The last enchanting process is of course the most important dance shield. Without this spell, the Iron Virgin would not be able to fly. The magic level of the dancing sky shield in one ring is too low to support the Iron Virgin which is too heavy. In order to realize the floating function, Joan has optimized the spell configuration of Dancing Sky Shield drastically. If you only stay at the level of the once to level spell, no matter how you optimize it, you will dance in shackles, and there will be no tricks to play. Joan was simply extravagant and upgraded the Dancing Sky Shield two levels in a row, matching a three red level spell slot. In this way, he had a lot of magic power to squander in his hand. Magic change. Joan first assigned a part of the magic energy level to the floating function of dancing sky shield, raising the upper limit of the load by a full ten times. The upgraded version of the dancing sky shield after the initial transformation can carry 500 pounds per cast level. With Joan's current casting ability, up to 4,000 pounds of armor can be floated up and hovering around. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest. Chapter 1114 Iron Maiden 3 The upper load limit of 4,000 pounds has greatly exceeded Joan's design requirements. Not only can he carry a 2,000 pound iron virgin, plus Joan's own weight of 100 pounds. There is no pressure. Yes, when necessary, Joan can stand inside the shield tower, step on the bottom and stand in the air. There is still a lot of magic left, and Joan uses most of it to add higher spell delay to increase the duration of Dancing Sky Shield from the original 8 minutes to 80 minutes. Joan has 4 3 ring spell slots available every day. According to the Law of Enchantment, the Iron Virgin of the Enchanted Three Ring upgraded version of Dancing Shield can activate the Dancing Sky function up to four times a day. The accumulated floating time exceeds five hours is enough. After the two functions of increasing load and extending the time limit were realized, Joan found that there was still a small amount of magic energy left in the third ring of Promote Dance Sky Shield, which was not fully utilized. In terms of enchanting craftsmanship, Joan's obsessive compulsive disorder tends to make him a little ghost who must be compared, and he can't afford to waste it. After some thought, Joan made full use of the remaining magic power to extend the remote control distance of Dancing Sky Shield. Under normal circumstances, the straight line distance between the Dancing Sky Shield and the owner should not exceed 5 feet, or you will lose control. After Joan's optimization, the remote control distance has been increased to 10 feet, 
which is actually equivalent to expanding the defense space. The final key link of the enchanting process is to match the above three spells with a rune rune as an enchanting carrier. Joan went through the rune list and quickly selected the third rune, Thorn. The meaning of Thorn rune is protection and control, used to match Wukong shield. It is a perfect fit. The design idea has been sorted out clearly and the next Hansen operation is not difficult. Joan worked hard for half an hour and successfully completed the enchanting project. Not counting the cost of crystal steel, he also consumed an additional 7 ounces of magic crystal as an enchanting stabilizer. After spending so much manpower, material and financial resources, what is the quality of the final product? Joan has to do some testing. He first portrayed the number 4 Unans use on the fully unfolded Iron Virgin and identified it. The appraisal result shows that this large piece of crystal steel enchanting device spread on the floor is a plus 2 folding dance armor. The reason for not identifying the exact type of armor as shield is because this thing looks so strange, it doesn't look like a shield in horizontal and vertical direction and Rune Rune dare not make an assertion. The appraisal results show that Joan enchanting operation is basically in line with expectations, but the three Sao operation modes of Iron Virgin cannot be identified by appraisal alone, or have to be tested in person. Yala Kiao enchanted the starting spell of Iron Virgin, and the crystal steel triangle plate laid on the floor gleamed with cash, which seemed to be energized and floated up and hovered around Kiao and clockwise. Joan pulled off the tape measure, measured the Iron Virgin up and down, then switched to three different defense modes, measured again, and recorded the measurement date in the notebook afterwards. Tower shield mode has a surface area of 40 square feet, a thickness of 4 inches, a side length of 9.6 feet, and a height of about 8.3 feet. In the shield wall mode, the central inverted triangle area is 40 square feet and 2 inches thick. The area of the tying triangle area is equal to the central area, but only 1 inch thick. There is also a variant of the shield wall mode, with the long side of the trapezoid facing up and the short side facing down, and the triangles of the two wings folded inward to block attacks from the left and right side as in fact, the frontal thickness is doubled and it is missing shield tower mode on the bottom. In a ground combat environment, this half shield tower mode is more practical, because few enemies have the ability to dig underground. Under normal circumstances, you don't have to worry about the sudden emergence of individuals from the ground under your feet. If the enemy is really good at drilling the ground, such as ground worms, or need to fly in the air to fight, then the complete shield tower mode will be useful. Compared with the half shield tower mode, this mode also closes the empty window at the foot, so there is no need to worry about the attack from below. The shield tower constructed by four triangular crystal steel plates is a crystal clear hollow tetrahedron. The four planes are all 40 square feet times 1 inch in size, with an edge length of 9.6 feet and a height of 7.8 feet. Recording the size day 2 of Iron Virgin. Joan then tested the floating function. He paced back and forth in the room. While the Iron Virgin followed him, he was still making a circular motion around him, like a planet revolving around the sun. Joan noticed that the Iron Virgin can only accompany the passive flight of the host, where the host goes and where it follows, but does not have the ability to fly actively. Joan switched the Iron Virgin to shield tower mode, pulled open the triangular plate facing him, jumped in and stood in the center of the bottom of the shield tower to observe quietly. At the same time, the Iron Virgin also hovered in midair and remained stationary. Can you let the shield carry the master, fly freely according to the will of the master, and act as an air vehicle? Don't think about this beautiful thing as soon as possible. The answer is not possible. The magic configuration of Dancing Sky Shield does not support the active flight function and it cannot support the master to fly freely like the magic carpet or the brooms of the witches. What if there are birds like product managers who have to implement this function? That's not impossible, but to provide a lot of magic for this, 
at least a three ring spell slot must be arranged. A simple calculation will make it very cost effective. It is better to let a flying fly by itself. This restriction prevented the Iron Virgin from playing the role of air vehicle. However, Joan itself does not lack flying ability, anyway, there is no need to play flying little witch flying around Iron Virgin, so this is not a defect. Kiaon thought about it, and the open triangular plate on the opposite side closed up by itself, clicked into the slot, and became a small sealed floating tower. Through the gap between the hinges, the inside and outside of the shield tower can exchange air normally so as not to suffocate Joan inside the tower. When necessary, Joan can tighten the remote control hinge to close the gap between the shield tower and completely isolate it from the outside space. In this absolutely closed mode, the shield tower cannot be ventilated inside or outside, and it is impervious to splashing water. The advantage is that it can isolate toxic gases from the outside or prevent moisture from penetrating in. The disadvantage is that the air in the tower is limited and it cannot provide Joan to breathe for a long time. Fortunately, this is not difficult to solve, as long as you bless yourself with a three ring spell water breathing, Joan does not need to consume the air in the tower and can still maintain normal breathing. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest. Chapter 1115 Line Yun Bao Joan last test of Iron Virgin was the most clever. He first turned into a beam and form, then vibrated his wings and tried to fly inside the tower. When he left his feet and flew forward slowly, a magical scene happened. The Iron Virgin that surrounded him, even with his flight, floated forward simultaneously. That's right, Yu Wu Shield can't fly autonomously, but when the owner starts flying, it can always fly with the owner. Joan gradually accelerated the flight speed, and the Iron Virgin also flew faster, always surrounding him outside, keeping the relative distance unchanged. Joan felt it was inconvenient to conduct a flight test indoors. He simply asked Dua to open the window and fly out of the window with the Iron Virgin to fly freely under the evening sky. His flight speed is fast and slow, the direction of flight is suddenly left and right, sometimes swinging back and forth, sometimes laterally, and sometimes the jitter of ghosts and animals hovering in midair. Iron Virgin always responds instantly and perfectly maps out his flight rhythm, response delay is almost zero. After this round of testing, Joan couldn't help but burst into bloom. The Iron Virgin that accompanied the flight was equivalent to providing him with an impenetrable protective cover. Even if he burrowed under the sea or in an area full of poisonous gas, the Iron Virgin would still guard him faithfully inseparably surround him. The Iron Virgin in the floating shield tower mode has only one shortcoming while isolating outside attacks. Joan himself cannot directly attack enemies outside the tower. However, if he gave up physical attacks and cast spells in the tower, he would not be subject to this restriction. With the unique super magic skill of spell overcoming obstacle, Joan can bypass the Iron Virgin barrier and bombard enemies outside the tower without paying any price. Unless the enemy is good at teleporting spells such as any door, and can cross the crystal plate barrier and directly drill into the Iron Virgin, otherwise he can only be passively beaten and cannot counterattack at all. In fact, even if the enemy teleports into the tower, Joanne is not afraid, there are many ways to deal with it. For example, he can transform into a giant bee form, stabbing the intruder with the poison needle on his butt, or simply become a snow monster, fill the space inside the tower with steel like muscles, crush the intruder into a picture, and squeeze out the shit. Ah, uh, this countermeasure is a bit disgusting or forget it. Joan wore a crystal steel cover and flew in the air for more than half an hour. It wasn't dark until Duo -er waved his arms at the window and greeted him back to the laboratory for dinner. He did not hesitate to put away the Iron Virgin, folded it and folded it into a triangular plate that was the size of a plate, and stuffed it into the storage bag. Just testing the Iron Virgin on campus. Joanne is not satisfied. Now he is eager to test the defensive effects of the Iron Virgin on the real battlefield. It happened that this opportunity came soon. Dot. The Vima River, 
which originated from the spring of the beginning at the North Pole, successively flows through the land of Fognifoheim and the land of giants Chodenheim, carrying the cold current from the polar region across the iron forest Garrywood, after entering the Midgid area, branched off a tributary called the Honey River and continued to flow south, while the main stream turned to the east coast and merged into the sea at Azabay. On the western border of the Midgid colony, near the watershed of the Vim River and the Mead River, is a magnificent military fortress. The fortress is backed by the ancient abyss Jinlunga, so it is called Lini Yuanbao by the locals. Lini Yuanbao is not only a bridgehead for monitoring the border between Meadgad and Jodenheim, but also an outpost against fierce monsters and barbaric natives active in the western fangs. The garrison headquarters of the Meadgad colony was located in Lini Yuanbao, at the expense of huge sums of money. It specially built a transport station directly to the colonial capital of 400 miles away, which shows that the current garrison commander, Baron Benedict leveled the importance of this strategic location. On July 4, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the morning summer breeze in the north brought a trace of coolness. Baron Level led all the officers above the company level to the military transfer station to prepare for a group of young visitors, like a teleportation station of Stonehenge. The magical aura of the sky is radiating, and the thick stone pillars are buzzing and shaking, worrying that they may collapse at any time. This military transmission station consumes a lot of energy. It can only be activated once a day, and it can transport up to 200 heavily armed officers and soldiers. At this time, the transfer station was operating at full capacity. 200 interns from Meadgad University were transferred from the university campus to the fortress to assist the local garrison against the gangsters from the western mountains. As the weather became warmer, the ice in the Fangshan Mountains melted away, and the snow monsters living on the Duxiu Mountain also couldn't stand loneliness and became increasingly turbulent, especially after entering June. The snow monsters united with the more cunning and dangerous winter wolves, and went down the mountain to rob the colonial settlements. Wherever they passed, all the food and livestock were looted, as were the local residents. The casualties were heavy. It took more than a month. Nearly a hundred mountain villages and towns in the west of Lina Yunbao had been looted by monsters. Some of the settlements were relatively small with a total number of households of less than 100 people, and even the entire village. Extermination, it is terrible. The disaster-stricken villages and towns are in desperate need of rescue. Other villages and towns that have not been attacked by monsters are also frightened. Everyone is in danger and frequently asks the Lini Yuan Bao garrison for support. The total number of troops stationed in Lina Yunbao is less than 4,000. Only two cavalry regiments are regular troops, and two infantry regiments are composed of locally recruited militiamen. Their equipment, military discipline, and combat effectiveness are much worse than the regular army. With these strengths, it is still possible to stand firm on the fortress and to support nearly a hundred towns and towns in the surrounding area separately. Lina Yunbao was in desperate need of replenishment, but Sir Level, who came from a military aristocratic family, did not think that recruiting a large number of militia would solve the problem. The so-called militias, in fact, many people have not received the minimum military training. Yesterday, they were farmers who were hoeing in the fields. Today they ran to the conscription office to report the rates. Such a multitude of people, it is okay to deal with ordinary beasts or aiders, but in the face of the fierce and fierce monsters such as snow monsters, winter wolves and even frost giants and white dragons, it is simply unusable. Baron Level believes that instead of recruiting a large amount of this cannon fodder and paying meaningless sacrifices, it is better to issue an internship mission at Meadgad University, recruit elite students to serve in the military camp, and help the garrison to sweep the monsters that have flowed from the western mountains. With the gangster, like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1116 Baron Level In a world where magic and supernatural powers are widespread, 
young people receiving higher education on university campuses are not just the frail scholars who study traditional subjects such as literature, medicine, law, philosophy and mathematics. The professional professionals trained in seminaries, cavaliers and Austrian law schools, especially those college students who are proficient in magic or arcane art, sometimes only need to cast a spell can completely change the situation on the battlefield. In the eyes of Sir Lovell, who advocates elitism, these talented and fearless young talents from the university campus are the most urgently needed help in line Yuenbao, and the value is far from those who just want to eat a meal eating militia can compare. When the adjutant named, the jazz's eyes fell on the young faces he should have, his eyes flashed sharply and he clearly opened the higher inner vision to verify the responder's extraordinary professional level. Is it consistent with the data registered on the roster? Most of the 200 interns were recruited into patrol camps. Towards the end, Sir Lovell took out a small note from his military uniform pocket and handed it to the adjutant beside him. The lieutenant looked at the handwriting on the note, and then pulled his voice high, pointing out the names of the four college students, Joan Vida, Hale Green, Audrey Rosenthal Zion, Holton Zion, four classmates who heard the name, please come out, your commander-in-chief will teach you personally, Joan didn't realize that his name was the first to be named, and he couldn't help but stunned, he saw that both Hale and Zion left the queue and walked towards Sir Lovell quickly speeding up and following. Joan secretly speculated that the Jazz had called himself and three friends alone, and he did not know what to say. At the same time, he was also looking at the highest military chief of the Medgad colony. As the commander-in-chief of the colonial garrison, Sir Lovell was too young. Sir Benedict Lovell seemed to be in his early thirties, tall and tall, and his handsome face was somewhat similar to Arnold Lovell but he had a more imposing and majestic aura than his younger brother. Dot. The Lovell family is a rare old school noble family in the northern colonies. In the middle of the last century, Arnold's grandfather came to the new continent from the old world to take office. At that time, he served as the magistrate of the city of Midgard. Under his administration, the security environment of Midgard was greatly improved. From the original gangster of the extra jurisdictional land has become well organized and the crime rate has fallen sharply. The local residents and industry and commerce have also benefited from this. They are very respectful of this iron handed police inspector. The second generation of Sir Lovell, the father of Arnold, was influenced by the prevailing atmosphere at that time. The Lovell family, like most other wealthy noble families, actively devoted themselves to the pioneering business in the West and spent a lot of money in Vigo. Purchase land on the Great Plains of Leeds for reclamation and construction. The Great Plains of Wigley is fertile land, but it is not a peaceful place. Not to mention the wild beasts and monsters running wild in the wilderness, attacking the settlements of pioneers in droves and even more troublesome is that there are tens of thousands of us indigenous people living on this land, and these indigenous people do not recognize the great plains of Glid belonged to the colonists. They even dismissed the title deeds in the hands of the colonists. They regarded it as a piece of waste paper. They often roared into the farms of the colonists and burned and looted. Dot. In such a harsh environment, the pioneering cause of the western region is struggling. Many farms and pastures that have been built with a lot of money and human resources are often completely destroyed by groups of warcraft or indigenous bandits overnight. At the time, many investors in the colonial pioneering business had nowhere to go, and the Lovell family was not spared. More unfortunate than the failure of the investment. Grandpa's enthusiasm for pioneering businesses also brought great misfortune to his family and loved ones. On an autumn day more than twenty years ago, the grandfather's family went to the west to inspect a newly established ranch. On the way, they were attacked by an Azar horse thief. The Baroness was shot by a poison stream and died the same night. Dot. The accidental death of the Baroness caused a heavy blow to the grandfather. At that time, Benedict Lovell who was only ten years old, 
witnessed his mother's tragic death under the arrow of the indigenous people. Since then, the hatred of the as indigenous people has been entrenched. After the death of the Baroness, the Laval family's prospects deteriorated. The land business invested in the West was all lost to the capital. This ancient and noble family was once on the verge of bankruptcy. In order to revive his family business, the Grand Prince had to put down the nobility. In the third year after the death of the former wife, he married the only daughter of a self-made mining tycoon. This young lady from the bourgeois family, with a rich dowry full of thirty carriages, came to Laval Manor to rejuvenate this ancient and desolate noble family. The grandfather first relied on the dowry brought by the newly wed wife to pay off the debts of the banker and the baker, and then invested in the magic crystal mine under the guidance of his father-in-law. Finally, you can straighten your waist bar again and return to the upper social circle. After two years of marriage, the Laval family added another happy event. The young baroness gave birth to a son. Arnold Lovell. Although they are half sex and more than ten years old, the love of the Lovell brothers is very good. After the death of the grandfather, Benedict inherited his father's title and took care of his stepmother and younger brother. Arnold regarded his elder brother as an idol, and even the manners of speech and behavior, imitating his brother intentionally or unintentionally this point. As soon as Joan saw Sir Lovell today, he became aware of it. However, after all, Arnold is still young and lacks experience. No matter how hard he imitates his elder brother, he still lacks a little aura. Sir Laval carefully looked at the four young men standing side by side in front of him, nodded, and a mild smile appeared on his face. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all I would like to thank you on behalf of Arnold. Thanks to your righteous rescue, Arnold can escape the Dark Elves' claws and return to the surface world safely. You are too polite. Lord General, is Arnold in good health? Audrey asked. The spider curse was removed, but the body has not fully recovered although if Arnold doesn't see it that way, I still insist that he should spend more time in Bard and Spa. Sir Lovell smiled, replied. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1117 Captain Stonewall Speaking of his brother, Sir Lovell had a little more tenderness in his eyes. Arnold wanted to participate in this military internship, but unfortunately his physical condition did not allow him, so he complained to me a lot and finally reluctantly accepted my arrangement and promised to go to the spa well-being, but in exchange, Arnold gave I have a list and recommend that I reuse the students on the list. Baron Lovell shook the note in his hand, a little helpless in his smile. The four of you are on Arnold's recommendation list. The kid said that you are all the elite of the skeleton club and patted my chest to assure me that each of you has outstanding strength and should be assigned a heavy responsibility to give full play to your competence. Although I still lack understanding of you young people, I believe Arnold's vision. Most of the interns who reported to the military camp this time will be organized into patrols to assist the regular army to assist the villages and towns around Lina Yunbao. As for the four of you, I provide you with two different service options for ordinary interns. Either come to my headquarters as an intern staff or join a reconnaissance company, go deep into the hinterland of Fangshan Mountain, and track the dynamics of monsters. Both of these positions can use your talents. Now you may discuss it and tell me what to do. After hearing the words of Sir Lovell, Joan looked at each other's companions, his eyes puzzled. These two positions provided by Sir Lovell can be described as very different. Serving in the headquarters only needs to deal with some paperwork which is safe and easy. On the contrary, following the reconnaissance company deep into the Dixu mountain, this is a dangerous act of licking blood with a knife head. In case of bad luck, I am afraid that all will be buried in the bones. Everyone has the instinct to seek benefits and avoid harm, but when it comes to making choices, Joan and all four of them tend to join the reconnaissance company. Sit in the office at the headquarters, Think about it and you will die of boredom. I can't stand this kind of crime. Holden's first statement was that he was indeed an adventurous and extremely disgusting character. Hayala and Audrey had the same plan. What kind of internship staff? 
just to say that it sounds good, based on our rookies, how can you be qualified to make suggestions in front of senior officers? If I choose to serve in the headquarters, every day's work is nothing more than serving tea to the chiefs. I am too lazy to wait for people. Hayala said bitterly, serving in the headquarters not only is safe and easy, but also has the opportunity to contact senior officers and expand the circle of communication. This is a good thing, but other students must participate in combat missions. If we only choose a comfortable office position, I am afraid it will cause controversy. People look down on them. Audrey is very concerned about her image and reputation and does not want to be seen as a drill camper who learns to climb up through nipple relationship rather than real talent. For me, it doesn't matter where I serve, but I'm going to investigate the enemy's situation in the snow mountains, and I have more opportunities to study the supernatural creatures in the cold zone. Moreover, the internship points obtained by hunting monsters are definitely more than copying in the office. Jones analysis taking into account scientific research interests and credit income, came to the same conclusion as the three friends. As for the risks, Joanne is not unconsidered. He is still relatively familiar with the Fangshan district, and he speaks a modest truth, unless he encounters a large group of frost giants or white dragons from the Winter Castle, other monsters in the Snow Mountain area, and the likes of snow monsters and winter wolves. He beats his father. The four agreed, and finally Audrey came forward and responded to Sir Level. A tall officer standing behind the Jez heard her say that she would join the reconnaissance company, immediately sinking her face and snorting heavily. Sir Level smiled and turned back to the tall officer, Stonewall. These four newcomers are yours, how to tune them, you can do it yourself. My Excellency. I accepted the two boys. I don't want girls. You should take them away as soon as possible. Captain Wallstone, nicknamed Stone Wall, was reluctant. Sir Level glared at him angrily, without a word, turned and left. Captain Stone was left aside, rubbing his unshaven cheeks awkwardly, turning back to look at Audrey and Hyla, shaking his head and sighing in dismay. The two beautiful young girls with water spirits became trouble in his eyes. The two ladies, I'm so sorry, the company is a group of rude men who don't understand the etiquette. The march in the field is very difficult. It's really not suitable for you, such as Miss Kianjin. It's better to know it by yourself and go to the headquarters or the medical camp to report. Why bother to stay here and embarrass me? Like most officers in this era, Captain Stone is a typical macho who believes in war let women go away, and of course has no good face for Audrey and Hayala. Audrey and Hayala glanced at each other, and their pretty faces showed anger that was hard to conceal. Audrey was promoted to level 8 Blue Knight two days ago, and Hayala was also promoted to level 9 Magic Warrior not long ago. Only in terms of extraordinary professional level, Captain Stone is not much stronger than them. Both hearts are high the arrogant lady, don't think Captain Stone is qualified to underestimate them. Mr. Captain, you misunderstood. In fact, Hayala and I are not the kind of pampered key engine you imagined, and we are no strangers to military life. Audrey barely restrained the anger, and explained to Captain Stone as sincerely as possible. Two months ago, we served under the command of Major Henry James and assisted the Blue Lancers in annihilating the cannibal Warcraft Pelican who was lurking on the top of Bailan Mountain. If you are willing to inquire, you will know the identity of women it does not prevent us from fulfilling our obligations on the battlefield. Mr. Captain, since we came to serve in the military camp, we are ready to overcome difficulties and even make sacrifices. We are also happy to be friendly with our comrades in arms. Whether you are a man or a woman, you don't have to treat me and Hayala differently. Wait. The word look at each other has a pun, and there is a hint of condemnation. Faced with Audrey's humbling response, Captain Stone snorted disapprovingly. What's the use of being pretty in your mouth? In fact you are here to trouble me. You said that you are ready to overcome the difficulties. Then I ask you, when camping, your two little girls are really willing to sleep in the same shack with our stinky men. For another example, when passing by a pond on the way to the march, other people can take off the light and jump into the bath, can you? Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, 
www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1118 Dual Mr. Captain, this is not a question of ability, but whether there is a necessary question. Audrey sank her face, and her words showed an uncontrollable temper. I have to doubt that you are deliberately making things difficult for us. Audrey, you can't be bothered with this big stupid bear. He just made it clear that she discriminates against women. Hayala was not as good tempered as Audrey, and looked at Captain Stone with a sneer. Little girl, who do you say is big stupid bear? Captain Stone was mocked in public by Hayala, and his face couldn't be hung. Whoever has no brains is a big stupid bear. Hayala stared at Captain Stone without showing any weakness. If you think this is an insult, I can apologize, but before that, you have to take back the remarks that discriminated against women. Little girl, I'm too lazy to play tricks with you. Only true skills can guarantee you survive on the battlefield. You can't use your sharp teeth and your mouth, and it's not useful on the front line. Captain Stone said angrily. Very well, now that we have finally talked about the point, Mr. Captain, how do you know that I have no real skills? Hayala's unwillingness to move inwardly ignited his fighting spirit. Captain Stone looked at the little girl who was shorter than himself in surprise and asked in disbelief, If I heard correctly, Miss Green, are you challenging me? You heard it right, Mr. Captain, there is nothing more than a fair showdown to help resolve our differences. Hayala said calmly, No. That's not okay. Captain Stone shook his head again and again. It seems to me that this is not a fair showdown. If my mother knows that I am rude to a woman, she will open my ass. You have a respectable mother, Mr. Captain, but unfortunately she failed to teach you to respect other women besides her. That's because my mother respects men's careers on the battlefield and never points fingers at men on this issue just as she also requires men to respect her in the living room and kitchen. Captain Stone shrugged helplessly, forget it, no matter what I say, you won't be convinced, maybe indeed, as you said, you can only use a contest to end this boring debate, Miss Green, I can accept your challenge, but you have to follow my rules. First talk about the rules, you can go all out and use all the weapons and skills you are good at to try to knock me down, otherwise, I will not be polite to you. As long as you can stand ten moves in front of me, I will take back those unpleasant remarks just now and accept you and Miss Zion into our company. No problem. Hayala agreed without hesitation. Sister Fortune fans, be careful. Captain Stone is not an ordinary person. Holden whispered to Hayala, I heard Arnold talk about this person, this guy is a young and well-known officer under Sir Level. Not only a tenth level fighter is said to have the stone giant bloodline and a natural power. Arnold battled him and didn't take advantage of it. Hayala nodded appreciatively. Captain Stone will compete with the brother of the head boss, and there will be room for some. Arnold can't take advantage of him in competition, which actually means that his strength is slightly inferior to that of Captain Stone. Hayala is now promoted to level 9 magic warrior, confident that he will not lose to Arnold. But how does it compare with Captain Stone? She was also unsure of herself, but this did not prevent her from resolutely challenging Captain Stone. Joan heard that Holden revealed that Captain Stone had a stone giant lineage, and was even more curious about this tall, rude man like a brown bear. He quietly performed higher endoscopy and tried to peep at his bottom, so as to give Hayala a chance wake up so that you know. However, beyond his expectation, the spiritual probe formed by the condensed magic power could not break Captain Stone's will defense line. What surprised him even more was that Captain Stone didn't even realize he was spying in secret, and there was an invisible enchantment rising from the opponent's body, rejecting the reconnaissance attempt of higher endoscopy. After a short period of confusion, Joan recovered, guessing that Captain Stone was likely to carry some kind of magic device that could block the spiritual invasion. At this time Hayali had walked into the competition venue and confronted Captain Stone, attracting crowds to watch. The contrast between the two people who are about to start a duel is too strong. On one side is a giant, seven-foot tall bear and on the other side is a petite and pretty girl with double ponytails it looks like it is not an opponent of the same weight at all, 
the officers and soldiers and interns who came around to see the bustle couldn't help but squeeze cold sweat for Heila. When Heila showed the way of each sword, there was a buzzing discussion around the barracks. Some people looked at her with awe, and some people whispered the material of the giant sword. It is common sense that if this great sword was forged from steel, the weight might be heavier than that of the rock hammer in Captain Stone's hand. The officers and soldiers of the reconnaissance company with rich practical experience had to wonder whether a slender girl with a height of only five feet would really have enough strength to wield such a six foot long sword that weighed almost more than her own weight. It was not until Audrey announced the start of the contest that Hyla waved the giant sword with one hand. The high speed moving blade drove the whistling airflow and violently platooned around the contest field. The onlookers were forced to shut their breaths. In the face of the facts, people have to admit that the giant sword in Hyla's hands is indeed a forged stainless steel, and they are also aware that the girl who wields the giant sword with one hand has horror disproportionate to his petite figure. Strange power. Now there is a good show. Captain Stone's left hand raised a large iron shield as thick as a brick, and took the initiative to swing toward the wave-bladed sword. Accompanied by a loud ear roar. Heila was hit with a sword and was bounced back by the shield. Captain Stone's feet were firmly rooted in the ground, like his nickname Stone Wall. He just turned the big shield in his hand and observed the deep dent on the surface of the shield. Mr. Captain's two thick eyebrows twisted together, and he seemed to be worried about the shield in his hand, but he couldn't support the ten swords and was smashed by the strange the opposite side. Heila slashed his sword with all his strength on the shield. Instead of breaking Captain Stone's defense line, he was shocked and his wrists felt numb. The first move between the two sides is purely a contest of strength and strength. Heila has a power attribute of up to 22, but she still has to admit that she cannot win Mr. Stonewall by her brutal force alone. Judging from the collision of the sword and shield just now, Captain Stone's power attribute is about 26, which is not inferior to the real stone giant, and it is very difficult for humans to find it. Opponent. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1119 Rolling Stone Heila's strength is not as good as Captain Stone, and his body is at a disadvantage. Of course, he will not be stupid enough to continue to compete with the other party. The style of the next sword moves changed drastically and it was elusive. Captain Stone was suffocated. No matter which direction Heila attacked from, he always raised his shield to block it, and ignored the dazzling false moves of the female swordsman. The seventh move between the two sides, Heila suddenly used his special skill to cut the residual image, dragging a series of phantoms behind him, and rushed to Captain Stone at a speed that dazzled the onlookers. This time, the stone-like face of Captain Stone finally showed a touch of emotion, because he could not clearly see the exact trajectory of Heila's sword, he could only block it with his instincts trained through battles. As a result, he barely blocked the sword, and the shield in his hand finally could not bear the heavy blows. The great sword split in half. Captain Stone's left arm shuddered and a color oozed from the part that had been wiped by the wave blade. He did not care to look carefully at the injured arm, and hurriedly waved the war armor to attack and defend. Alka Heila raised his left hand with a sneer, a colorful cone of light squirted out of his palm, sturdy on Captain Stone's face. Captain Stone squinted at the sudden and splendid brilliance, but was not deterred by the colorful jet as Heila expected, and the war armor was still in full swing forcing Heila to abandon the subsequent offensive and the sword block, boom. The heavy war armor hit the giant sword, bursting with dazzling Mars. Heila was once again hit and flew. The backhand thrust the giant sword deeply into the ground. After a while, there was a chirping cutting sound, and the blade plowed out a ten-foot-long gully on the ground, which finally offset the strong impact and barely stopped the backward momentum. Unlucky. The female swordsman couldn't help whispering about her terrible luck. In her view, Captain Stone is the typical reckless man. A person with such a simple mind, no matter how strong the body is, 
it is usually difficult to resist the mental shock caused by the colorful jet. However, Captain Stone didn't know what shit luck he had just taken, but he resisted the colorful jet, causing her offensive to be blocked and her situation becoming very passive. Joan, who was on the spot, saw it better than Hayala. At the moment when Hayala raised his hand and blasted out the colorful jet, he faintly found that the magic net distributed around Captain Stone suddenly gathered and twisted in a fixed configuration, as if he made up a cape by himself, and wrapped Captain Stone. Dot. It was this invisible magic enchantment, not Captain Stone's personal willpower, that blocked Hayala's colorful jet. Captain Stone is a pure warrior and is not good at casting spells or supernatural powers. These abnormal signs once again confirm Jones' guess that Captain Stone is likely to carry a magical object that can resist mental attacks. Just when Joan was thinking about it, Captain Stone had launched a fierce counterattack. He lifted the big iron shield with only half of it in his hand and smashed it hard against Hayala. Tinned at a critical juncture, Hayala suddenly chanted an elven language spell symbolizing Thunderbolt, and the giant sword in his hand burst out with a brilliant electric light while blocking the iron shield. This martial art called magic skill, which is tied to magic fighting as magic warrior, is the two major signature skills of the extraordinary profession, which can use weapons to conduct contact spells, such as the electric claw that Hayala just cast. Dot. The blade carrying the high volt arch current touched the iron shield, and immediately led the current into the iron shield, and then flowed to Captain Stone's left hand holding the shield. Captain Stone found that the situation was not good and did not follow the instinct of the body to give up the shield as soon as possible. Instead, he gritted his teeth and endured the numbness caused by the electric shock moment. Before the left arm completely lost consciousness, he struggled to throw the shield towards Hayala. This counterintuitive approach exemplifies the survival wisdom of a veteran, and at the same time makes Hayala surprised. He has to give up his plan to pursue a victory and flash sideways with a lively shield coming. Captain Stone did not miss the opportunity. Without thinking about the right arm of the wheel, he threw out the brickstone hammer in his hand and hit the female swordsman opposite with the breaking wind. When Captain Stone initially threw his shield, Hayala secretly admired his resilience, but at the moment it was funny to see that he had even lost his remaining weapon, and he calmly blocked the war armor, and afterwards watched him return with bare hands how to fight yourself. However, in a flash of thought, Hayala suddenly realized that the war armor flying across from him rose against the storm, and suddenly turned into a huge stone ball over ten feet in diameter, roaring and rolling towards himself. Suddenly, Hayala had no time to dodge at this time, so he hurriedly inserted the giant sword on the ground, supported the hilt with both hands, and used the wide blade to act as a crowbar. Suppressed his face flushed red, caught in an awkward position of dilemma. Captain Stone shot the storage bag in his right hand, and a magic crystal shotgun in his hand was like a magic. The muzzle of the black hole was pointed at Hyala's eyebrow, and the coercion meant self-vident. Yala. Joan thought about throwing the iron virgin already in his hand. The triangular iron card took off in the air and became a large and thick tower shield, hanging between Hyala and the muzzle. Almost at the same time, Audrey took a step forward and shouted loudly, Mr. Captain? Are you still not going to fulfill the promise you just made? Miss Zion, I don't understand what you mean. You really don't understand? Or are you confused? Audrey lowered her face and said coldly, So do you remember, this is your first move against Hayala? Captain Stone froze for a moment, put away his shotgun, raised his hand, pressed against the huge stone ball of Hayala, and turned into a stone hammer again and flew back to his hand. I can't remember how many moves have been made with Miss Green, but I guess it must have exceeded ten. Although Captain Stone was a little masculine, he was honest and trustworthy. Miss Green, I'm sorry, I was too rude in the past. Please accept my apology and welcome you and your friends to join the reconnaissance company. Hayala backhanded the giant sword into the scabbard behind him, solemnly paid a military salute to Captain Stone and turned back to his companions. With her arrogant temper, 
she had to admit that Captain Stone did have two brushes. If the showdown just now was not a contest to the end, but a real life and death fight, he was really not Captain Stone's opponent. As Captain Stone said, the military camp is a place of supremacy. The splendid showdown just now made the onlooker companies and soldiers all witnessed Hyla's powerful strength, and could not help secretly marveling. This seemingly weak little girl, even facing the idle Captain Stone of the company's officers and soldiers, did not fall down, forcing him to go all out, and finally even the tricks at the bottom of the box were brought out. Since Hyla is so powerful, her three companions are obviously not far behind. With such a thought, the officers and men looked at Joan and others with a little awe. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest. Chapter 1120 Villain Company Since Summer, the translucent heat waves over the meteoric ocean have converged into low-pressure cyclones which have moved toward the coast with the ocean currents. In midsummer July, typhoons frequently landed on the east coast of Medgard, and after sweeping the coastal port, they continued to advance inland in the west until they hit a tall barrier into the clouds Thang Mountains, where cold and hot air flows merged to form a rich rain. On the vast wilderness of the eastern foot of Tusk, flowers, trees, Crops and fruits are ushering in the golden period of thriving growth. Cattle, sheep, and horses grazing in the field also benefit from this, chewing fresh and juicy forages, fat and strong. Hundreds of miles away, the Fangshan mountain was still freezing cold, and the snow on the glacier showed almost no signs of melting. Those monsters that perch on snowy mountains, such as snow monsters and winter wolves, also enter the breeding period with the arrival of summer, and they urgently need more food to supplement their nutrition and feed their cubs. The Great Plains of Germany has been the summer hunting ground most loved by these monsters since ancient times. In the past, when the Azan natives were grazing on the Great Plains, snow monsters and wolves swarmed frequently to attack livestock. Now times have changed and the colonists replaced the aborigines as the new masters of the Great Plains of Wiglida. The traditional nomadic way is replaced by pastures occupied by fences. The large mushroom-like tents of indigenous nomads are becoming scarce. Townhouses pointed wooden fences and barbed wire fences form a colonial settlement, from east to west continue to expand. The savage monsters on the Duxu mountain, even aware of the changes under the mountain, are too lazy to think deeply about what these signs mean. They still follow the living habits of thousands of years, and they go down in groups and raids every summer. The colonial farms and pastures have a common feature. They gather a large number of humans and livestock in a small area. Compared with the indigenous nomads who have nowhere to go, this settlement can provide monsters with a more stable hunting ground. As a result, hunting methods have also changed. Before the colonists arrived, the snow monsters had to go down the mountain alone to hunt, or in groups of three or five. The aimless safari in the wilderness depends on luck. This single-handed hunting method is very suitable for raiding nomads, but it is unable to break through the strict defense measures of colonial settlements, and the strong attack will also kill. After paying a lot of blood, the monsters became a little smarter. They changed from singles to multiple communities and attacked directly at selected colonial settlements. They targeted a tough battle. Once they broke through the fortifications, they often able to return fully. The colonists were not willing to endure looting of monsters. However, with the militia armed in various villages and towns, it was difficult to resist the large group of monsters coming from the raw, and they could only seek assistance from the Lion Yuan Bao garrison. It is against this background that 200 interns from the University of Medgad and the Rangers of Lion Yuan Bao joined forces to form a team. Once they found that the smoke was rising somewhere in the wilderness, they knew the local villages and towns. Being attacked by monsters, 
he responded as soon as possible and gave emergency assistance. Twenty cavalry companies shouldering the mission of support of an average of ten college students in each company. The most respected officers and soldiers are the casters. Divine spellcasters provide reliable medical support for officers and soldiers and arcane spellcasters also play a key role in the tactical core on the battlefield. Thanks to the assistance of this group of college students, each company has achieved outstanding results in the battle against monsters, and the disaster in the surrounding villages and towns has been greatly eased. Of course, there is another meaningful detail that should not be ignored. These companies always went to rescue towns and villages threatened by monsters. Of the 200 interns, the four strongest students did not directly participate in the rescue of the affected villages and towns. They followed the reconnaissance company led by Stonewall Captain Wallstone as early as a week ago and rode the horses all the way. March westward, deep into the heart of the snowy mountains, and perform a secret mission. Baron Laville, who developed this combat plan, believed that passive defense should not be enough. If you always wait until the monsters besieged the villages and towns and burned up and looted the support troops, even if you annihilate the monsters, you will not be able to recover the losses suffered by the local residents. Sir Level believes that any form of warfare follows a common law on which side to fight, the side that suffers is often more severely damaged. Even if the invaders are chased away, the ruins of the homeland will not be renovated on its own with the victory. Rather than being passively beaten in this way, it is better to adopt a more active defense method, and it is best to destroy the monsters in their own nests. If you don't have enough power to destroy the monster, you will try to sneak into the enemy's nest, and then run away. On the premise of preserving one's own strength, try to kill the enemy's vital forces as much as possible and let the monsters taste the pain of the destruction of their homes and the loss of their loved ones. The unit responsible for carrying out this combat plan is the reconnaissance company led by Captain Wallstone, and each member of the company is elite. The company set off from Line Yuan Bao in the early morning of July 5th. The two men and two horses galloped on the vast plains for three days. The journey exceeded 400 miles and went into the inaccessible Dixu Mountain. In the next four days, the reconnaissance company attacked a total of three valley layers where snow monsters lived together. The total number of snow monsters killed was more than 100. The casualties paid by the company were negligible. There are two main reasons for such a brilliant victory. First of all, Stone Company doesn't understand from top to bottom, or pretends not to understand, the guy who is called Night Spirit, as long as they can weaken the enemy's strength, no matter how despicable and heartbroken tactics, they are willing to perform. The Stone Company never attacked the snow monster's den with much fanfare, and had a snow camouflage cloak in hand, always taking advantage of the high moon and black wind, and sneaking into the nest sneaking into the nest. For example, the alchemy bomb that emits pungent smoke after the explosion, the flame glue that can continue to burn on the snow, as long as a small bottle can turn the water source into the poison of the source of diarrhea. All kinds of negative damage tricks are used, the largest limit the enemy's combat effectiveness before starting the fight. And when the snow monsters struggle to rush out of the scene surrounded by poisonous gas and fire, the stone company officers and soldiers lurking in the snow cave will not rush up to fight the monster like the real knight, on the contrary, they are more willing to hold back with a frivolous smirk. He quietly protruded the muzzle from the hidden snow hole and aimed at the snow monster to pull the trigger. The most important criterion for Captain Stone's personal selection is that the marksmanship is better. The role of 100 sharp and sniper sharpshooters in guerrilla warfare is far more useful than the 100 master knights in armor and helmets. Every time the messy guns were swept, the snow monsters with their teeth crowed and screamed collectively on the street. Perhaps in the eyes of purer-minded snow monsters, this group of despicable and shameless human assassins are all top villains the kind that should go to after death. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest. Chapter 1121 Snow Mountain Wolf Holden and Hyla, in this team known for being courageous and obscene, 
were mixed like fish just like a mouse fell into a rice tank. Although Joan did not interact with his comrades, his powerful ability to cast spells still earned the respect of all officers and men. Only Audrey's situation was a bit awkward. She fully understands the tactical style of the reconnaissance company, and also knows that in this solitary guerrilla warfare, only by any means can the enemy be killed to the greatest extent and protect herself. She also doesn't think there is anything wrong with the use of such means as arson poisoning and black gun on the snow monster. When the snow monster slaughtered humans, it was more cruel than these methods. However, as a paladin, she is in a team whose style of action is incompatible with her knightly creeds. Although she doesn't say anything, her mood is inevitably entangled, and she always finds it difficult to integrate into this group. Joan saw Audrey's unhappy face and it was not difficult to guess her thoughts. As a natural out-of-group person, Joan has too much experience on the problem of out-of-group, so that everyone regards his out-of-group as default setting, if he behaves enthusiastically and cheerfully one day in some cases, everyone would worry that he was ill and his brain was confused. Joanne can fully understand Audrey's mood and provides him with some suggestions based on personal experience. No one asked you to join the company like Hayala and Holden, and no one asked you to put a cold gun behind the snow monster. In addition to these dislikes, you can also contribute to the team in areas you are good at. For example, riding a Tanmata patrol in the air looking for monster nests hidden deep in the snowy mountains. These reconnaissance tasks are more valuable than directly participating in combat. There is no exaggeration in Joan's words. One week after the expedition, the reason why the Stone Company has been able to fight in a row, with few casualties. In addition to flexible and eclectic tactics, another major factor is the meticulous aerial reconnaissance. Every time an attack is launched, Joan always uses flight, invisibility and eagle eye to carry out a thorough investigation of the monster's nest in advance, providing detailed information to the company as the basis for formulating a surprise attack plan. Of course, Audrey knew the value of air reconnaissance, and was more pleased to have the opportunity to share pressure with Joan in this vital position. He readily accepted his suggestion and made a request to Captain Stone to assist Joan in air reconnaissance. Captain Stone certainly would not refuse her request. Before Audrey, this aerial reconnaissance work was mainly undertaken by Joan and Holden. Joan could become an eagle, and Holden had a pair of freely retractable dragon wings. In fact, Holden doesn't like to fly alone in the air for a long time. In contrast, he is more willing to chat with his comrades and brag about it. Audrey replaced her younger brother's position, and both of them were satisfied. At dusk on July 10, a Jodenheim Hawkman spread his wide wings and was soaring over the snow-capped mountains. At this moment, there was a sudden excitement of spiritual fluctuations in the eagle's mind. Joan, come to my side. Just discovered a strange thing. Before performing the aerial reconnaissance mission, Joan Schieffer and Audrey established a secondary spiritual connection, which can be used for spiritual communication at any time. Hearing her call at the moment, Joan quickly turned around and fluttered her wings towards the airspace where she was, flying about 20 miles away. Joan saw the Pegasus Lafayette with white wings spread over the snowy mountains. Audrey lay on the back of Danma, opened a pair of beautiful sapphire eyes, stared at the snow valley below the ravine, and seemed very focused. Joan approached Tanma and sent a message to Audrey telling her that she had arrived. Audrey turned back and smiled at him, then pointed down. Look! There are a lot of wolves in the valley. What's so strange about wolves? Joanne asked wonderingly. The most common beasts in the Tusk Mountains are none other than wolves. Their position on the local food chain is only higher than that of herbivores. Compared with snow monsters, wolves pose a much smaller threat to human settlements and do not seem to be worthwhile. Lee made a fuss. This is not an ordinary wolf, you can see it by yourself. Audrey said straightly. Joan knew that Audrey had always been calm and alert and the wolves that aroused her must have been unusual. She looked curiously and looked in the direction she pointed out. Sure enough, she saw a large group of dark-culled beasts surrounded by a valley. Near the entrance, 
there were occasional roars of restlessness. In the valley opposite the group of black wolves, a group of white-haired snow monsters gathered, not to be outdone, and thumped their chests, roaring, as if to overwhelm the opposite wolf howling. In the depths of the valley, there are more snow monsters being disturbed. This scene is indeed very strange. The wolf is certainly a kind of beast, but it is nothing compared with the snow monster. In the past, it was only the hunted by the snow monster. How dare you group to break into the snow monster's site today, and block the snow monster in a big way. The door of the nest who gave them the courage. Even more incredible is that there are no fewer than 50 snow monsters living in the valley, which is not far from the size of the wolves that block the door. Normally, a snow monster hits three evil wolves without any pressure. According to this ratio of combat power conversion, the snow monsters directly rushed out of the nest to wipe out the wolves. It would not be over. Why is it just confronting the roar, dry thunder and no rain? seems to be very afraid of the group of black wolves. Joan, did you notice that these black wolves are almost as big as the snow monsters? Audrey promptly reminded Joan that he had made a preconceived mistake just now. The black wolves on the ground look very small from a thousand feet, compared with ordinary wolves. They can't see any difference, but as long as the opposite snow monster is used as a reference, you will find that these black wolves are all amazingly large, at least 9 feet long from beginning to end, and the shoulder height is not less than 6 feet. Such a tall and strong beast, even compared to the lion and tiger, is not inferior. It is no wonder that the opposite snow monster is afraid of it, and it is not easy to attack the house blocked by the wolves. Joan, I have never seen a wolf bigger than a horse. Do you recognize the origin of this weird black wolf? Audrey asked. I have never seen such a beast, but I have heard that there is such a monster that is larger and more brutal than the ordinary wild wolf in the Fangshan Mountain. I had seen the fur of this beast during my stay in Shizu town. And skull specimens, locals call them to a wolf. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1122 Old Wolf Augustus Joan thought about it, and then explained to Audrey the creature fear of wolf. Dire wolf is a subcategory of violent wolf, but it is more accustomed to activities in the cold and mountainous hills of the north than ordinary fierce wolf and its intelligence level is similar to that of ordinary wild wolf. In this way, the wolf can only be regarded as a relatively powerful gregarious beast. The physical strength may be slightly stronger than the snow monster, but the intelligence is far inferior to the snow monster, and there is no supernatural ability. How dare to actively contain the snow monster? Lair, don't you ever live impatiently? Audrey asked puzzlingly. Joan had the same doubts, and he concentrated on observing the movement of the group of fearful wolves outside the valley, and gradually saw some signs. Audrey, if I read right, although the fearful wolf and the snow monster seem to be struggling, in fact, neither side has real hostility, it is more like being bored and shouting and demonstrating each other. Also, did you notice that, a wide corridor was isolated between the snow monster camp and the dread wolf camp? So far, only one white wolf is pacing back and forth in this corridor separating the opposing sides, it seems what are you waiting for? White wolf, where? Audrey widened her eyes curiously, and looked in the direction of Joan's finger. Sure enough, she saw an invisible figure hovering in the snow. The wolf is covered in white snow-like fur, almost integrated with the snow background, and looking from a thousand feet, if it is not as sharp as the falcon, it is easy to ignore its existence. After all, human vision cannot compare with eagles. Joan also knew that Audrey had a hard time seeing the appearance of the white wolf, so she described what she saw in her eyes to her. The white wolf is slightly smaller than the fearful wolf, the frost is condensed around the mouth, and the pupil is almost transparent blue, if you can see its eyes, you will find that this guy's eyes are not only cold, but also from time to time, there is a gleam of deceit, which shows that the intelligence is much higher than the fearful wolf, 
so it is no wonder that it can become the leader of the wolf pack. Blue-eyed white wolf. This sounds familiar, Audrey tilted her head for a moment, and suddenly her eyes lit up. Is it a winter wolf? Joan nodded gently. It was indeed a winter wolf, and it was the most cunning old male winter wolf. When Joan was in his hometown of Dillon Township, he grew up with the half-breed winter wolf Jamie. He knew a little about the creature of the winter wolf and would never be mistaken. Among all the common supernatural canine wild animals, the winter wolf is not the most capable, but it is almost the smartest. The old wolf in the valley will never gather a large group of fearful wolves in front of the snow monster nest for no reason. Dot. Joan foresees that something big will happen next. Would you like to report to Captain Stone? Audrey asked cautiously. Now we haven't figured out the intentions of the wolves. Let's wait for a while and see what happens next. Joan raised his hand and touched the prosthetic eye to start the eagle eyes, and set up an invisible observation point near the valley mouth where the wolves faced the snow monsters. Joan projected his perspective on the invisible observation point to observe the motion near the valley entrance. Just as he switched perspectives, the snow monsters of Taniguchi rioted and shouted the same giant word. Joan had already mastered the language of giants, and heard clearly through the magic observation point. Joan, what are the monsters shouting at? Audrey asked curiously. They are shouting a name, which should be their leader. This is a giant language title. If it is translated into our human language, the more elegant translation method is called White Master or His Royal Highness. However, Snow Monster is not a class that is elegant and elegant. I prefer to translate it as Bei Bei or Bei Bo, which is more in line with the rugged language style of the Snow Monster family. According to your translation, it sounds like the leader of a group of street gangsters. Audrey sneered. Joan shrugged. The Snow Monster is still at the level of the barbarian people of the Stone Age and its cultural tradition has its own gangster characteristics. Audrey's evaluation is right. Just as the two exchanged their hearts, the leader of the local snow monster Bay I Bay I finally came out lazily in the cheering and cheering of his brothers. Joan immediately switched his perspective to the magic observation point, and took a closer look. It turned out that the big white was a mutated snow monster. The strong body almost filled the canyon corridor, and his head was twice as high as the ordinary snow monster. Dark face, impatient expression. Dabai walked straight out of the valley mouth and stopped before the winter wolf. With his hands on his hips, he looked down at the winter wolf that was extremely thin compared to him in a daunting and contemptuous gesture. The winter wolf raised his head, his blue eyes sullenly, and roared loudly at the big white, but instead of the wolf howling, it was a slightly strange giant language. Dabai looked gloomy and silently listened to the falling of the winter wolf, suddenly stomping his feet suddenly, and roared like an eruption, frightening the snow monsters and the wolves around them. The wolf wolf was also frightened and shrunk his head, forced to close his mouth. Joan, what happened to those two monsters? They looked like they were arguing. Audrey couldn't understand the language of the giant, and Joan interpreted for her the dispute between Dabai and the Winter Wolf. The Winter Wolf named Augustus is a servant of the Lord of Winter Old Trim. This time he was ordered to convey the instructions issued by Winterberg to Dabai. As for the specific instructions, it is still unknown. Dot. Winter Wolf Augustus self-confessed that he was the special envoy of Winter Castle. The shelf was very large and he was very dissatisfied with the leader of the local snow monster that is, the big white when he arrived late, he just reprimanded the other party for a while. Dabai didn't refute it at first, but quietly endured the anger of Augustus. Later, it seemed to be intolerable. When the fire broke out, he roared back. After hearing Joan's report, Audrey couldn't help laughing. According to your description, the old wolf named Augustus has quite a sense of domineering power. As for the mutated snow monster named Dabai, he is obviously a grumpy guy, otherwise he would not dare to face Winter Castle face to face to turn your face. Joan nodded and said regretfully, I can't wait for them to fight, but unfortunately the old wolf Augustus chose to retreat, 
and did not continue to intensify the contradiction between the two sides. Audrey looked down the valley mouth, and the old wolf Augustus and the mutant snow monster Big White, it seems that the anger has subsided at this moment, and began a calm conversation. Dabai is a violent and gloomy guy with very few words, carrying his shoulders and sullenly listening to the old wolf for Gus nagging, but occasionally shaking his head to say Moj to express his objection. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest. Chapter 1123 Dabai Old Wolf Augustus patiently persuaded, repeatedly persuaded, even threatened with temptation, finally finally persuaded, barely nodded and said Mott. When the old wolf saw him slack, he couldn't help showing his face, and touted Dabai again urging him to lead all the snow monsters and follow him on the road as soon as possible. Dabai still had that gloomy coffin face, and a very impatient expression of S2. Before the old wolf had finished speaking, he turned back and waved at the group of little brothers behind him. More than fifty adult snow monsters have already been waiting impatiently, and all cheered and shouted when the boss made the decision. When the old wolf August saw this scene, his lips twitched a strange smile, turned his head back to the wolves, led the large group of fearful wolves, and ran down the mountain through the valley. Dabai led the snow monsters, rushing to the ground with their hands and feet, and trailing behind the wolves, swept away like a silver torrent. Audrey saw that the wolves and snow monsters were dispatched one after another, and they were rushing down the mountain. They were anxious and hurriedly asked Joan, where are these monsters going? Old Wolf Augustus did not say a clear destination, but only asked Dabai to follow him, saying that it was a very important thing to do for Dong Bao. After the event, he would reward a hundred fat cows. Joan recalled the process of negotiation between Leilang and Dabai, and then said, Dabai doesn't seem to be interested in the reward of a hundred fat cows but the group of snow monsters under his hands can't stand such a temptation. They all clamored to urge him to accept the employment of Dong Bao. Later, Dabai reluctantly nodded and agreed. The reward is not entirely in response to the voice of his men. From the gloomy expression on Dabai face, I guess he has noticed that the assignment of Winter Castle was a painful task, but he did not dare to offend Winter Castle so he had to go down the mountain with a scalp and act as a thug for old wolf Augustus. Audrey listened to his analysis, and his face became dignified. Joan, I suspect there is something hidden behind this matter. We must report to Captain Stone as soon as possible. You go back and report. I plan to continue to track Augustus and Dabai to find out what the plot of these sneaky monsters is. Prompted by curiosity. Joan decided to follow the snow monsters and wolves alone until the mystery of the happy head was solved. Audrey hesitated for a moment and nodded, then you need to be more careful. Please contact me at any time, don't take risks easily. You can rest assured that I will take care of myself. Joan waved goodbye to her, hurriedly fluttering his wings and speeding up, chasing the group of monsters on the snow that had already drifted away. In order to avoid the alertness of the snow monsters and wolves, Joan also took time to cast a spell while shooting, and then lowered the flying height in order to observe the whereabouts of the monsters. Old Wolf Augustus led the way, followed by a pack of wolves, followed by a large white and many snow monsters, ran for two hours in the snow-capped mountains, until the twilight enveloped, there was no plan to stop. Just as Joan guessed the destination of their trip, Dabai suddenly let out a long whistle and stopped first. The snow monsters behind him received orders and all stopped one after another. Old Wolf August heard the movement behind him, glanced back, and found that the snow monsters had stopped, and hurriedly turned around and rushed over, asking angrily why Dabai stopped. The mutant snow monster rolled his outer eyelids and yelled at the old wolf angrily. Kiaan heard the conversation vaguely in midair. Dabai seemed to complain that the sky was dark. He and his clan were tired and sleepy. He had to find a place to sleep. It was not too late to continue his journey tomorrow morning. Old wolf Augustus was very dissatisfied with his procrastination, trying to persuade Dabai to hurry up all night 
but the other party just shook his head and refused to die. Finally, the old wolf had no choice but to endure his anger and agreed to spend the night in the nearby valley. Kiaon invisibly watched the dispute between Lao Lang and Dia Bai and couldn't help laughing. Looking at the old wolf's angry face when he left, most of them suspected that Dabai and his people were deliberately delaying time. In Joan's view, this is not necessarily the deliberate negative work of the snow monsters. It is more likely that the living habits of both parties are huge. The difference caused a misunderstanding. The winter wolf and the dread wolf are born with developed night vision capabilities, and are basically nocturnal creatures that are used to day and night. Snow monsters do not have dark vision. Their night vision is greatly restricted, and they are standard daytime creatures like humans. At this time the night was getting dark, and it was time for the snow monsters to get used to sleeping. Of course, they were reluctant to continue the night. On the contrary, after nightfall, it was the most active period of time for the pack wolves. Old Wolf Augustus pushed himself, suspecting that Bay I Bay I deliberately troubled himself because the other party still has use value, and now it is inconvenient to turn his face and have to bear with it. Snow monsters and wolves entered the valley one after another, looking for a sheltered area suitable for sleeping. Joan converged his wings and quietly landed on a rock covered with snow in the valley, standing high and observing the movement of the monsters. The terrain in the valley is low, and it looks like a snow-covered basin and the surrounding cliffs are thick with ice. Dabai walked to the end of the valley, buried his head in the mountains and snow, and with his strong arms and a pair of claws, he dug out an ice cave for shelter within ten minutes and fell asleep. Other snow monsters also followed the practice of white, digging snow in the area near the cliff, drilling into the cave, curled up into a fluffy mass, snoring loudly after a while. The old wolf August and the group of fearful wolves that followed him saw that the snow monsters had fallen asleep, and they had nothing to do. They had to doze in groups of three or five on the snow to kill time. Joan stood on the mountain rock, secretly observing the scene in the valley, and waited patiently for a long time, until all the snow monsters had drilled into the cave and made snoring sounds. Under the cover of invisibility, he spread his wings and slowly towards the valley. Glide past deep. As he passed the pack of wolves, Joan's nerves were tense, lest he alarm the group of sharp smelling beasts. Fortunately, the wolves, including August, did not notice the airflow passing over their heads, and no one ever looked up. Joan glanced across the warning belt guarded by the pack of wolves, gliding to the sleeping area of the snow monsters secretly relieved. Converging his wings and landing on the snow, Joan was not eager to move his foot, and first displayed the supernatural ability advanced spider form and transformed into a half human and half spider form. Then he walked eight long legs and walked quietly on the snow. Compared with the eagle or human form, the biggest advantage of the spider body is that it has eight legs to share the weight. Walking on the snow will leave no traces, nor will it make foot sounds. It can avoid the snow monsters and the wolves. Vigilance. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1124 Assassination Kiaon sneaked in stealth smoothly passed through the snow-covered valley, and came to the ice cave where Dabai lived. He listened to his ears. As the sound of thunder snoring came from the depths of the cave, Dabai was already asleep. He quietly burrowed into the cave, and really saw the mutant snow monster curled up in a ball, lying on the side in the soft snow, sleeping soundly. Joan stared at the monster's back, with a killing intent. He first held the dagger, thought for a moment and then let go of his hand. The mutant snow monster is too strong, even in sleep, not a small dagger can kill. Joan knew that he had only one chance to stab. If he failed to succeed, Dabai was injured and awakened. He called for warning. Snow monsters and wolves were all surrounded. Thinking so, Joan gave up the idea of stabbing a knife behind him, 
and instead took a capsule encapsulating the drow toxin from the storage bag, and used it as a casting material to cast a three ring poison strike against the snoring masterpiece. Surgery, a pale negative beam of energy is emitted from the fingertip. The mutant snow monster that was already in his sleep had no consciousness of resisting poison strike. The huge body trembles slightly, and then he collapses again. The drow toxin, which was increased by magic power, quickly invaded Dabai causing him to fall into the deepest coma. Even if he beat a gong and drums in his ear, he could not wake him up. If you leave him alone, he will not wake up until his physical function is exhausted and he will die in a lethargic state. Joe Ank did not have time to wait for him to sleep until he died, carried a dagger to the white heel, cut a cluster of hair from his back, and then used the hair as a material to perform the mythological transformation, and in a blink of an eye, the form of spiders, into a mutant snow monster exactly like Dabai. There are two mutant snow monsters in the cave, and they look extra hard. Kiao An's killing intention has been decided, but he is worried that the gas will cause the wolf to be alert. He simply grabs the white throat with his bare hands, and his arms are forced, and he is strangled. Mythical transfiguration can simulate the transfiguration object from the cell level and obtain all the strength attributes of the opponent. Joan also wears a gorgeous belt that can increase the strength of four points. In this way, the big white he turned into is stronger than the real big white. Even if both sides are awake, the result of wrestling is that Joan wins more, and at this moment Dabai has been hit by poison strike, the nerves are completely paralyzed by toxins, and even a consciousness of resistance is too late to rise. And Shengxing twisted his thick neck, and tilted his head to one side. Joan peeled off his white eyelids and found that his pupils had begun to spread, his heartbeat and breathing also stopped, nodded with satisfaction, and he used a shrinkage to reduce the body in front to a normal size of six. Anifertinth, from a giant monster up to 20 feet into a white haired monkey that is only 5 feet high. Joan dug a snow hole on the spot, threw the large white body down, covered it with ice and snow, and buried it strictly. The number of days that the third ring shrinkage continues to take effect is proportional to the cast level. At Joan's current level, Dabai's corpse can be kept shrinking for the next 8 days. After that, even if the corpse is restored to its original state and the cave where the burial was buried is exposed, it's too late. It's not here for a long time. After disposing of the body, Joan sat cross-legged in the place where dear Bay I was sleeping just now, swallowing a meditation capsule for mental meditation. After half an hour, Joan finished his meditation, narrowed his eyes and looked out of the cave. He didn't notice any abnormal movement and then shook his head back. He first set up a magic alarm at the entrance of the cave, then like a real mutant snow monster, curled his knees, shrunk into a fluffy pile, and fell asleep above the snow pile where the big white body was buried. Joan woke up naturally after two hours of sleep, stretched out, sat cross-legged in the ice cave, and spent an hour preparing for today's spell. At this time, the sky outside was clear, and Joan drilled out and slapped his hand back to pack the collapsed hole. The broken ice and snow collapsed and buried the cave completely. The snow monsters still asleep in the valley were awakened by the roaring sounds. They drilled out of the caves, and cast awesome sights on Joan. Joan deliberately imitated Dabai style, with a sullen complexion, his surly eyes swept over the snow monsters one by one and he seemed to be thinking of picking one out and beating him as a pump. The snow monsters have long been accustomed to the moody, somber character of the boss, all frightened by the atmosphere and dared not pant, hurried out of the cave and gathered around him. Joan nodded in satisfaction, led a group of snow monsters out of the valley, and faced the old wolf for gust and the group of fearful wolves under it. Dabai you are finally awake. Old Wolf August hurriedly urged, we have been wasting all night, hurry up and go on the road. In case of delaying the mission given by Master Trim, you and I cannot afford it. Joan tilted his head and stared at the Old Wolf fearily, his right hand rubbing slowly on his belly without saying a word. The Old Wolf was annoyed by his surly look and asked angrily, Dabai, 
What the do you want, hungry? Joan exhaled coldly. You fucking. You know to eat all day long except to sleep. It's a rice bucket. The old wolf could not help but curse. You say it again. Joan made a step closer to the old wolf, and his grim black face was murderous. Damn big guy. The old wolf shrank his head backwards, and really didn't dare to turn his face against this moody Big Mac and barely squeeze out a smiley face. Dabai. Everyone is very hungry, but there is nothing to eat here. Joan interrupted him and said eerily, Wolf meat is very good. You madman. Old Wolf Augustus made anger and patiently persuaded, be sensible, my friend, don't forget that I'm dealing with you on behalf of Winter Castle. Joan didn't say anything, his face was still somber. Dabai, let's go on the road now, and we will be able to reach our destination at most this afternoon. At that time, there will be fresh and delicious human meat to eat with you. Joan nodded, seemingly seduced by the old wolf, and asked quietly, Destination, what does that mean? The old wolf shook his head. He felt helpless about the ignorance of this big man and could only explain it patiently, It is the end of our trip. But what is it? Joe looked naive. You idiot. It's so stupid that it's hopeless. Lao Lang shouted angrily, Elk Town. Should you know? Joan's eyes flicked, and then he returned to his face, nodding. Elk Town, the lair of humans. There are many cattle and sheep. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect. www.mtlnovel.com. Master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest. Chapter 1125 Replace Less. Dot, dot, dot. Well, if you can't understand what a human settlement is, you can use town as a nest. Old Wolf August shook his head and sighed, seeming to have been despairing about the big white ignorance. The inside story of this matter is very complicated, so don't ask me on way he don't understand it anyway. In short, just follow me, take down Elk Town, and promise you that there will be no fewer than fifty fat cows. Yard better talk and count. If you don't have beef, eat wolf meat. Joan threw a word coldly and led the snow monster to continue his journey. Old Wolf August heard the threat in his words, spitting at his back and cursed in a low voice, Bah, stupid big guy. When you lose the use value, you will know the consequences of offending Lao Tzu. Depressed with resentment, Old Wolf August ran a few steps back to the wolves and continued to lead the way. The snow monsters followed the pack of wolves and Joan landed intentionally or unintentionally at the end of the team. While the old wolf did not pay attention to him, he quickly performed a three-ring short message to report to the company that he had just probed, indicating that the pack and snow blame the current location and the intended destination. Joan successfully completed the spell and successfully sent out the information secretly relieved. The snow monsters around couldn't understand his gestures at all. Even if they were puzzled, they didn't dare to talk inquisitively about the big white prey. From early morning to early afternoon, Joan led the snow monster behind the wolves, hurried all morning, and ran for a hundred miles from the middle of the mountain to the foot of the mountain. The closer to the foot of the mountain, the higher the temperature, the thick snow was half melted by the sun and the melted snow converged into a gurgling stream, flowing down the ridge. On the damp and muddy hillsides, vegetation is gradually enriched. The flowers and grass get rid of the blockade of snow, and the sun grows in the summer, and the green is everywhere. Joan is familiar with the scene before him. A week ago, the company traversed this road when it went up the mountain. If you remember correctly, there is a pasture built on a mountain nearby. At that time, the company passed by this place and it was already late. The ranch owner is a rich man living in the city of Meadgard, and herds of cattle, sheep and horses are entrusted to the management of the Azar herdsmen hired by him, but only occasionally come to inspect. The uncle of the Azar tribe who is in charge of the ranch is very friendly to Joan and their company aiming to enter the mountain banditry. They not only agreed to board them in the ranch but also invited them to drink a hot pepper mutton soup. Thinking of the delicious flavor of the mutton soup, Joan couldn't help swallowing his saliva, his stomach that hadn't been eaten in the morning gurgled. Not only was Joan hungry, he followed the snow monsters who had been running for most of the day, 
and they were all hungry at the same time, just because they were afraid of his temper, so they dared not complain. Joan didn't want to condone the hungry monsters attacking the ranch, but the ranch was on the way down the mountain. He had to make an excuse as soon as possible to persuade the old wolf for Gus to go to Elk Town to bypass the ranch. Just as he was wondering, a strong wind blew head with atmosphere faintly in the wind. The wolves and the snow monsters have extremely keen senses of smell. When they smelled this gas, they immediately became turbulent and howled in the direction of the blowing wind, and they all seemed excited and impatient. These brutal and hungry beasts lose their senses once they smell the smell and cannot be stopped. Joan could only harden his scalp and lead the snow monster towards the direction, and his heart was uneasy. Within half an hour, the pack of wolves and snow monsters arrived at the ranch, the miserable sight in front of him confirmed Joan's concerns. The pasture fence has been violently demolished, and the corpses of cattle and sheep are scattered on the grass. About thirty snow monsters are happily catching cattle and sheep in the corral. Joan quickly observed the surrounding environment. The first thing to be sure was that the ranch was recently attacked by a large group of snow monsters and the fence was broken. However, judging from the carcasses left at the scene, most of the animals, including all horses, had been removed before the attack leaving only four yaks and ten goats. Although the scene was very bloody, there were only a few corpses with snow monster bullet holes, but no human corpses. It can be seen that the herdsmen saw the bad situation and put two rounds of guns. Safety zone under the mountain. As for the few cattle and sheep abandoned here, it is more like bait deliberately left to the monsters, encouraging them to chase cattle and sheep, scramble for food so they can care about chasing the retreating brigades of livestock. This strategy of losing the to protect the car is an open secret among human herdsmen. It is not a clever strategy, but for the snow monster with a simple mind and a desire for immediate benefits, this trick is always very effective. The yak is certainly brave and strong, but the snow monsters are surrounded by three or five groups and it is not difficult to suppress it. What really made the snow monster's headache was the group of lively goats. The frightened goat blew up the camp, and all screamed and screamed out of the fence. Instead of running down the mountain, they climbed up against the steep cliff. The snow monsters were reluctant to give up the lamb to their mouths, scolding freehand rock climbing, chasing goats. The snow monster is actually an expert at climbing mountains, but compared to goats, climbing skills are at least two steps worse. It was difficult to climb to the middle of the cliff, and it was not cold to prevent the soles of the feet from slipping, grunting and falling down, even with a thick hair cushion. It was also swollen and blue, and dizzy, and I couldn't climb for a long time. There happened to be two goats, so he ran past Joan, dancing lightly and hurried up the cliff. Joan stopped and looked back at the goat. The snow monsters behind him also buzzed with turmoil, gazing at the back of the goat with their eyes, swallowing saliva, and eager to dry. If only the cost and economic benefits are counted, raising goats is actually not as cost-effective as raising cattle, horses or sheep. Mountain pastures always raise a group of goats. Instead of relying on goats to make money, they will release the flocks to attract monsters to chase when they are attacked by monsters, so as to seek time for a treat. Goats are tricky and dexterous, and they are all rock climbing experts. After the snow monsters have worked hard, they will eventually climb up the cliff and hunt the escaped goats. They will find that it is more difficult to go down the mountain than to go up the mountain. In the end, he could only hold a goat and shrink into a ball rolling down from the top of a steep cliff, and his head was broken and the blood flow was considered light. For this reason, the delay time was not to mention. Snow monsters are always guilty of this kind of misfortune because they are small, but they don't remember long. They will still be guilty of losing watermelon and picking sesame seeds later. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1126 Flip Face Of course, Joan saw the herder's crimes at a glance, but he deliberately didn't mean it, but instead catered to the mentality of the snow monsters eager to hunt goats, 
waved his hand and indulged the young brothers to go up the mountain to catch sheep. In addition to Joan, in this team of wolves and snow monsters, only the old winter wolf Augustus has enough wisdom to understand the herders slowing down. Seeing that the snow monster was deceived, the old wolf was anxious and angry, and hurriedly turned around and hurried over, urging Joan to take care of the overall situation, restraining his men to give up chasing goats, and continue to hurry, don't delay the surprise attack in Elk Town for the sake of a small profit. Plan. Joan raised his face and folded his arms across his chest. No matter how the old wolf persuaded, he just kept shaking his head and repeating a sentence. Mudge, mudge. The old wolf frayed his mouth, and all the truth was exhausted, but it was still useless, and finally he couldn't hold back his anger, and he scolded angrily. Dabai, you brainless idiot. Hurry up and greet your men back. Mr. Trim's affair. All your idiots must be skinned not to die. What are you talking about? Joan rolled his eyes strangely. Old dog, you scold me again to dry. You fucking. The old wolf was about to open his mouth to curse. The mutant snow monster suddenly burst out, rounded his arms, and a huge slap with a roaring wind sounded firmly on the old wolf's face. What kind of dog are you? Dare to scold me? Go to hell. I have been holding you for a long time. Joan opened his eyes in a rage, snarled and rushed up, stepped on the back of the old wolf's spine, grabbed his tail with both hands, struggling, and with a puff. The old wolf's tail was pulled by him, and the broken tail's roots spewed blood. The dyed chrysanthemum is scarlet. The old wolf, Augustus, almost suffocated with pain, barely turned his head to glare at Joan, and spurted a white coal wave at him. After Joan transformed into Dabai, he accidentally injected a awakening agent to obtain all the supernatural abilities of the mutant snow monster, including immunity to cold damage. The cold current spewed out by the winter wolf is a cold supernatural attack that can instantly freeze human blood, but it does not work for Joan, who is immune to the magic of cold. Close your stinky mouth. Joan, who turned into a monster, couldn't help but move the animal's nature in the blood. He raised his fist, and banged two heavy punches on the old wolf's face. The sound of broken bones came from under the fist making Joan suddenly wake up and barely restrain the urge to use violence. Looking down, old wolf Augustus had broken his chin, his face was bloody, and his eyes turned white. Joan reached out and leaned into the nose of the old wolf, tentatively, breathing faintly, it seemed that he was just beaten to death. Joan secretly relieved, the old wolf can't die yet, so he will pry open his mouth later, and ask all the details about the attack on Elk Town. The sudden outbreak of conflict here attracted a large crowd of snow monsters to watch. Seeing the old wolf beaten by their boss, they all groaned in excitement and applauded the boss. The group of fearful wolves in front also noticed that the situation was not right and looked back. Seeing that the leader was stepped on his feet by Dabai, there was more outgassing and less air intake, and there was a sudden uproar, and his teeth grinned and made a siege gesture. The intimidation of the pack wolves did not scare away the snow monsters, but instead stimulated the primitive fierceness of this group of monsters, screaming at the pack wolves and defending their boss. Joan noticed the sharp rise of the gunpowder smell in the air, but did not restrain it. Instead, he waved his hand and waved his hand pointing at the wolves and yelling Moj. The little brothers around the snow monsters waited for the words of the boss, just like hearing the horn of the charge, rushing towards the wolves, waving their thick arms, and beating the nearest fearful wolf crazy. The terrified wolf is not easy to bully. He raised his fangs, leaned against the snow monster, bit his opponent's arm, and slammed into each other's arms. Snow monsters and terror wolves fought together, the ground was splashed with large pieces of mud mixed with blood, roaring and howling one after another, the scene was chaotic. Joan didn't stay out of it, took a deep breath, and rushed into the densest area of the wolves, opening a cold airflow covering the space of sixty feet in front. 
the magic contained in the cold current causes an average of up to 10 energy levels of cold damage to all creatures affected by the spit. The snow monsters all have the talent to be immune to the freezing cold, and are not affected by the cold current that Joan spares. The terror wolf fighting with the snow monster does not have such resistance and all of them are frozen to the point of stiffness and slow action. The snow monsters took the opportunity to take advantage, riding on the back of the frozen terror wolf crazy beating. There are some more clever snow monsters. When they see the boss spitting cold currents, they are inspired. They no longer brainlessly compete with the fearful wolf. Instead, they open their inner eyelids and issue a chilling gaze. Dire wolves are more powerful than snow monsters and their beast-shaped bodies are more suitable for melee combat than humanoid creatures like snow monsters, but they don't have the supernatural ability of snow monsters, and they are hit by the shock stare. Shivering, even paralyzed, the snow monsters quickly gained an overwhelming advantage and slammed the pack of wolves. Within half an hour, more than 60 terror wolves were mostly killed by the snow monsters, and the remaining terror wolves were also frightened struggling to get rid of the entanglement of the snow monsters, and fled to the desert. After a dog fight, the snow monsters also sacrificed more than a dozen lives. Except for Joan, almost everyone was bleeding. However, the casualties were insignificant in the eyes of this group of barbaric monsters. The most important thing was that they defeated the wolves, thumped their chests, and raised their eyes. Joan, who commanded the snow monsters to beat the wolves, has also become an irreplaceable hero in the mind of his brother, looking to show his heartfelt reverence in his eyes. After the excitement, some snow monsters picked up the wolf corpses in place, skillfully peeled off the wolf skin, and bitten the fresh wolf with blood, and enjoyed it. Joan frowned, and suddenly shouted loudly. The snow monsters were horrified by the horror, and hurriedly dropped the corpse in their hands, wiped the blood stains from their mouths, and surrounded them to the boss. Joan pointed to the messy body, shook his index finger, and said contemptuously, Mudge. Then he turned to face the mountain pasture, pointed at the cattle and sheep being chased by another group of snow monsters, gave a thumbs up, shouted, Mott. The snow monsters nodded their heads and agreed with the boss' wise opinion. Compared with the stubborn wolf meat, the beef and lamb are indeed more delicious, more mott. Joan led the snow monsters with absolute authority, took a big step, and approached the ranch fence aggressively. The group of snow monsters under the mountain had long noticed the conflict on the hillside. At this time, Joan saw a group of fierce and evil spirits, and surrounded them with no good intentions. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1127 Tyrannical The group of snow monsters that attacked the ranch was just a small gang, and the leader was only a slightly stronger male than the ordinary snow monsters, who came forward to confront Joan. Joan looked contemptuously at the little man on the opposite side, then pointed to the cow and sheep behind him and said with a deep voice, Mott. Then Joan raised his thumb again, pointed at his chest and the younger brother behind him, and shouted, Mott. This means, Yak is very good, we want it, who dare not give it, all Mog. The snow monster leader opposite recognized the big man in front of him at a glance, which was the famous bully Dabai in the nearby mountains. The confidant is alone but he is no match for the great white party. He has to retreat and agree to let go of goats or yaks, whatever he chooses, but he can't take away all the cattle and sheep. It's too bullying. Kiao tilted his mouth and sneered, I don't know what it means to bully people, cattle and sheep, all of you. The leader of the snow monster was so angry that his face was white, and his face was thumped, and he shouted, Mudge, Mudge. Joan lowered his face and said coldly, Lozi has a bad temper, and he hates people who are twitching in front of me. You must not mess with me. The leader of the snow monster was still protesting, and Joan was impatiently listening to his verbose. He suddenly swayed his right arm, and a strong uppercut hit him firmly on the opponent's chin, picking him up into the air, 
rolling and falling out. Joan exerted force on both feet and jumped up like a white meteorite from the sky. He stomped on the stomach of the snow monster leader who was still struggling to climb. The weight of more than 3,000 pounds fell from high altitude and the huge inertia was all applied to the abdomen of the snow monster leader. The terror of the impact is comparable to the bombardment of heavy artillery. Puff! Gs monster leader spouted a blood arrow, his face twisted, his eyes burst, his intestines were all smashed by Joan. Joan reached out his long arm and grabbed the head of the snow monster, just like unscrewing a ripe melon from the vine. With a click, he twisted his head off and the blood flowing from his broken neck was the same. The fountain rose into the sky, staining his chest and abdomen with scarlet A's, which was horribly tyrannical. Joan slammed the head of the snow monster with a horrified head, sneered, and threw the head at the opposite crowd. The group of snow monsters behind him had already been stimulated by the boss means. When he saw the boss throwing his head like a signal to launch a general attack, all the animal blood was boiling. The group is still in a state of coercion. This time, Joan did not personally stand on the hillside, watching the two snow monsters killing each other. Joan backhanded and pressed the slightly hot, battered deformed eyeball behind his neck, suddenly realizing the fact. Compared to living in a civilized society, he is more comfortable in the beasts of weak meat and strong food. This terrible thought made Joan shudder and his mood became very heavy. Just when he was restless, he noticed that the distribution of the magic net in front of him was disturbed, and a ball of red light appeared quietly. Joan settled down and looked around alertly. Old Wolf Augustus had been stunned by him. The snow monsters couldn't understand what this red ball of light meant. Moreover, they were all involved in the ardent battle, and they could not look at him more. Joan felt a little relieved and quickly reached out the big hand, grasped the little ball of light, and read the information loaded in it. This short message was sent by Holden. After reading it, Joan nodded thoughtfully and turned to look at the cliff opposite the ranch. Thick ice and snow are stacked on the cliffs. Under the sun in the summer, the snow surface melts and condenses into a layer of ice shells. The melted snow water converges into a clear mountain stream, which flows along the steep slopes, through the grassy pastures. Joan narrowed his eyes slightly, and vaguely saw a familiar figure standing on the top of the cliff. It was Captain Wallstone who was a tall reconnaissance company commander. Mr. Captain carried his magic weapon named Conglomerate Warhammer and seemed to be observing a large group of snow monsters fighting below. Holden has already disclosed the campaigner's combat plan in his letter, and told Joan to escape from the area below which is about to suffer a top disaster as soon as possible. Joan hesitated and decided not to leave for the time being, so as not to cause the snow monsters to doubt. Since you want to stay in this place that has become very dangerous, the necessary self-preservation measures are still to be done. Joan Lowe thought about it, chanting the spellcasting mantra in a low voice, and shot a three-ring spell melt into the stone on his chest. Within the next eight hours, he could melt into the big rock at any time out of time. As soon as he was ready to cast spells, Kiaan heard a roar from the top of the cliff and looked up hurriedly. Although he had already expected in his heart, he couldn't help moving slightly. At the top of the cliff, Captain Stone, who was very tall, rounded his arms struggling to throw the conglomerate Warhammer towards the steep glaciers covered with snow. When Warhammer took off his hand, he activated magic effects and turned into a huge stone ball with a diameter of ten feet. He rolled in the air and hit the glacier. He bounced back and rolled down the along the slope. At the same time, the glacier that was crushed by the stone ball came from inside to outside and caused a tingling roar of scalp. It suddenly collapsed and a large amount of broken ice mixed with snow and turned into a torrent, which impacted down the steep mountain slope. The big stone ball rolling in front, sticking to ice and snow along the way, becomes larger and larger, and the rolling speed is slowed by the pothole slope. The torrent of ice and snow that followed immediately behind him engulfed the stone ball, then wrapped it around the stone ball and poured it down the mountain. The momentum was like a galloping horse. The snow monsters in the dogfight finally realized that the situation was wrong. They stopped fighting, 
and looked up to the top of the mountain, their blue eyes instantly glared round, and the inexplicable fear appeared in the rapidly expanding pupil. The tide of avalanche approached the head, and it was too late to run again. The snow monsters had just turned around and hadn't waited for their footsteps. The overwhelming torrents of ice and snow rushed past them, and all the figures struggled and rolled in the torrent. They were swallowed in an instant and disappeared. The first time the avalanche broke out, Joan strode toward a nearby cliff and ran into his head. The moment the body touched the rock, the huge body seemed to become a hazy phantom, disappearing with a slight flash, and the whole person was completely integrated into the rock wall. Giao placed himself among the rock formations and felt like he was tightly wrapped in a mass of cotton. His body could barely move without hindering the gestures, but his feet seemed to be caught, making it difficult to move his feet. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1128 Avalanche Joan merged into the rock formation, there was chaos in front of him. He could not see anything, and his hearing was blocked by the rock formation. Fortunately, he could still hear the movement outside. Joan waited silently for about half an hour until the avalanche roaring outside the rock layer subsided, he struggled to jump outwards, freed from the rock. Puff. As soon as Joan broke away from the rock layer, he fell into the soft snow, cold from head to toe. He spread his arms, pulled the snow in front of him, struggling to stand up, and stood up from the thick ice and snow. The snow and crushed ice impacted from the top of the mountain cliff almost completely buried the valley where the ranch was located. The snow layer was several feet thick. Joan raised his eyes and looked blank. The cattle, sheep and snow monsters disappeared. As he looked around, there was a sudden burst of gunfire in the distance. Joan looked in the direction of the gunfire and saw a few snow monsters wrapped in an avalanche rushing thousands of feet away, trying hard to get out of trouble. However, on the hillside beside them, the officers and men of the reconnaissance company were holding shotguns, aiming at the snow monsters and firing frequently, and the splashing blood stained the snow. The mutant snow monster is a very conspicuous target. Joan didn't want to be injured by his comrades. He changed back to human form and dusted off the snow. Just then, there was a strange cry behind him, which scared him. Looking back, I saw a snow monster's lower body still buried in the snow, only showing the body above the chest, his eyes wide staring blankly at him. Wow, it's gone. Witnessing Joan's transformation into a human-shaped snow monster, he exclaimed. Dai Bai was lost by the robe's mage. Joan frowned, and the detective took a small pill with a strong sulfur smell from the storage bag, and looked at the snow monster's eyes with a murderous look. Dai Bai is missing, isn't it? Then you go to Dai Bai, shouted me Joan Vida, with a sneer chanting the startup spell. Joan raised his hand and fired a fireball, stuck it on the face of the wacky snow monster and sent him to see Dabai. Dot. Although the snow monster is strong and unafraid of the severe cold, it is still a body of flesh and blood. After being crushed by 10,000 tons of ice and snow, it will still die, and it will still suffocate when it is buried alive in the snow. Except for Joan, who had already prepared. Only a handful of snow monsters were not affected by the avalanche, but their good luck ended here, and they fell to the muzzle of the officers and soldiers of the reconnaissance company one after another. When Joan climbed the hillside, the battle was over. Captain Wallstone laughed and greeted him, giving him a warm bear hug. Little master, great. This time, thanks to you introducing monsters into the trap. We can destroy them all without any damage. Joan rubbed his shoulder that was sorely pinched by Mr. Captain, and suddenly remembered something. Mr. Captain, when I clean up the battlefield, collect as many snow monsters' bodies as possible and peel off the fur. I am useful. In addition, on the left side of the hillside, there was a winter wolf that was knocked out by me. It should not have been awake at this moment. The cunning old wolf named Augustus was a servant of the winter old Lord Trim. The snow monster was instructed by it and tried to go down to attack Elk Town. Catch this old wolf, severely tortured, 
maybe you can force more valuable information from his mouth. No problem, well do what you said. Captain Stone slapped again on Joan's shoulder, turned to greet his men, and went to clean the battlefield. Dot. That night, Joan's company camped in the ruins of the ranch at the foot of the mountain. The snow monsters finally failed to catch the escaping goat, but buried their lives instead. As for the four yaks killed in the corral by snow monsters, all the officers and men of the reconnaissance company were cheaper, and the golden roasted beef roasted on the bonfire was enough for nearly a hundred boys to open their belly and eat happy. There is still a lot of beef left to eat, roast and dry save some to eat, supplying military food for the next week will not be a problem, Joan also enjoyed a hearty beef meal, and then he was busy again, Captain Stone successfully caught the old wolf for gust at the location indicated by Joan, and asked Audrey to treat the old wolf a little to avoid serious injuries, and then and guarded, when Joan came, Captain Stone was about to interrogate the old wolf, Audrey, Holden and Hayala were also present. Audrey opened the honest realm to guard against the cunning old wolf lying. Holden held a book and pen, and seemed to be preparing to take notes. Hayala was on the sidelines, and Joan wasn't sure she was just watching the excitement, or was he going to assist Mr. Captain to torture the old wolf if it refused to confess truthfully. Joan greeted everyone and walked to old wolf August with a large syringe in his hand. The old wolf was tied like a mummy, and his swollen chin made his face look distorted, squinting a pair of triangular eyes, thinking about how to get through. Inadvertently saw a young man coming over, his white and handsome face with no expression, holding a thick needle tube in his hand, the needle shining in the cold light under the campfire. It could not help but shudder, and it was difficult to conceal panic in his eyes. Your kid. What is this for? The old wolf asked tremblingly, with an ominous hunch in his heart. Joan was too lazy to take care of it, stretched out his left hand, felt it in his neck, found a blood vessel, and then pierced it with a needle. The old wolf's wailing wailing is more painful than pain, and it is because of the intense fear aroused by the cruel and strange behavior of this young man. Joanne still ignored it, pumped a large tube of blood, pulled out the needle, turned around and left. From beginning to end, he said nothing. Silence made his weird behavior even more terrifying, making the old wolf panic stricken, and the more he thought, the more he felt. Joan, the fur you want has been stripped and washed. Wait a minute for me to send it to you. Captain Stone said, thank you. Joan nodded and left. Holden glanced at Joan's distant back, turned his head to look at the face of the old wolf August's amazement, and smiled at it unwillingly. The person who drew your blood just now is our entourage mage. Guess what he wants to do to draw your blood? The old wolf hesitated for a while, and wanted to pretend to be deaf and dumb, but the young poet's unsmiling expression made him uneasy, and finally could not help but utter a trembling growl. No matter what torture or torture, or other tricks, it's useless to me. Really? Holden saw through the essence of this old wolf-like rap, sneered and said, then you may try to lie a few times when you are questioned, and then you will experience more enthusiasm and thoughtfulness than blood-drawing hospitality. Old Wolf August couldn't help but tremble. After a short period of ideological struggle, he gave up his plans to die rather unyieldingly and decided to confess truthfully and suffer less. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest. Chapter 1129 Cold Cloak Joan returned to his tent and poured the fresh winter wolf blood into several reagent bottles. He applied mythical blood interpretation to one of the blood samples and in a short time it resolved three sets of magic marks, corresponding to the three supernatural abilities inherent to the wolf-wolf. The first set of magic marks, Joan has also seen in the blood samples of the snow monster, symbolizes the two opposing characteristics of cold subspecies. Like a snow monster, the winter wolf is also immune to all cold damage caused by nature or magic. It also has an insurmountable weakness, that is, the fear of fire, 
and additional damage when attacked by the fire department. Joan's second set of magic marks, passed from the blood sample of Old Wolf August, corresponds to the natural wolf of the winter wolf. The wolf's sharp teeth with condensation and frost, when biting the prey, in addition to the bite caused by the tooth, will also add an extra level of frost damage, equivalent to the magic weapon that enchants the frozen special effect. The last supernatural ability of the winter wolf is similar to the frozen cold dragon breath of the white dragon, except that its lethality and attack range are slightly inferior. The supernatural cold current sprayed from the mouth of the winter wolf can inflict four levels of freezing cold damage to the creatures within 15 feet in front of it. If the creatures suffering from spitting lack cold protection measures, they will be instantly frozen and stiff and the blood is almost frozen. Joan carefully observed the three sets of magic marks resolved from the blood samples of the winter wolf, and then transcribed them all into his spellbook. Footsteps were heard outside the tent while I was writing down. Mr. Master, the skins you want are all ready, can they be piled outside the tent? Okay, it'll be here soon. Joan hurried out of the tent and saw more than twenty soldiers carrying snow monster fur all folded neatly, laid on the snow beside the tent. Joan thanked the soldiers and walked to the fur piles piled up like a hill, and immediately smelled the smell of fresh skin. A total of fifty of these skins were visually inspected. They were all peeled off from the body of the snow monster. Although they were simply cleaned, they were still bloody. Joan collected so many furs and wanted to use them to process cold-proof military uniforms and distribute them to the comrades in the reconnaissance company. Snow monsters are inherently cold-resistant, and even after they die, there will still be a part of the resistance frozen in the fur. Joan has tested the snow monster's fur and the hide has an average coal resistance of up to seven energy levels. As long as a snow monster fur is wrapped around the body, even if the front face suffers from the winter wolf's breath, or the snow monster's shiver gaze, it will usually not be hurt at all. Because the magic contained in these two cold supernatural attacks does not exceed the cold resistance of the snow monster fur. Raw hides can also be used to sew clothes directly. Many barbarians do not pay much attention to it, and directly wear fur peeled off from animals. However, raw leather has many shortcomings as clothing, such as being prone to spoilage and deterioration, intolerant to storage and inconvenient to clean. The highly civilized nations, including humans, of course, tend to tanning raw hides and process them into leather more suitable for clothing. Tanning is a complex series of alchemy reactions. Joan is not new to this process, but he does not have time to tanning so many hides at the moment, and the environment is not allowed. Fortunately, with the power of magic, the complex tanning process will become very simple. Joan found four large wooden barrels in the camp, three of which were filled with appropriate amounts of soda soda ash, alum and table salt, and the last large barrel was filled with water. Tanning agents commonly used in the leather industry are made from these materials. Joan doesn't need to mix the raw materials together, directly facing the raw material of the tanning agent plus a bunch of raw hides and using the three red level spell secondary axe skill, he can instantly complete the long and complicated tanning and cutting process. With Joan's current spell casting ability, cast a secondary ghost axe, can process up to eight cubic feet of raw materials at the same time, get no less than ten sets of ready-made clothes. Joan used the remaining mythical power and Sid mana today, plus the energy of God's tears. He performed secondary ghost axe artifact ten times in succession, and finally produced 96 sets of fur cloaks. Joanne picked up a cloak for identification, and the result showed that the cloak can reduce the cold damage of up to five energy levels, compared with before processing. The cold resistance is lower by two energy levels, probably because the tanning process destroys the inner structure of the fur resulting in a deterioration of the cold resistance. Being able to retain the cold resistance of five energy levels, Joanne is already satisfied, and can still perfectly resist the chilling gaze of the snow monster, 
as well as the frozen bite and frozen breath of the winter wolf. Joan left a cold resistant cloak himself, and the rest of the cloaks were distributed to company comrades, just one per person. He first tried on the cloak by himself, pulled up the hood, and bent down to take a picture of the bucket. The water reflected from the water looked like a small snow monster. In addition to the cold protection function, this cloak also has an excellent snow camouflage feature, which makes the company's guerrilla activities in the Fangshan Mountain more concealed. Kiaoan looked at nearly a hundred piles of cold resistant cloaks neatly piled up, and a sense of accomplishment rose and the physical and mental fatigue caused by high-intensity casting was not so unbearable. After taking a short break, Joan made a trick to send Captain Stone's deputy and also the company's quartermaster Derek Young Ensign, and asked him to bring a few more servicemen. Not long afterwards, Yang Xiaomai hurriedly came with six young military officers and listened to the orders of the mage. Joan pointed to the neat cloak on the snow and said to Yang Xiaomai, the leather you sent just now was processed by me into a cloak. The cloak made of snow monster fur has a very good cold resistance effect. You send it to everyone, no more, no more, just one for each person. Okay, Mr. Master. Yang Xiao I picked up a cape and looked at it, and found that it was soft in texture and had no slight odor. Obviously, it had been properly tanned and dried. The style of the cloak is also very handsome, not inferior to the custom-made clothing in the city's high-end clothing store. What is even stranger is that there is no trace of tailoring at all, and even a stitch is not found, as if the leather was born into this cloak. Appearance. Yang Xiaoi scratched his head and couldn't help but feel a little dazed. Mr. Master, I brought the leather to you an hour ago. In such a short time, you have tanned so many raw hides and processed nearly a hundred cloaks. This is really incredible. It's no big deal, simple casting skills. Joan smiled slightly. After this year's experience, he is much more mature in receiving people than before, but he is still embarrassed to be praised in person. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1130 Conspiracy Mr. Master, I will distribute your gift to the brothers and express my sincere thanks to you on behalf of the brothers. Yang Xiao I bowed deeply to Giaoan. Joan waved his hand and said that he didn't have to be polite. By the way, Mr. Master, when I came here just now, Miss Green asked me to greet you for a trip to Liambu, saying that the result of the interrogation had come out. Okay, it'll go by now. Joan had long seen that the old wolf August was a savage guy, but he didn't expect it to confess without even supporting an hour. It was really a cartilage. The temporary residence of the company is a large warehouse for storing fodder on the pasture. As soon as Joan arrived at the door. He heard a fierce quarrel in the warehouse and couldn't help being surprised. The concealed door opened, and Audrey stood at the door with a bitter smile on her lips, hearing your footsteps, come in now. Who is arguing? Joan asks in a low voice, Holton, Hayla and Captain, everyone's opinions are very different. What the happened? Joan asked curiously. The inside story is a bit complicated. Let me start with the result of the interrogation of Winter Wolf August. Audrey took his arms and walked into the warehouse. Captain Stone held a simple pipe made from a hollowed corn cob, and was spraying clouds and fogging, his brows closed, and he seemed to be worried. When he saw Joan coming in, he nodded at him. Joan nodded his head back followed Audrey to a corner by the window and sat on the haystack. The night breeze blowing in the window slightly dispelled the choking smell of tobacco in the warehouse. Joan wanted to remind Mr. Captain that smoking in a haystack warehouse was a disrespectful and very dangerous act, but he couldn't bear to say anything when he saw the other persons frowning. What did the old wolf explain? Joan asked Audrey. All the confessions revolved around the theme of assault on Elk Town. We thought this was just a routine looting. However, after listening to the confession of the old wolf, I realized that it was not that simple. It was probably a careful conspiracy. Conspiracy? Kiaan asked in surprise. Is it so serious? Audrey nodded right. 
Do you know how many gangsters participated in this attack on Elktown? In addition to the fearful wolf led by Augustus, the snow monster under the white hand, and other participants, if the old wolf did not lie, in addition to the two gangsters you just mentioned, there are four other gangs that have also been appointed by Dong Bao. They are expected to arrive in Elktown no later than tomorrow. The total number of snow monsters participating in the war is more than 200. The fearful wolf plus the winter wolf are not less than this number, Audrey said in a deep voice. Joan couldn't help raising his eyebrows and was speechless for a long time. Elk Town is a small town dominated by as indigenous people. It is located about 150 miles northwest of Line Yuenbao and is located on the banks of the Honey Wine. The local resident population is less than 1,000 people, mostly fishing and hunting and animal husbandry. Although Joan hasn't been to Elk Town, from a common sense, what can be special about a town with less than a thousand people? There are so many villages and towns in such fangs in the fangs. Why don't Dong Bao go all out to conquer so many monsters? 200 snow monsters plus 200 terror wolves, including elites such as mutant snow monsters and winter wolves, such a large force, can even pose a certain threat to Lin Yun Bao, but now just to siege one for small towns with a population of less than a thousand people, this is too trivial, did Augustus tell him that Winterberg had appointed them to siege Elk Town, what was the plot? Joan asked Audrey. We also suspect that the purpose of Winter Castle is not simple. If it is just to grab cattle and sheep and food, Elk Town is not a good choice to obtain a huge profit, but the old wolf also does not know what the Winter Lord Lord Trim wants, it the order I received was to summon a snow monster to attack Elk Town. As for what to do after I captured the town, I had to wait for the follow-up instructions. Audrey replied. Follow-up instructions? Joan immediately grasped the key message, that is to say, the snow monsters and evil wolves involved in the siege of Elk Town are just a group of mercenaries. Winter Castle will also send high-level officials to visit Elk Town and command this group from different sources. Gangsters in the area? You guessed it. The old wolf did this. Audrey nodded her face more dignified. If their group of gangsters attack on Elk Town is going well and they can win the town as soon as possible, Winter Castle will send a special envoy to take over and take over Elk Town as soon as possible. Otherwise, if the attack encounters obstacles and falls into a stalemate, Winter Castle it will be possible to send the heirs to join the war. The shocking news revealed by Audrey stirred up waves in Joan's heart. Snow monsters and pack wolves are just peripheral forces of Winter Castle. As for Winter Castle's descendants, they usually refer to Frosty Giant and White Dragon. From the Tusk Mountains to the Great Glacier in Jodenheim, this vast alpine tundra is not suitable for human survival. It has been the hometown of frost giants since ancient times. Among all the frost giant lords, Trim of Winterhold is relatively low and rarely has direct conflicts with the human world. This is not to say that the power of Winter Castle is weak. The fact is just the opposite. Regardless of the site, military strength or personal strength under the rule, among all frost giant lords, Trim of Winter Castle can be ranked at the forefront. Such a strong man has been pursuing Loke principles for many years, mainly because Trim is a heretic in the Frost Giant Society and worships the traditional gods of the Abyss Lord Koschichi instead of the Frost Giant because of religious beliefs are rejected in the mainstream Giant Society, lest they cause anger and have to pick up their tails to live. Loke lords like Trim usually don't make much effort but this siege plan against Elk Town clearly violates his usual style. There must be a reason for the anomaly, and Joan had to suspect that there was something special about Elk Town that caused Trim's government. Old Augustus is just a lower level deacon in Winterberg. What exactly does Trim want in Elk Town? Augustus has no way of knowing. He is only acting on orders. We can't get more valuable information from his mouth. Audrey sighed. Joan was not surprised. Judging from the unusual series of actions of Winter Castle, Trim obviously does not want to attract outside attention, nor will he reveal the truth about the lower cannon fodder of the mission. If he and Audrey discovered the trace of the wolf by coincidence, 
I am afraid until the day when Elk Town fell, I didn't know what happened. What is Mr. Captain's plan? Joan asked. After the interrogation, we all smell the conspiracy. Although we don't know what the plot of Winterhold is yet, there is a big principle that will never be wrong. Audrey emphasized word by word, enemy enemy, we can be our friends. We can't let them succeed if they want to do anything that the evil forces want to do. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1131 Dilemma Unfortunately, with the power of our company alone, we are not completely sure of the rescue of Elk Town, which is under siege by a large group of monsters, so as soon as the trial of Old Wolf August was over, we sent a letter to Sir Level asking for support. Elk Town, Audrey whispered. Joanne nodded and asked, how did Sir Level reply? Audrey shrugged her hands. Her beautiful face showed a bitter taste. Captain Stone said in advance that it was useless to send a letter to Sir Level, and so would never agree to send troops to rescue Elk Town, which really made him guess. Jazz wrote back to warn us not to make our own claims. He also said that he was worried that the enemy's siege of Elk Town was just a guise. In fact, he wanted to help the siege. If we send troops to support, we will fall into a trap. Joan frowned, and vaguely felt that Sir Level's views were far-fetched. After receiving the reply, we were very disappointed. Hayala was particularly dissatisfied. He pointed out that Sir Level's remarks were groundless and worried about being aided by the siege, but it was just an excuse, otherwise why when other villages were surrounded by monsters, he did not worry about this, with the exception of the Assa settlement. Holden's view is similar to that of Hayala. He also believes that Sir Level's refusal to rescue Elk Town was entirely based on discrimination against the Assa people. After Audrey relayed the views of Hayala and Holden, she then expressed her views. I don't want to question Sir Level's decision, but judging from his background and past experience, it is polite to say that he discriminates the Asa people. In fact, he hates the Asa people at all even more than the right those monsters that eat people. Joan remained silent for a long time before finally speaking. If when I was young, I witnessed my mother being shot with poison arrows by the Asa people, I am afraid I will also hate all the people of this race. I hope to remove all of them from this land not just hostility to kill the mother. Audrey's face changed slightly, holding Joan's hand, trying to say something but it was difficult to tell, and finally just sighed. Actually, Sir Level's public hatred of the Azap people is not only clear to us, Trim at Wintercastle already knows it. Perhaps it is precisely because of this factor that he dared to send a large number of soldiers to see Jelk Town without worrying about Advent. Yuan Bao sent troops to rescue. Joan nodded and asked her, What instructions do we have for our company in Jazz's reply? Sir Level did not allow us to intervene in the conflict between Elk Town and Wintercastle without authorization but he authorized Captain Stone to lead the team to investigate outside Elk Town and try to figure out the reason for the large group of monsters besieging this town. Joan listened to her, and a strange glory appeared in her eyes. You found number. This instruction is contradictory. If the Jazz doesn't want to intervene in this matter at all, he shouldn't do anything more and send our company to investigate in Elk Town. The Jazz did not allow us to take the initiative to intervene in the conflict between the Az and Dongbao forces. This sounds reasonable, but if you think about it, you will find that there are loopholes if the monsters of Dongbao attacked us actively. Can we not fight against it? Can only stretch his neck and wait to die? If we revolted and killed the people in Winter Castle, people must chase us for revenge and we will also be passively involved in the dispute. Is this not against the military order? Audrey nodded with a smile, the possibility you thought of. We also thought about it just now, so Hayala and Holden forced Captain Stone to ask him to agree to send another message to Sir Level. Please ask what should we do if the kind of situation you mentioned just happened? Our Mr. Captain, knowing that this would irritate Sir Level, of course did not agree to send a letter. As a result, he quarreled with Hayala and Holden. You heard it just now. I guess Mr. Captain planned this, if he does not send this letter, 
he will have discretionary discretion and can adapt to the situation on the battlefield. However, when this letter was issued, the Jazz made a clear reply and he there is no room for discretion, things will become more troublesome, do you understand what I mean? Audrey blinked and made a hint. Kiaan nodded in conscience. Actually, I also tend to the captain's approach, but the two guys, Hayala and Holden, are too ignorant, too real, and only accept the death. They think the captain is timid and afraid to intervene in the dispute in Elk Town. If you want to send a letter, Captain Stone is very passive. Audrey smiled with her hand. This kind of thing can only be understood by everyone, and it is not decent to say it, so I am also right. Joan turned his head to look at the center of the warehouse and found that Captain Stone, Hayala and Holden had stopped arguing, sitting silently, all with a serious and serious look just waiting in court for the verdict. The suffocating atmosphere was broken by a sudden wave of magic, and a ball of red light emerged from above the wooden table where three people sat. Captain Stone, Hayala and Holden all jumped conditionedly, and all three hands caught the red light ball. You two imp, understand the rules, sit down for me. Captain Stone glared. Hayala and Holden looked at each other, withdrew their hands in embarrassment and sat back. It's almost the same. Captain Stone glanced proudly at each of them, reaching for the red light ball loaded with communication and reading the information silently. Mr. Captain, what did the jazz say? Audrey walked past Joan's hand and asked impatiently. Captain Stone looked weird, took off his military cap and scratched his head until he hung up on the appetite of the young people before he suddenly laughed. Laugh laugh, hurry up, Hayala couldn't help jumping from the seat, stomping his feet anxiously, well, unsurprisingly, Lord Lord scolded me in reply, saying that my thoughts were rigid, a muscle ball in my head, Captain Stone replied vaguely with a pipe in his mouth, then you can laugh, Holden was puzzled, you don't know Lord Ye, in fact, he scolded me, which is equivalent to releasing a clear signal. Captain Stone's unshaven face showed a treacherous smile that contradicted his rough image. My grandfather said that my thoughts were rigid, and I was encouraging me to be flexible. Especially on the unpredictable frontline battlefield, the commander should not ask the superior leadership for everything. In order to ensure the safety of the company, it may be necessary to adapt to the situation when necessary. Even if the final decision does not seem to meet the instructions of the superior, it is also a situation excusable. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1132 Crisis in Elk Town Oh I get it. Holden's eyes lit up and he couldn't help jumping with excitement. Sir Level's reply is tantamount to implying that our company, when in desperation, such as fighting for the self-preservation to resist the attack of the Winter Castle monster, is not a violation of the military order. No, no, no. Lord Ch didn't say that, don't you think about it. Captain Stone pumped his pipe hard and slowly spit out a cloud of smoke. Of course, if you have to understand it this way, Sir John is not wrong, is it? Anyway, you will be at your own risk. Such a rogue. Holden couldn't help laughing. What is your kid talking about? Mr. Captain glared at the young poet angrily, his face full of anger. In our company, only Audrey, Joan and I are worthy of being decent and honest. As for others, including your boy and girl, they are all rascals. Alas, I am really worried about myself it's broken to learn from your little rogues. Yuck, yuck, it's such a big chunk, it's not ashamed at all. Hayala's mouth is not forgiving, but the pretty face has a relief smile. Since everyone has no objections, I suggest marching overnight and trying to rush to Elk Town before dawn. Audrey was worried that she might be too long to rescue Elk Town. Captain Stone waved his hand and said calmly, don't worry. The monsters are also going to sleep at night. It's impossible to get on the road day and night, otherwise we will get tired and lie down halfway before we get to Elk Town. Let's camp tomorrow. Riding a horse, 
You can definitely reach Elk Town earlier than the monsters. Although Audrey was still a little worried, she also knew that Captain Stone had dealt with all kinds of monsters on the snowy mountain all the year round, knew their habits well, and made well-founded judgments, and the other party was the company's commander, herself his decision must be respected, and no longer insisted. Mr. Captain, in order to avoid an accident, shall we send a person to Elk Town to ventilate the news first? Joan made a more secure suggestion. I became the Eagleman of Jordan Hyman flew from here to Elk Town. It will be there in two hours. Captain Stone thought about it and said to Joan, It's a good idea to ventilate in advance, but it's not necessary for you to fly a long distance and send a short text message to Elder Hunter in the town. Dot. Mr. Captain, are you familiar with Elder Hunt? When Joan was in Shizertown, he heard Uncle Logan mention the name of Elder Hunter. This person is from the sideline of the Walsinger family, and he is considered to be Uncle Logan's cousin. When the company was stationed near Elk Town, I had two encounters with Elder Hunt. Although there was no deep friendship, after all, it was considered an acquaintance. When you send a letter, please report my name to remind him to guard against it. The monster attacked and told him by the way that we will go to Elk Township tomorrow morning, and we will discuss it in detail after we meet. Joan nodded and immediately began to cast a spell, conveying Captain Stone's warning to Elder Hunt in Elkdone. Under normal circumstances, SMS is only suitable for communication between acquaintances. If you don't know each other and only know the name and address of the other party, you can also try to send a letter, but it may not be successfully communicated to the recipient. To confirm whether the other party received the letter, the only way is to wait patiently. SMS comes with a reply function. If Elder Hunter receives his reminder, it will logically reply in time. After Joan cast the spell, he waited for about five minutes. The magic net in front of him was disturbed, and a ball of red light appeared. Joan took a deep breath and held the light ball to read the information, his tense face seized. Mr. Captain, Elder Hunter has received our warning that he will strengthen the defense. In addition, Elder Hunter is still thanking us for the reminder in his reply and looking forward to meeting you tomorrow to discuss in detail. Captain Stone nodded stood up, and smiled at the young interns, okay, we have done our best, go back to everything else, and get up early tomorrow, take a good rest now, Joan turned around and took two steps, suddenly remembering something, he turned back and took four sets of white fur cloaks from the storage bag and put them on the table, this is my cloak made of snow monster fur, it has a very good cold resistance effect, put on this cloak, so you don't have to be afraid of the snow monster's trembling gaze and the winter wolf's frozen cold breath. 96 sets of cloaks, the rest have been distributed to young Ensign Yang, and the remaining four sets are reserved exclusively for you. Oh, I didn't expect that our mage is still a little tailor. Captain Stone happily picked up a cloak, put it on, put his head on his chest, and posed. Joan, Am I handsome in this cloak? Very fit. Joan commented truthfully. Really handsome, handsome like a snow monster. Holden smiled narrowly. Captain Stone stared angrily at the poet, turned and patted Joan on the shoulder, thanking him for providing the company's cold resistance equipment for free, and said that he would report to the headquarters and give him credit. It's just a matter of hand, no need to remember anything. Joan Gang just politely said, and suddenly his thoughts turned, and he stopped talking, looking at Captain Stone with embarrassment. Mr. Captain, forgive me for taking the liberty. Do you carry a magic weapon that can resist spiritual invasions? Ha! Huh. Your kid has sharp eyes, even my heirloom can see it. Captain Stone grinned, unbuttoned his collar, took off a silver necklace from his neck, and handed it to Joan. This is me the amulet my mother gave me is indeed resistant to spiritual magic. Joan took a look at it and immediately noticed a yellow prismatic jade tag hanging at the end of the silver necklace, emitting a slight magical fluctuation. In the field of enchanting craftsmanship, if you choose a more expensive gemstone as the embryo material when making a magical wonder, it is often not greedy for good looking or showing off financial resources. Beautiful gemstones certainly have a decorative effect, 
but for enchanting craftsmanship, its more important value is to enhance the effectiveness of specific spells. For example, the string of ornaments displayed to Captain Stone by Joan is actually a magical talisman. The talisman uses topaz as the embryo material. According to experience, most of the protection spells are attached cause topaz. This gem has the special effect of strengthening the protection system spells. For the time being, Joan couldn't see what spell was attached to the topaz talisman, so he requested Captain Stone hoping to borrow this magic talisman to study for one night. Of course no problem, you can take it and study it, remember to give it back to me tomorrow. Mr. Captain is very generous. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest. Chapter 1133 Secondary Mind Barrier Joan said goodbye to Captain Stone and four friends and hurried back to his barracks. He made a trick, lit the candlestick, carefully placed the topaz talisman on the simple desk, and then took out the pen filled with deep sea squid ink to depict the number four unansues on the surface of the talisman. As he expected, the spell attached to the topaz talisman was successfully resolved, and in the midair above the talisman, a set of spell configurations was generated. Joan observed a little and discovered that this is a three rod level protection school spell called Second Mind Barrier. Next, he spent half an hour delving into the configuration of the spell and analyzing the function of the spell. Second Mind Barrier, as Joan had previously guessed, is a spell specifically designed to resist mental attacks and spiritual magic. Specifically, the subject is fully immune to all spells that affect the mind below the third ring, or supernatural mind effects no higher than 10 energy levels, and the duration of the spell is proportional to the cast level. The so called mind effect refers to the spells or supernatural abilities that need to break through the target's will defense line to be effective. Most of the spells of the Confuse Control School belong to the effects that affect the mind, such as hypnosis, charming humans dominant insects, crazy laughter, human fixation and so on. Other schools also have these kinds of spells, such as the higher endoscopy and exploration of the prophecy school, the fear of the necromantic school, and the colorful jet of the school of illusion, all of which need to break the subject first. The will defense line can only play the established effect of the spell, on the contrary, if the opponent's will defense line cannot be broken, the spell will be invalid. Second mind barrier is specifically used to restrain this kind of mind affecting spells. It should be noted that it is not that the secondary mind barrier will unconditionally block all mind effects once blessed on the body. In fact, this spell will only block those harmful psychic effects. For beneficial psychic effects, such as stable mind and heroic spirit, they will be opened and effective as usual. Joan also noticed that this spell has imperfections in the process of studying the configuration of the secondary mind barrier. After all, second mind barrier is only a three rod level spell, and the magic energy level that can be called is only 10 degrees at most, so this spell can only restrain mind spells below third level or the supernatural ability of the mind system with an energy level not higher than 10 degrees. Dot. What happens if it goes beyond this category? In the face of mind spells or supernatural abilities higher than the third ring, the secondary mind barrier is unable to provide 100% immune protection, but within the time limit for the spell to continue to take effect. It can always reduce part of the soul damage for the subject and significantly enhance the victim's resistance to harmful mind effects. The specific gain effect is proportional to the caster level. If Joan learns this spell, he will be able to obtain the protection of the second mind barrier within a time limit of 80 minutes. During this period, whenever he suffers a mental attack, he can reduce the spiritual damage of eight energy levels, as a three rod level protection system spell, even if you do your best. Joanne feels that this spell has been optimized to the extreme and cannot be asked to do more. So, are there any more similar spells than the second mind barrier? The answer is yes. There is secondary, of course there is advanced. The perfect version of mind barrier is a protective spell of up to eight rings which is immune to almost all soul attacks under the legend, 
and lasts up to 24 hours. This is indeed perfect, but the level is too high, so high that even arcane geniuses like Joan are intimidated, and I don't know what year and month to be qualified to learn this super magic. At least for Joan's current level, the second mind barrier is far more practical than the unattainable perfect version of the mind barrier. Dot. Early morning on July 12th, a round of redder sun jumped to the top of Fangfen Mountain, and shed 10,000 golden lights. On the great plains of Ligweed, where water and grass are rich, a rush of horseshoes disturbed the birds that foraged among the grass, fluttering their wings and hovering in the air for a long time. Five war horses galloped from the western horizon. The knights on the back of the horse were all dressed in blue uniforms. The knights were tall and burly and they wore coats of arms representing the rank of captain. The four knights that followed were two pairs of young men and women, and their immature faces could not hide their worries. It was not until the city walls of Elktown appeared in their vision that these young men's eyes showed a relief. Joan, Hayla, Audrey, and Holden set off with Captain Stone from the company camp at dawn and they ran around for three hours at the horsepower along the way. The journey was nearly a hundred miles, and they were finally robbed before the monster launched the siege arrived to the elk town on the banks of the Honey Wine. Joan had only heard of the name Elk Town before, and assumed that this town with a population of less than a thousand people was like his hometown of Dillon Town. There were no special defensive measures. Enclosing a circle of wooden fences was regarded as a city wall. It is difficult to resist the siege of a large group of monsters. But when he saw Elk Town in person, he realized he was completely wrong. Elk Town is indeed not a major town in Xungwen, nor is it stationed as a heavy soldier like Lina Yuenbao but from the solid stone wall surrounding the town, it is not difficult to understand why Dongbao should gather so many monsters to attack this little town. In addition to the 34i city wall, residents of Elk Town led a canal from the Mijiu River, bypassing the city wall and forming a moat. The city wall fortifications are equipped with heavy blisters, towering whistle towers are erected around the corners and the suspension bristile gates are also gathered together, making them look alert. Holden galloped along the river bank, looking at the approaching gates, and couldn't help but express emotion. Which town is this? It looks like a military fortress. In this way, Elk Town is not so easily broken, but we are too nervous. Hayala smiled easily. You have noticed that the city gate suspension bridge has been put away. There are Azar warriors with long bows on the city patrol. Obviously, the entire town is on high alert. Audrey made a guess based on what she observed. It can be seen from this that the letter that Joan sent to Elder Hunt yesterday received the attention of the other party and specifically strengthened the vigilance. When chatting, the five horses had reached the ditch and were forced to stop. Captain Stone waved his arm towards the city gate and shouted, Asa brothers, please open the door. I have made an appointment with your elder hunter and meet in the town today. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest. Chapter 1134 Elder Hunt The Azar warriors above the city heard the shouts and turned their heads to look over. They saw Captain Stone wearing an imperial uniform and his face became extremely nervous. It wasn't until Captain Stone reported his name that someone on the city's head answered and asked him to wait for a while so he went to inform the elders. Joan they waited less than ten minutes outside the city, and a shadow flew from the city's head, immediately arousing everyone's alert and unconsciously holding the weapon. Captain Stone waved his hand and signaled the young people around him to relax. Don't worry, it was a giant crow named Steel Feather, an animal partner of Elder Hunt. Hearing this, Joan made a natural guess. The elder hunter was either a druid or a ranger. The jay hovered in the air for two weeks. It seemed to be observing whether Joan was being followed by others behind them, confirming that there were no suspicious signs nearby, and yelled twice at the city head. The guard at the head of the city grasped the experience and hurriedly dropped the suspension bridge. Let's go. Captain Stone shook the reins and urged the horse to rush to the gate. Joan and others urged the horse to follow. After the four entered the city, 
the suspension bridge was put away behind them, an old as old with thin hair and grey hair, standing alone at the gate of the city, was examining the five visitors with a thoughtful look, the jay lowered its wings, and stood next to the old man, his eyes widened, and he looked at Joan curiously. At the same time, Joan was observing the old man opposite. Judging from the intimacy of the jay to him, as well as the sloping hunting bow behind him and the machete on his waist, Joan determined that this person was Elder Hunter, the leader of the town's as a residence, and it's not difficult to see he is an advanced ranger. Elder Hunt, I haven't seen you for a long time. Captain Stone turned and dismounted, and according to the as etiquette, crossed his arms across his chest and bowed deeply to the old ranger. Elder Hunter returned the gift in the same way and said with a complex expression, Mr. Stone, I would like to thank you and your friends on behalf of the whole town, although I still can't believe it, execution of a less officer would stand on the side of our Rizap people on the battlefield. After receiving your warning yesterday, I immediately sent Gang Yu to the western mountain area for investigation. Sure enough. I found abnormal signs of snow monsters and wolves. It can be seen that your warning is completely true. In fact, I came here to meet you in my personal capacity, not from the authorization of the Lord. None of the four young people who accompanied me this time were true soldiers. Captain Stone made a hint with a wry smile. Elder Hunter showed an unexpected expression and nodded, not continuing this topic inviting visitors to rest in the room. Captain Stone briefed Elder Hunt about their identities, then went back to the topic, and talked about the news that Winter Castle instructed a large group of snow monsters to join forces with Dire Wolf to siege Elk Town. Elder Hunter, you don't need to say that you know that Winter Castle will not attack Elk Town for no reason. Is it because you offended Trim? Or there is some kind of treasure in your town that the Lord Winter Castle is going to get? Think this. In the face of Captain Stone's inquiring inquiry, Elder Hunt hesitated, hesitated, and finally shook his head. I'm sorry, Mr. Stone. I don't know why Winter Castle would treat this town. It's hostile, and I don't know what Trim really wants from us. Really? Captain Stone shrugged regretfully. It seems that this mystery can only be awaited by the men of Winterhold in person. I wish you good luck. Elder Hunter saw him stand up thinking that he was leaving Elk Town, there was no intention of retention, but he told the truth. Now Elk Town has become the most dangerous place on the Great Plains. This afternoon, this town will be surrounded by large groups of monsters. You better leave here as soon as possible so as not to be implicated. Captain Stone laughed and replied nonchalantly, What's the hurry? It's still too early. I'm going to take these young friends who are visiting Elk Town for the first time, go shopping on the street, and find a restaurant to have breakfast and play. It's not too late to go enough. Elder Hunter was dumbfounded and couldn't help asking Captain Stone, aren't you kidding me? It's not a good time to go sightseeing now. However, after today, it is still unknown whether Elk Town will exist. If you don't go shopping more now, I'm afraid it will be too late. Captain Stone patted the old ranger's shoulder with a smile. Don't go to your heart. Elder Hunter's mouth twitched violently and shook his head helplessly, so he had to follow him. Captain Stone took Elder Brothers Joan, Hayala and Zion away from the house of Elder Hunt, and made a round in the deserted town streets sometimes stopped and sniffed around like a wary hound. Huh? This smells good. I ran all morning and hadn't had time to eat breakfast yet. My stomach was almost hungry. The little guys followed me to find a delicious filling stomach. Captain Stone rushed forward to lead the way, turned an alley, and really saw a tavern, pushed the door and broke in. Boss. Here are seven bowls of pepper mutton soup and ten baked oatmeal. Captain Stone sat down at the dining table, took out a pipe, lit a pipe of cigarettes, and while waiting for the meal to go to the table, spit cloud and mist with contentment. The five people waited a few minutes, and the broth and noodles were served. Joan observed the amount of food, and found that the bowl of broth was as big as a wash basin, and the bread was also full and he could not eat it with his meal. Mr. Captain, 
Have you ordered so many meals to finish? Audrey was also puzzled. Why can't you finish? You four little guys, is it enough for each bowl of soup and one pie? The rest will be wiped out by me. Captain Stone said calmly. Joan and his friends looked at each other, and they all stick out their tongues. Mr. Captain is not as big as Bei Ai Chang and the amount of food for one person is worth the four of them. After running around all morning, everyone was really hungry. After serving the meal, they buried their heads and ate up, and could not care about chatting. As soon as we finished eating, a horn sound suddenly came out of the window, vaguely revealing the meaning of killing. Joan put down the soup bowl and turned to look out the window, sounds like a siren, mostly snow monsters and wolves arrived. Let's go out and see. Holden was so excited that he couldn't eat anymore. Captain Stone stuffed the last piece of pasta into his mouth and vaguely said to Hayla, little girl goes to settle the bill. Ah? Hayla's eyes widened, and the shocked ponytails cocked up. Why make me check out? Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1135 Monster Siege 1 Because I forgot to bring my wallet when I went out, and you look like a bold and generous girl, so I don't care about this little money, do I look away? Captain Stone looked at Hayla up and down in disbelief. No, no. Mr. Captain? you have never looked away. No one knows wealth fans better than me. Ah, uh, I mean Hyla, she is the most generous person I have ever seen. Holden smiled and helped. Every time we go out for dinner, our generous lady always pays for everyone. If you pay the bill yourself, she will be very angry and think you don't treat her as a friend. Really? Of course. I hold Holden honestly and honestly. I have always said one thing and I am not exaggerating. Damn. Damn. You two bad guys, shut me up. Hayala was trembling with ponytails, knowing that Captain Stone and Holden were deliberately running out of themselves, but he was not embarrassed to admit that he was actually a little fan and had to go out and pay. Oh yeah. Holden and Captain Stone snickered at each other, high-fiving to celebrate. Audrey shook her head, crying and laughing. What time is this? And you still have trouble thinking. Hey Isla returned from the checkout with a beaming face, proclaiming to everyone, the restaurant owner learned that we are here to help Elk Town to resist the invasion of monsters and generously save this meal. You two bad guys haven't succeeded in their scheming. This is called kindness and kindness. Hey Isla concluded proudly. At this time, the sound of the horn outside the window became more and more intense. The restaurant owner and the buddies were militiamen. He heard the signal of the general mobilization and was busy going to the barracks to report. Joan, who was inconvenienced to delay, left the restaurant and hurried to the city gate, followed the heavily armed as a militia to the city head, and looked out into the distance. On the grassy field, there are many black and white spots floating, Black is a group of scary wolves, white is a winter wolf, a snow monster and six mutant snow monsters that are particularly conspicuous in the monster group. In a short time, hundreds of monsters gathered opposite the canal that surrounds the outer wall of the city wall, screaming and roaring towards the side of the city gate, making all kinds of intimidating gestures. Hemp. Elder Hunt is commanding defense on the city head, except for women old people and children. All adult men in Elk Town are armed with crossbows and swords and actively join the ranks of defending against the invasion of monsters. Joan made a visual inspection. The total number of Azam militia involved in the defense was not less than 500. Together with the protection of the high wall and the wide moat, the snow monsters and evil wolves on the opposite side could not fly, and the forced attack on the city was nothing more than death. Dot. However, what happened next completely deviated from his expectations. Not only did the monsters launch an offensive, but in a brutal and effective way. The canals and walls were no longer insurmountable. The first to take action is the six tallest and strongest mutant snow monsters in the monster group. They seemed to have received some kind of secret instruction, and at the same time, they detached from the herd and strode towards the nearest woods. With a click, 
the towering tree was severely broken. Joan himself can become a mutant snow monster. It is clear how terrible the power of this giant monster is. However, witnessing the mutant snow monster breaking the tree with his own hands, he couldn't help but burst into a chill from his heart. The militiamen in the city who do not understand the details of the mutant snow monsters, including the younger brothers Heila and Zion who came to assist in the defense, were even more shocked when they saw this extremely visually brutal scene. Captain Stone pumped his pipe hard, two thick eyebrows twisted, and whispered, see the ghost of his mother. The monster is going to cross the river. When the vast majority of people in the city's head were still puzzled, they had been dealing with snow monsters all year round. Mr. Captain, who had experienced combat, had already guessed what would happen next. As expected, the Sykes-headed mutated snow monsters each dragged a large tree with dense branches back to the moat, and then erected the trunk with the canopy facing the city wall, pushing gently forward. The six big trees were forward falling down suddenly, through the two sides of the canal, forming six natural single wood bridges. Seeing this scene, the militiamen at the head of the city shouted loudly. What a panic. What a shame. Elder Hunter screamed in time, forcing the commotion to calm down. Prepare for crossbow fire oil, never let monsters approach the wall. The Asa militia in the city, following the command of Elder Hunter ran busy. Captain Stone shook his head and whispered to the juvenile mage beside him, conventional defenses can't stop the mad monsters across the canal, send Derek a letter, and let him lead the company to intersect as soon as possible. Tell Derek that they should not be alert to the monsters. After arriving at the predetermined position, they wait for the next order. Without my order, they will never be allowed to shoot without permission. Joan showed off windstorming in the second ring and conveyed the instructions of Captain Mr. Derek Young, who was lurking deep in the riverside jungle, and the officers and men of the company. Mr. Captain, are you planning to wait for the monsters to cross the river before letting the company out of the woodland, guarding the river bank, across the canal, and firing at the backs of the monsters attacking the city? Joan whispered. Captain Stone grinned and gave him a thumbs up, everything was silent. Just in this moment, the snow monsters and fearful wolves across the canal had been rushed over by six single wood bridges across the canal, less than twenty yards away from the city wall. The Asa warriors on the city's head threw javelins, fired crossbows, and arrows like raindrops sprinkled down on the monsters crossing the river. The hit monster was splashed with blood on his body, howling and falling down the single tree bridge, falling into the river and stirring the waves. However, both the snow monster and the dire wolf have a tough and thick fur. The defense is far more powerful than the unusual beasts. The vast majority of the arrows falling on them, but caused a slight skin injury, which cannot prevent them from continuing to move forward. Rush. The Asa militia poured barrels of tongue oil from the city head. Elder Hunter ignited the torch with his own hands, threw down the city and ignited the flames. With a loud bang, flames rose into the sky, and between the city wall and the moat, a hot wall of fire was pulled to block the monster that had just crossed the canal. The fire wall provided a sense of security for the residents of Elk Town, and did not last long. After most monsters successfully crossed the river, the Sykes-headed mutant snow monster that completed the bridge mission jumped directly into the canal and waded across. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1136 Monster Siege 2 The mutant snow monster is nearly 20 feet tall, and the river can't cross the chest, and can't stop them from wading on the shore. Behind the mutant snow monster is more than 10 cunning winter wolves. The leaders of these wolves deliberately landed in the last crossing of the river in order to let other monsters charge forward and attract the defending arrows for them. At this moment, the defenders on the head of the city have shifted their attention to the monsters opposite the canal. The winter wolf that fell behind them jumped into the river one after another. With their natural swimming skills, they hid behind the wide ridges of the mutant snow monsters, waving forward in a hurry. Even if an arrow fell on the city's head, there was a huge body of them mutant snow monster serving as a meat shield, 
and the winter wolf hiding behind could not be injured. After landing, the mutated snow monsters and swarms of winter wolves spread a loose line along the river bank, approaching the firewall forward, and successively spread out the air with extreme cold magic power. Twenty Y cone shaped cold waves swept across, instantly blowing out the burning firewall. At the head of the city, all of a sudden fell into deathly silence. The Azawa warriors are not lacking the courage to fight monsters, but they have never faced the coalition of many mutant snow monsters and winter wolves at the same time. Get up and put out the fire. Faced with this combination of power and cunning, including the Elder Hunter, the Azawa people in Elk Town couldn't help but change their faces, and even began to wonder if they could keep their homes. The extinction of the firewall is just the beginning of the disaster. More terrible things came one after another. The Sykes-headed mutant snow monster stepped on the scorched earth in front of him, and under the cover of smoke and dust, ran straight to the wall. This group of behemoths did not directly hit the wall with brute force, but in a weird posture, raised their hands up against the wall, bowed slightly and bowed their heads down, as if praying in front of the wall. This weird behavior made the militia guarding the city stunned. It took a while for the elder hunter to urge him back, and the two of them worked together to throw the big stones down the city wall. The falling stone hit the back of the mutant snow monster, making a slamming noise, and then was bounced away. The mutated snow monsters that were hit, made angry and painful howls but still maintained their quirky posture. Their strong physique and thick fur allowed them to carry the rocks without being crushed. Elder Hunter saw this scene, sweating his forehead anxiously. The oil barrels stored on the city's head have been used up. He had to urge the militiamen under the city to transport materials, transport some fuel as soon as possible, pour it on the mutant snow monster, and light a fire which is more effective than the killing effect of these monsters. Throwing rocks is much stronger. Just as the side of the city was busy transporting oil drums, the monsters outside the city had already launched a surprise attack. The wolves of hordes, under the command of the leaders of the winter wolf, started to run from the bank of the river, rushed to the nearest mutant snow monster, and used their inclined spine as a springboard struggling to jump and vacate more than ten feet high, flying up to the city. It was not until this time that people suddenly realized that those mutant snow monsters who lean their hands on the wall and leaned forward on their upper bodies actually used their twenty-foot eye body to build six human ladders for the wolves. Behind them, Dire Wolf has amazing jumping power, counted as an accelerated runa, jumped from the shoulder of the mutant snow monster easily jumped to the city head, opened the big mouth of the blood basin, bite those militiamen who have not recovered from the shock. As more and more terrifying wolves jumped into the city, the guards' positions splattered with blood, screaming one after another, and plunged into chaos. Captain Stone spit out the last smoke ring, knocked on the pipe on the city wall, and said to Joan without looking back, Send a letter to Derek and say that your company commander is trapped in Elk Town. If the brothers don't hurry and come to the rescue, the company commander will be eaten by the wolf. Despite the urgent situation, Kiaan couldn't help laughing when he heard this funny speech from Captain, and he also admired his mentality of having fun. After Captain Stone explained, he picked up the war armor and dropped it. The gravel war armor fell precisely on top of a mutant snow monster. The mutant snow monster under the city noticed that the war armor was hitting his head down, but he didn't think it would be as good as his harvest small stone hammer. How could he harden his iron brain? And he was simply too lazy to dodge. However, he soon discovered that he had made a fatal mistake. The conglomerate war armor suddenly expanded into a large stone ball with a diameter of ten feet in midair, just like a meteorite descending from the sky. With a bang, the meteorite hit the mutant snow monster's head firmly, and the brain that smashed the giant monster on the spot burst. The fearful wolf on the back of the mutant snow monster that was about to jump was also crushed by the huge stone ball and the screams turned into a pool of erosive flesh. Captain Stone raised his hand to retrieve the blood-stained conglomerate war armor, 
and turned back to Joan and others who were assisting the Azam militia against terror wolves. It's enough for the little major to stay with me and look after the city walls. Audrey, Holden and the little girl will give you a task to try to fly out of the city and remove the single bridge bridges across the canal as soon as possible. Mr. Captain, you are trying to cut off the monster's escape route. It's bad enough, but I like it. The young poet smiled and unfolded a pair of copper dragon wings, fluttering his wings to the river. Audrey summoned Danma, rode up and drove out of the city with a lance. Wait for me. Heila hurriedly photographed a three-loop flying technique on himself, spreading a pair of translucent wings of atmosphere behind him, carrying a giant sword into the air, and chasing Sister Zion. Joan stayed at the head of the city and calmly made a series of spellcasting gestures. The dark fuel sprinkled down the head of the city like raindrops, sticking the two fluffy fur monsters underneath. Yeah. Joan then fired two burning rays, respectively hitting the two mutated snow monsters twenty feet apart, igniting the grease attached to the long hair, and turning into two groups of burning fireballs on the spot. The mutated snow monster, which was on fire, screamed, stumbled backwards, fell under the end muddy wall, rolled and wailed, and it was terrible. Several winter wolves heard the screams and hurried over trying to breathe out the cold and help extinguish the mutant snow monster surrounded by flames. This is your own death. Joan sneered and added a liquid alchemy to instantly transform the muddy water at the foot of the wolf into a flood of lamp oil. The mutated snow monster struggling and rolling, touching the lamp oil spreading from the ground, the flames on the body immediately ignited the lamp oil, and suddenly a sea of fire rose. The group of winter wolves hurried to rescue was engulfed by the rapidly spreading sea of fire, and their fluffy white hair was instantly ignited, screamed and fell into the blazing flames, and was burned alive within five minutes. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1137 Attacking Iron Virgin A winter wolf attacking the city head was the first to perceive Jones' threat, throwing away the Azam militia, turning his head towards the young mage, and spurting a cold stream with his mouth open. Captain Stone stepped in front of Joan, waving his arms and suddenly the swollen muscles of the general uniform were almost split open. The war armor broke in his hand and whistled, and the flying wolf was knocked down by a blow. The head shattered, lying on the ground twitching and dying. At the same time, the cold snap before the winter wolf died, also sprayed on Captain Stone. The captain raised his left arm to cover his face, and his tight nerves were ready to resist the erosion of the severe cold, but unexpectedly, he did not feel the expected cold. He froze for a moment, only to realize that the white cloak on his body was covered with a thick layer of frost, which blocked the cold magic of the winter wolf for him. Joan, this cloak you sewed really has a very good cold resistance effect. Captain Stone turned back and grinned, giving thumbs up to Joan. Joan had just begun to say that he didn't have to be polite. He accidentally noticed that a black shadow was flying towards Captain Stone's back. Without warning, he threw the triangular crystal steel plate in his hand. Yalla! Iron Virgin swelled into a thick tower shield, immediately blocking Captain Stone in time. The terror wolf that launched the sneak attack from Captain Stone's back hit the iron plate and his head broke with blood on the spot, screamed and bounced back, tumbling down the city head. Oh, it's dangerous. Joan, thanks to saving my life. Captain Stone wiped cold sweat. Joan shook his head without making a sound. He looked at the blood-stained crystal steel tower shield in the air, and his eyes suddenly flashed strangely. The rush to rescue Captain Stone just now, without thinking about the reaction, inadvertently inspired Joan's inspiration, making him realize that Iron Virgin can not only be used for defense, but there is also an attack mode that has not yet been developed. Thinking so, Joan couldn't help but get excited and decided to test this brand new attack method on the battlefield immediately. He first turned into a bee-like form, fluttered his wings in the air, 
and then switched the Iron Virgin to shield tower mode. Three large and thick crystal steel triangle plates were folded up at the same time, accompanied by a crisp chimera sound. Kiao An is surrounded by a transparent crystal steel pyramid. Joan vibrated his wings and flew back and forth over the city's head, confirming that the shield tower was flying synchronously with him as always, and he had confidence in his heart and turned his head to look down the battlefield. Looking through the crystal steel plate, I saw three large mutant snow monsters under the city, two of which are still serving as springboards for the evil wolf and the other mutant snow monster has sturdy arms and each grabs a common snow. Strange, like throwing sandbags, struggling to throw the city to add accomplices to the evil wolf who is attacking the city. As more and more snow monsters were thrown into the city, the defensive pressure of the Azawarias also increased. This situation continues, and it takes less than half an hour. This mutant snow monster can send nearly a hundred snow monsters gathered around it to the city head. If that time comes, Elk Town will be hard to escape and fall. Fate. Joan took a deep breath and vibrated the bee's wings with all his strength rushing towards the mutant snow monster that played Porter at the highest speed. He is flying at full speed in the form of a bee, and can increase the speed to about 150 miles per hour in a short time, just like an arrow flying through the sky. At the same time, the crystal steel tower that enveloped Joan's body also flew in the air at the same high speed, and when Joan crashed into the mutant snow monster, the crystal steel tower also reversed the flying attitude synchronously, with the shield tower sharp. The top corner slammed into the mutant snow monster. Boom. At the moment of the collision, Joan felt a shock, and even the person with the tower froze for about one-tenth of a second in the air, and then his flight speed dropped sharply. At the same time, the white flesh wall that was originally in front of him it has disappeared. Joan hovered slowly and looked forward. He soon saw a hundred feet away in front of the muddy canal. A white figure collapsed near the muddy canal, still twitching slightly. It was the one who flew his head. Variation Snow Monster. Iron Virgin weighs 2,000 pounds, and then counts the weight of the Joan B form. The total weight is nearly one ton. Such a heavy steel tower surging at a speed of not less than 150 miles per hour and the terrifying kinetic energy that accompanies inertia is comparable to the heavy shells fired by the largest caliber ship gun of this era. Although the mutant snow monster is powerful and powerful, after all, it is still a flesh and blood body. When it was hit by Iron Virgin, it seemed that it was hit by a naval gun, and its flesh and blood flew across the body, and the bones shattered countless. In one breath, Joan looked up at the triangular spire, and suddenly thought of the majestic sail warships depicted in the book. Under the waterline of the bow, a forward bumping angle was always installed, used to hit enemy ships in naval battles. The way the Iron Virgin hits the enemy under high speed flight is actually very similar to that of a warship that rides the wind and waves to destroy the enemy ship with an angle of collision. Joan simply named this type of attack of the Iron Virgin as the angle of collision mode. Like a child who got a new toy, Joan then named it the two remaining mutant snow monsters under the city wall. These two huge and strong monsters are suitable for testing his newly developed the lethality of the collision angle mode. Joan fluttered his wings, his body almost parallel to the ground. Iron Virgin accompanies the owner's flight, but also adjusts the orientation according to the owner's posture change so that the blood-stained apex angle is always maintained at the position above Joan's head, and it bursts into the sky like a steel meteor, whistling and crashing into the mutant snow. Strange. The mutant snow monster locked by Joan as the target of attack, the huge and cumbersome body was too late to dodge, and was hit into the arms by the Iron Virgin. There was another muffled crackling noise, and the mutant snow monster screamed and flew out slammed into the canal, and never climbed ashore again. Joan shook his head, dispelling the slight dizziness caused by the high-speed collision, and then turned around and rushed to the only mutant snow monster remaining on the battlefield. The last mutant snow monster, who had just witnessed his companion being hit by the flying crystal steel tower, 
was so scared that he turned his hands and feet and ran away. Joan chased the Iron Virgin trailing chase and caught up with the mutant snow monster within a few seconds, hitting his back with one head. Boom! The spire of the tower was deeply embedded in the generous back of the mutant snow monster. The flesh and blood fluttered blurring Joan's vision, and the gas penetrated through the gap in the top of the tower, making him feel sick. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1138 Attacking Iron Virgin 2 Taking a deep breath, Joan calmed down a bit and cast a spell casting gesture, using a magic trick to clear the blood flowing down the top of the Iron Virgin Tower and restore the crystal steel wall to a transparent state. The mutated snow monster outside the tower was hit by a high-speed flying iron virgin into a shocking hole, and Bayai Sensen's broken bones and creeping internal organs were faintly visible. The monster fell to the ground, still breathless, sobbing and crawling forward, seemingly trying to escape from this terrible battlefield and return to his warm nest deep in the snowy mountains. Joan felt to palpitate at the sight of the once extremely fierce monster who turned into a pitiful look of tears and dying struggling in front of him, exposing the fragile nature hidden under the brutal appearance. What kind of weapon did he invent? It can easily destroy such a huge and powerful monster like a cockroach. Joan has never felt that the flesh and blood body is so fragile, even if it has a giant body, it will still be knocked over by the steel tower weighing one ton and flying at high speed, without any resistance. The air inside the tower was contaminated by blood, which made him feel nausea and nausea, and also caused an inexplicable mental pleasure. The strange eyeball behind the neck, stimulated by blood and killing, became active again, and opened itself, turning its bones pulling Joan's nerves. Joan frowned, pulled his collar back, covered his strange eyeballs, and forced himself to calm down with willpower, not to lose his nature in the blood. Whether it is indulging in killing or turning to self-aversion, it is not a positive and healthy mental state. Adults should understand war rationally and evaluate enemy killings fairly. Here is the battlefield where you live and die the battlefield where the enemy and the enemy live together. If I don't kill monsters, monsters will kill me, the reason is simple and clear. Why do you want to be cranky? Kiaon muttered to himself, trying to persuade himself not to disturb his mind and face the reality clearly. At the same time, he also made himself a principle about war and killing. When there is no choice but to kill, there is no blame, but it is better not to kill the enemy let alone torment the enemy for fun. The reason why Joan established such a credo for himself was not that there was a virgin mother complex, but because he was vaguely aware that there was a very strong tendency to violence in his bones, and he was always able to feel the moment of devastating life. To great pleasure to Joan, this pleasure is not only immoral, but also very dangerous. If a person indulges in this evil pleasure, and does not mind destroying life to extract more pleasure, it is like addiction to drugs. Only killing more lives can satisfy the increasing craving for blood. In the long run, the spirit will be twisted and eventually reduced to a bloodthirsty demon, a crazy monster and this is the destiny of Joan trying to escape. He must not indulge his depravity in the blood, so as to lose his humanity. With a long breath of relief, Joan stood in the air, surrounded by the Iron Virgin, and summarized the set of experiments just conducted. After many actual combat tests, Joan now has a more comprehensive understanding of the Iron Virgin collision mode, and the advantages and disadvantages are all clear. The biggest advantage of the collision angle mode is the integration of offensive and defensive and there is an invisible force field buffer zone between Joan himself and the surrounding tower walls. The moment the Iron Virgin flying at high speed hits the enemy, in theory, it will also bear the same reaction force. If the reaction force is all applied to Joan, then he will also be shattered and flesh, and he will not escape. However, in the actual combat test, Joan did not suffer a strong impact. He had to thank the buffer force field between the tower wall and himself, just like an invisible sponge, which absorbed most of the reaction force and protected him from impact. Dot.
In addition to these advantages, Joanne also realized that there were two imperfections in the Iron Virgin angle mode. First of all, the collision angle mode requires open space for full acceleration, without speed there is no momentum, and lethality will be greatly reduced. Iron Virgin itself is relatively bulky, and it also needs to provide her with acceleration space which means that Joan is inconvenient to use this attack method indoors before the acceleration is completed, it hits the wall and is embarrassing. In addition, even in the outdoor battlefield, there is enough open space for acceleration, and the speed of the Iron Virgin has an upper limit, which is basically equal to Joan's own flight speed. In beam and form, the limit speed is almost 150 miles per hour. In eagle form, the limit speed can reach 200 miles per hour. Of course, this full speed assault mode is not sustainable, and will run out of energy in less than half an hour. Limited by the physiological structure of the bee and the eagle, it is difficult for Joan to increase the speed. The upper limit of the speed determines the upper limit of the kinetic energy of the Iron Virgin, which in turn determines the upper limit of the lethality. Is there a way to increase the speed of flight? Actually there are. If Joan is a druid, or if he learns the fourth ring transformation in the future, he can become a bird that is more suitable for high speed assault than the eagle. For example, peregrine falcon, such as warship bird, and blue back swift, the fastest flying bird in the nature of veils. The sprint speed can even reach an third of the speed of sound in a short time. If Joan can become these birds that are better at flying at high speed, Iron Virgin can hit the enemy at subsonic speed, the destructive power will increase two to three times than the B form, and a single collision can completely kill the mutation snow monsters will not be like this now, but also leave the enemy with the opportunity to struggle or even dodge. The sudden gunfire across the canal interrupted Joan's thoughts. Looking through the crystal steel tower to the direction where the gunshots came, he saw that all the officers and men of the reconnaissance company led by Yang Xiao appeared across the moat and were shooting at the monsters that attacked the city. At this time, the situation on the battlefield has quietly reversed. All six mutated snow monsters were killed. The terror wolf and the snow monster who had previously jumped to the city lost their support and were killed one after another under the siege of the Azo warriors. The wolves and snow monsters under the city were also frightened by the rampant iron virgin, and they all retracted to the canals and moved to the idea of retreating to the opposite bank. However, the six cantilever bridges across the canal were already destroyed by Hyla, Audrey and Holden cutting off the monster's retreat. The reconnaissance company entered the battlefield, making the situation of the monsters even worse. The bullets shot from behind forced them to have no time to take care of the siege and wailed and fled around. In the end, with the exception of a few scared wolves braving guns and rain, and forced to cross the river to escape, the rest of the monsters were all corpses under the walls of Elk Town, and the blood stained the moat. Like Master Mr. Joan, Please collect www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1139 Crisis Escalation Fighting outside the city walls of Elk Town continued until noon, until the last snow monster that had nowhere to go was knocked down by the dense lead shot from across the river bank in the pool of blood and could no longer climb. Elk Town opened its gates and Elder Hunt led the tribesmen to welcome the reconnaissance company officers and soldiers who came to the rescue. Since the establishment of Elk Town, this is the first colonial force stationed in the town, and it has been warmly welcomed by all the townspeople and received heroic treatment. This is a rare exception for the northerners a people who have always been hostile to the colonists. Joan, Hyla and Zion brothers following Captain Stone and the company Comrades in Arms, were stationed in Elk Town that night and were invited to participate in the bonfire party held by the townspeople to celebrate the victory. The Azag girl has an exotic singing and dancing performance. However, the singing and dancing in front of you is just a temporary illusion. The day after the reconnaissance company entered Elk Town, in the early morning of July 13th, the shadow from Winter Castle once again shrouded over Elk Town. When the abnormal movement came, 
Joan had just finished meditation and was ready for today's spell. He was planning to have breakfast. There was a loud roar from the window to the piercing eardrum, waves of invisible spiritual coercion, accompanied by sound waves in the town echoes from above, including Joan, all the people who heard the roar could not help but feel terrified, their minds were filled with fear, they could hardly think, they just wanted to escape the source of the horror roar as soon as possible. After all, Joan experienced strong winds and waves, and his will was far stronger than ordinary people. After a brief panic, he calmed down, and he noticed that there was a regular disturbance in the distribution of the surrounding magic net. It was clear that some supernatural power was playing a role. According to the abnormal changes in the magic web, Joan speculates that the roar just now contained some kind of magic power that can cause a fear effect, similar to the fear aura of Prince of Razor. The sound of people panic calling and running outside the window seemed to be something terrible. All signs are further deepening Joan's ominous hunch causing him to worry that something more horrible than the mutant snow monster is hovering above the residents of Elktown. He took a deep breath, restrained the uneasiness in his heart, quickly made a spellcasting gesture, blessed himself with three rings of heroism to ensure that he was not affected by the supernatural forces that caused fear, and then he pushed the door and went out. As soon as he left the door, Joan noticed the cold wind blowing over his head, and the huge shadow with a very strong sense of existence, looking up, as expected, a white dragon shaped like a frost sculpture is soaring above the town, with blue eyes overlooking the frightened crowd at the end of the street, without concealing contempt, the white dragon suddenly converged its wide wings and swooped down from a high altitude, the huge body drove the whistling airflow, the grass and trees were folded wherever it passed, the wooden houses on both sides of the street were also squeaked, as if they might fall apart at any time. In the wooden house where Joan is located, the semi-open door was slammed shut by the airflow brought by the dragon wings. Joan stood at the door and watched the white dragon in the air. He could not help but was hit by the closed door panel. He suddenly caught Venus and stumbled back into the room. He tripped over the threshold and fell to the ground. Dot. Dumb. Joan felt a tightness in his chest for a while, rubbing the swollen bag on his forehead, and almost burst into tears. He shook his head, reluctantly overcoming the dizziness caused by the impact, and braced himself to climb up. Beast, you wait for me. He was anxious to avenge his teeth, rushing out of the door, but just across the threshold, he felt that his soul slipped, tingled and fell in the in front of the door, the hands holding the ground were cold, and Joan suddenly realized that in the midsummer summer season, the street in front of the door was covered with a thick layer of frost, emitting a bitter cold, he held the door handle, stood up carefully, and at the same time looked towards the end of the street, and saw the back of the white dragon from a distance, while gliding low above the street, he was still spitting out the white frozen dragon breath, the dragon sprayed from the street to the end of the street in one breath, frost everywhere. Those passers-by on the street who had no time to escape the dragon's breath were all shrouded in dragon breath and froze. Adults with strong bodies can barely support the trembling in the severe cold, and the elderly and children with weaker physiques are frozen to death as soon as they suffer from bay long breathing. A very busy street a minute ago, this time has become a silver and white silence like a cemetery covered with snow in winter. The horrible sight in front of him made Joan breathe a sigh of relief, recalling that he had just been hit by the door panel back into the room. Although he had a big bag on his head, he was also blessed by the disaster. The miserable sight in front of him made Joan realize the seriousness of the situation. If this evil dragon is allowed to make waves in the town, it is unknown how many residents will be slaughtered. Dense gunshots were heard in the distance. Presumably Captain Stone also noticed the attack of the dragon, and summoned company officers and men to shoot and sniper. Unfortunately, the evil dragon was very vigilant. As soon as he heard the sound of the gun, he fluttered his wings and flew to a thousand feet high in an instant, 
leaving the effective range of the magic crystal rifle. The evil dragon hovered and shouted fearlessly in the high sky, mocking the group of small humans looking up to himself on the ground, and afterwards twisted his butt, flew out of town with complacency. Although the observation time left for Joan was short, he still had time to see a lot of valuable information from the white dragon. The white dragon is about 14 feet long from head to tail, and its wingspan is close to 16 feet. Considering the power of the dragon breath that it just sprayed out, Joan guessed that it should be an adult white dragon. Recalling the white dragon record in the Book of Vale's Monsters Dragons, it is not difficult for Joan to figure out the general attributes of this evil dragon. The white dragon is the lowest intelligence among all real dragons. The adult white dragon's intellectual attributes are not stronger than ordinary adults. In many cases, it looks like a rude beast, not a wise and noble real dragon. As for the strength attribute, the average value of the adult white dragon is about 24, which is slightly stronger than the ogre, but it is not as good as the mutant snow monster. Although the white dragon is not very smart, it is still a real dragon after all, born with a warlock ability, he can perform some low level arcane spells as an adult. If you take into account the spellcasting ability and the fearsome dragon power, the adult white dragon and the mutant snow monster can make almost 5 or 5 shots. Of course, for this kind of combat power comparison, the battlefield must be set on the ground. If the white dragon is allowed to fly freely, the mutant snow monster will only be beaten by the head, and there is no way to touch others. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest. Chapter 1140 The dragon comes in general, the appearance of this white dragon poses a greater threat to Elk Town than yesterday's group of monsters who were attacking the city. The magic crystal rifle in the hands of the reconnaissance company can only pose a certain threat to the white dragon within a hundred feet. As for the bow of the Azawarias, warriors, they cannot even penetrate the dragon scale at the same range, and they are unable to stop the white dragon from above the town. Do whatever you want, come whenever you want, and leave whenever you want. Compared to the actual harm caused by the white dragon to Elk Town, it is more troublesome because of the panic that accompanied the dragon. A person with strong determination, such as Joan, must be under the protection of magic to be able to resist the deterrent of the dragon. Most residents of the town can hardly resist the fear caused by Long Y. Panic is like a plague. Once it starts to spread, the whole elk town will become panicked and lose its faith in guarding its homeland. If it were that time. Elk Town was not far from the sinking. In the face of the crisis, Joan felt he was responsible. In this town shrouded in the shadow of the dragon, if there is no one to find a person to fight against the dragon, no one is more suitable than him Joan Vida. If you want to ask him how sure he is to kill the dragon, adhering to the usual modesty and prudence, Kiao and Yuo didn't dare to say that Kiking was still certain. Thinking about how to slaughter the dragon, Joan licked his lower lip and couldn't help the excited heartbeat speeding up, his blood boiling. There were familiar footsteps behind him. Holden flew over and waved at him eagerly. Joan, just now a white dragon flew over here, are you okay? Joan shook his head. You are all right. Holden just breathed a sigh of relief, and immediately saw the passerby frozen in the street. The smile on his face was replaced by resentment. Where did that dragon go? We have to find a way to kill it. Joan pointed in the direction where Bailong was going. The pale figure still looming in the clouds. At this time Audrey and Hyla also ran over, and they were relieved to see that both Joan and Holden were safe. Captain Stone is gathering companies in front of the city gate. Let's hurry up and meet with Mr. Captain to discuss how to deal with the current predicament. Audrey made the most sound suggestion. Hyla and Holden had no objections to this, but Joan had other plans and said to Audrey, you go to Captain Stone to gather. I will fly to the city first to see what's going on outside. Maybe except that white dragon, there are other enemies outside the town. Okay. Be careful yourself, see you later. Audrey hurried away with her brother and Hayla. On the frozen street, only Joan stood alone. He first photographed a two ring of cold enchantment on his body, 
and then took out the snow monster cape he made from the storage bag and put it on his body. Anti-cold enchantment can absorb the cold damage of 7 energy levels, and then count the cold resistance of the 5 energy levels provided by snow monster cloak. With this double protection, even if Joan was sprayed by the white dragon dragon's breath will not suffer any frostbite. Next, Joan draws 3 mythical powers, blessing himself mythical shield, mythical mage armor and mythical transformation. Fully prepared before the dragon slaughter, this turned into a beaman form, fluttered into the air, and flew to the head of Elk Town. Elder Hunter was directing the Assa militia to defend the city and saw Joan flying up, but nodded gratefully to him, too busy to say hello. Kiaan looked out of the city, as expected. A group of tall and gigantic frost giant knights were gathering across the moat and could not afford a hundred rides. These frost giant warriors all wore ice blue breastplates and huge shields behind them. The center of the breastplate was painted with a war armor coat of arms surrounded by frost. It was the emblem of the demon lord angry prince Koschichi. It can be seen that this group of frost giants all came from the descendants of the Winterhold lord Trim the Winterhold knights. Joan had heard Uncle Logan mention that Trim had two elite troops, one was the White Dragon Guard, and the other was the Winter Castle Knights. The total number of Winterhold Knights is only 300. There are no fewer than 100 people present outside the city at this moment. It can be seen that Trim spares no expense in order to win Elk Town. Every Winterberger is an elite selected and trained by Trim himself. Even the mount is very special. These strong frost giants average 15 feet in height and weigh nearly 3,000 pounds. Ordinary war horses can't afford their weight. Trim hunted a large group of cold raptor dragons on the Genting Highlands, training to become the exclusive mounts of the Knights of Winterhold. Joan had seen Dreadclaw Dragon in the Algonquin Valley. Raptor Dragon is also a bipedal sauropod carnivorous dinosaur. It looks and looks similar to Dinoclaw, but it is much larger than Dinoclaw, about 24 feet long from head to tail and stands 12 feet tall. The hind limbs for running are thick and thick like tree trunks, the forelegs are short and flexible, and sharp claws grow on the toes. Cold Raptor Dragon is a subclass of Raptor Dragon. It lives in cold mountains or tundra in high latitudes. It is more fierce and aggressive than ordinary Raptor Dragons. Only the stronger and brutal frost giants can tame this group. A daunting large carnivorous dinosaur that acts as a mount. The frost giant knight headed is using a single telescope to observe the scene on the head of Elk Town. Afterwards, he sneered, put down the telescope tube, and let out a long roar. The white dragon soaring above the Knights of Winterhold heard the order from the captain of the knights, then turned down and swooped down, gliding along the moat at a low altitude, and at the same time stretched his neck and sprayed a white cone-shaped cold current towards the river. The extremely cold dragon breath is like a huge broom, pushed flatly against the river, and then there is a crackling crackle that freezes into a solid layer of ice behind the white dragon. After taking a breath of dragon breath, the white dragon flapped its wings to reverse its direction and then turned around and spouted the dragon breath to further strengthen the river ice. So gliding back and forth twice, the whole moat was frozen and solid, and the two sides were connected by ice, which became a smooth road. It was not until this time that the people on the city's head suddenly realized that the white dragon gliding back and forth against the river surface, breathing the dragon's breath, is not simply shining martial arts. But the main purpose is to pave a river crossing for the Winter Castle Knights across the river bank. I'll. Captain Frost Giant urged the mount to rush towards the glacier first, the cold raptor dragon plus the frost giant on the back, with a total weight of no less than 10,000 pounds, stepped steadily on the ice without any cracks under his feet. Captain Frost Giant was very satisfied with the firmness of the ice surface, turned back and waved urging his knight to follow up. In a blink of an eye, a hundred knights drove the dinosaur to cross the river and came to the city wall. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, 
www.mentalnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1141 Knights of Winter hold the Azawa warriors on the head of the city witness. The Knights of the Winter Castle riding dinosaurs across the glacier, and they were all cold. Fortunately, they are also warriors who are battle-hardened. In this extremely unfavorable situation, they are still able to restrain fear and remain calm. Following the orders of Elder Hunter, they have filled their bowstrings and fired a dense rain of arrows. Dot. At the same time, Captain Stone, who led the reconnaissance company ascending the city, ordered a shot to be fired. The roaring bullets mixed in the arrow rain and swept toward the frost giant near the river bank. In the face of the stormy arrows and bullets, Captain Frost raised his shield expressionlessly, and other winter halt knights followed the example of the captain and hurriedly raised the shield. The frost giant's large shield is twice the size of the human tower shield. The three-inch thick pine shield surface is bonded with a layer of extremely tough white dragon leather. The leather surface is also inlaid with layers of scaly steel film to further enhance defense. Neither the lead shot from the magic crystal rifle nor the arrows fired by the crossbow can penetrate the thick giant shield, nor can it cause a fatal threat to the frost giant hiding behind the shield. Supported by a round of guns and arrows, the Winter Holt knights took advantage of the defenders to refill the gaps between the arrows and arrows quickly turned over and jumped off the mounts, spreading a loose line along the river bank, the left hand raised the shield, and the right hand from the storage bag a stone as big as a grinding disc was pulled out. Under the cover of the shield, the frost giants skillfully round their arms, struggling to throw giant stones towards the side of the city wall. Joan had witnessed the fire giant throwing stones at the brass pass to attack the city. The boulder throne was like a meteor fire rain. Just a moment, he destroyed the fortress of Nicey that Joan had built so hard. At this moment, the scene of the fall of the former fortress of Nicey seems to repeat itself in front of Joan's eyes, awakening the unbearable bitter experience from the depths of his memory. The frost giant is no less powerful than the fire giant, and the stones thrown are similar in weight. Although not like the fire giant, it can inject high temperature magic into the stones and become as hot as lava, but it can also cause effective damage to the city walls. A hundred winter castle knights is like a hundred humanoid catapults. After a round of bombing, the city walls of Elktown showed cracks visible to the naked eye. If this group of frost giants is allowed to continue to attack the city, the wall will collapse completely after a short period of time, and the elk town that has lost the protection of the wall is destined to become a hunting ground for the slaughter of giants and dragons. The tremor caused by the impact of the boulder on the city wall is transmitted from the bottom of the person's feet to the hair tips, and the roar is like a doomsday bell echoing in the ear. The atmosphere of panic spread quietly across the city. Elder Hunter and the Asa people beside him all looked pale and the despair in their eyes was hard to hide. Even Captain Stone lost his former composure, two thick eyebrows twisted together, and the palm of the gravel hammer could not help shaking slightly. Joan fluttered his wings in the air. His eyes shifted from the white dragon in the air to the group of knights who were throwing stones. He had planned to kill the white dragon first, but the situation on the battlefield has changed for now. The threat posed by the frost giant to Elk Town is obviously greater than that of the white dragon. In this situation, Joanne had no choice but to try to deal with the Winterhold Cavaliers first, and tried to force them to stop throwing stones at the city. This is of course much more dangerous than dealing with an adult white dragon, and he is not very sure. A large fireball roared towards the frost giant's position, bursting among the crowd and the erupting flame reflected the Red River. Joan didn't need to look back to know that this was fireball released by Hayala. There was cheers all over the city, but he couldn't laugh. The flames triggered by the fireball technique ignited the grass on the bank of the river, and in the burning flames, the row of tall and magnificent figures stood still. The cheers on the city's head quickly weakened. People were surprised to find that the frost giant, who should have feared the magic of the fire department, was not repelled by fireball, placed in the flames, 
and still throwing boulders uniformly and bombarding the city walls. Damn it. These frost giants all have magic amulet to resist fire damage. In vain, Fireball made Hyla stomping his feet in anger. The Winter Holt Knights are the trump card troopers that Trim spares no expense to build. He is well equipped from head to toe. But how can he ignore the frost giant's weakness? For fear of flames, Joan originally wanted to use fire magic to deal with the frost giant. Hyla's frustration ruled out this option for him, and he simply adopted a simpler and more rude countermeasure. After making up his mind, Joan first blessed himself with three rings of acceleration, thought about it, and added a melt into the stone just in case, sacrificed Iron Virgin and switched to shield tower mode wrapped himself tightly, fluttered towards the river bank. Joan can reach a maximum speed of 150 miles per hour in the state of a bee. The third ring acceleration can double his speed during the duration of the spell, so that his flight speed soared to 300 miles, which is equivalent to a quarter of the speed of sound. Higher speed means greater kinetic energy and greater kinetic energy represents stronger impact. Joan's flight speed doubled, and the kinetic energy carried by the Iron Virgin flying synchronously with him also quadrupled, rushing to the Captain Frost Giant with a thunderous momentum. Captain Frost Giant was about to throw a stone, suddenly realized that the wind was coming, he hurriedly dropped the stone and lifted his shield to block it. At the same time, Joan took the Iron Virgin and swooped down from the top of the city at high speed, just like a meteor tearing the sky, and he was approaching him in an instant. A ton of crystal steel cone, under subsonic flight, the impact of the impact moment can only be described as horror. The Captain Frost Giant's reaction to holding up the shield was unpleasant. His physical strength was stronger than the dragon. However, he was still unable to support the Iron Virgin who was hit by subsonic speed. First, the giant shield in his hand was torn apart by the crystal steel tower. Sawdust and steel pieces were scattered all over the sky. The huge body of Captain Frost Giant was also hit and flew heavily on the river beach. The speeding Iron Virgin swept past the head of the giant's queue, and the mud and sand from the storm forced the Frost Giants to retreat and the formation immediately became chaotic, and the offensive was also interrupted. Joan drew an arc in the air against the Iron Virgin, and it took a lot of effort to get rid of the inertial push and stabilize the volley. Looking back, I was surprised to find that Captain Frost was not killed, but just fell to the ground, holding the right arm of the soft tread, the face was twisted and convulsed by extreme pain and the forehead was leaking dense sweat beads. The sight fell on the right arm of Captain Frost Giant. Joan observed a little while and determined that the arm of the guy holding the shield was shattered, and no inch of bone was intact. Unless someone casts a high-level divine treatment on him, don't think of raising the right arm again in this life. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1142 Decapitate Although Captain Frost's expression looked very painful, Joan had no mercy, adjusted his flying attitude in the air, and controlled the Iron Virgin to dive and accelerate, intending to take advantage of the other party's severe disability and unable to lift his shield to protect himself and completely killed his life! Exclamation mark. If he can successfully kill the Captain Frost Giant, Joan will also cause a strong psychological shock to other Winterholt Knights, forcing them to be afraid of the Iron Virgin rampaged on the battlefield and unable to concentrate on the siege. The crisis in Elk Town will also follow of relief. Joan planned well but unfortunately there were always unexpected variables on the battlefield. As soon as Iron Virgin began to accelerate, Captain Frost Giant's eyes flashed an alert look, realizing Joan's plan, and whistle with a painful pain. The cold raptor dragon guarding the host, heard a whistle, immediately roared with a head, took a big step, and rushed from the side to Joan who was diving at a low altitude, and suddenly threw out a thick tail hitting the Iron Virgin on. With a mumble, 
the Iron Virgin resembled a tennis ball hit and flew away from the original track and rolled to the side. Joan inside the Iron Virgin is also rolling in the sky. He couldn't help but hit the tail of the dinosaur, although the Iron Virgin blocked most of the impact for him, the violent roll still made him feel dizzy. Finally, Joan endured dizzy and stared out of the tower realizing that the raptor dragon was roaring towards him. Seeing the fierce posture, it seemed that he would crush the iron virgin and remove himself from the shell he pulled it out and ate it. Joan couldn't guarantee that the crystal steel plate that constituted the iron virgin would withstand the bite of the dinosaur's claws, and now it was too late to accelerate the collision with the beast, simply avoid the sharp edge and turn around and fly towards the wall, although the raptor dragon is fierce and strong, after all, it is just a simple minded beast, after seeing the prey running away, it chased it up without thinking, Joan deliberately kept flying at low altitude, the speed was not very fast, lured the dinosaurs to maintain a close distance, and approached the city wall suddenly accelerated and hit the wall. The corners of the Iron Virgin touched the wall of the large rock pile, as if a piece of transparent rock sugar dissolved in the water, so disappeared in the solid stone wall. No trace. Joan's three ring spell melting into the stone, which he blessed in advance, not only allows him to integrate into the rock formation, but also can be fused with the rock together with his portable equipment. The shape and size of Iron Virgin are exaggerated, but she is essentially a dancing shield, and the shield is of course a portable equipment, so you can also enjoy the magic effect of melting into the stone, accompanied by Joan's integration city wall. Chasing the cold raptor dragon behind Joan, I never dreamed that the prey suddenly disappeared into the city wall and the bulky body couldn't hold back and hit the wall under the inertial push. In the roar, the city wall trembles violently. The cold raptor dragon nearly collapsed to death on the spot, the head was bleeding like blood, wailing and staggering backwards, the huge body was crumbling. At the head of the city, Hyala has been paying attention to the battle between Joan and the frost giant and his dinosaur mount, holding his breath nervously, holding the wave-bladed giant sword with flaming flames in his hands, ready to rescue at any time. Seeing the cold raptor dragon chasing Joan, he hit the wall with a dizzy look afterwards. The female swordsman's eyes lit up, and she thought that her chance had come. Without thinking, she jumped from the wall and held the sword in both hands. Rushing hard to the cold, the raptor dragon's neck was extremely slender compared to its torso. After Hayala was promoted to level 9 magic warrior, his professional ability weapon enchantment also improved. At this moment, the enchantment attribute attached to the wave blade giant sword, in addition to her most commonly used flame special effect, also added a sharp edge special effect, making the blade harder and sharper. A fiery red light flashed through the air and then more scarlet blood spattered. The brave female swordsman, holding the enchanted giant sword, jumped from the thirty fly city head. The sword that was hacked out with all his strength, directly cut off the neck of the cold raptor dragon, and the huge head rolled down. The head and body fell down. Joan heard the movement of the dinosaur hitting the wall and waited for two seconds before driving the Iron Virgin out of the city wall. He happened to see Hayala descend from the sky and beheaded the cold raptor. Slightly startled, Joan immediately recovered and pushed away the triangular steel plate on the front of the Iron Virgin, as if a tray had been detected and it was time to catch Hayala falling in the air and send her back to the city. Joan, did you see the sword I just saw? Isn't it handsome? Hayala held his arms and asked cheerfully. Kiaan glanced at her, and held back the vomiting. She dared to jump off the building without the blessing of Feather Drop. It's pretty handsome, but don't be so impulsive in the future, it scares me. Ha ha. It's really impulsive. Now think about it. I'm a little bit afraid of myself. Hayala touched the ponytail and grinned. Joan sent Hayala to the city and regrouped the Iron Virgin. Looking back, Captain Frost Giant with a broken arm had been pulled back to his position by his men. Captain Frost Giant's cold raptor dragon sacrificed himself to rush out of the mess, causing Joan to miss the opportunity to chase down his owner, 
and also aroused the vigilance of other Winterhold knights. The frost giants who established their positions along the river bank now no longer care about the siege, and they all targeted the attack on Joan and his iron virgin, and the rain like boulders flew over him. Joan flew away from the city quickly, giving full play to the B-man's mobility advantage and drove the Iron Virgin to avoid stone attacks in an open air. Although the situation looks dangerous, it seems that it is only a short distance from being hit by a stone. In fact, Joan has a pair of compound eyes with super dynamic vision in the form of a bee. The reason he deliberately pretended to be very thrilling is to attract Frost Giant to throw stones at himself constantly. The number of stones carried by Frost Giant is limited and throwing stones is also a very physical exercise for giants. Throwing stones repeatedly will soon make his arm sore. When the frost giants throw out ammunition and run out of energy, the siege battle should be over. At least until the giants recover their physical strength, Elk Town can be safe. Initially, Joan's plan went well, and the stones flying toward him were gradually sparse, and the frost giants clearly showed a tired look. However, when he secretly hid, a familiar roar came suddenly from his head, and the cold wind screamed. Joan hurriedly glanced up and saw a huge white figure swooping down from high altitude and slamming straight into the Iron Virgin, the White Dragon. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1143 to Long Boom. The White Dragon descended at high speed and ran into Joan. Joan Lian and his Iron Virgin were knocked out and flew out. Bai Long himself was bounced back by the reaction force. Before launching the collision, the White Dragon has blessed the mage armor and shield in advance plus a dragon scale harder than steel, to ensure that it will not be recoiled when it hits the Iron Virgin Dao was injured, but just felt dizzy. The Iron Virgin was hit by an unprecedented strong force, and the hinge between the four crystal steel plates made a tooth pounding friction sound, almost falling apart on the spot. Joanne, who was in the tower, was shocked by the shock of his eyes, shaking his head in a dizzy state barely keeping awake despite the protection of the buffer field. The wild dragon yin came again from above, and the white dragon swooped down again. This evil dragon has learned the lesson just now, and no longer tries to directly hit the iron virgin with his horns, and instead protrudes his claws forward, trying to grasp the iron virgin and tearing it with a pair of claws. Without fully accelerating, Joan did not want to collide with the Iron Virgin against Bei Long. Looking through the crystal steel plate, Joan looked up at the dragon that was approaching quickly in the air, chanting the chant in a low voice, and skillfully made a series of casting gestures. Bei Long is nearly a hundred feet away from Iron Virgin. Joan has finished preparing for the cast, raised his hand and pressed the transparent wall in front of him and chanted the last start spell. Yeah. Outside the Iron Virgin, the magic net was turbulent sharply, and a fiery ball of fire came out of nowhere, flying towards the White Dragon. The White Dragon, which had already converged its wings and started diving at high speed, was too late to dodge and was hit by a fireball that suddenly appeared in front of his eyes. There was a thunderous roar in the air, the fireball exploded violently, and the rising flame surrounded the white dragon. Joan's three ring fireball with spell overcoming can normally cause eight magical levels of fire damage to the target. However, the same fireball bombarded a creature belonging to the cold subspecies creature, born with a fire-furring weakness, and doubled its lethal power. There was a horrified roar of the white dragon in the flames followed by a cold stream spewing out to extinguish the flames. After extinguishing the fire with the dragon's breath, the white dragon reappeared in people's vision, and burnt black burns were everywhere on his body, which seemed very embarrassing. Joan had long expected that even a single fireball would not kill a muscular adult white dragon, even if it caused double kills. Taking advantage of the space where the white dragon was blown away by fireballs, Kiaon fluttered his wings, driving the Iron Virgin after fully accelerating and turned towards the White Dragon. Just a round of fireball bombing, the White Dragon hasn't slowed down, 
the body protection spell enchantment has been exploded, most of the scales are peeled off, and the pain is hard to bear. There was a collision, flapping their wings in a hurry, trying to escape to Frost Giant's position, seeking refuge. Fair. Joan completed the spell at the same time as the high speed assault, and summoned Mage Nether Palm. A dark giant palm suddenly appeared on the top of the white dragon head. With Joan's mind remotely spreading out his five fingers, he firmly grasped the white dragon's back neck and prevented it from escaping. Being caught in this moment, Bei Long had no time to dodge and was hit by a hurricane iron virgin. A blood rain spattered in the air. Bei Long's half body and left wing were torn by a sharp spire, and the leaky wings had no power to flap. The dragon dragged a long wail and fell down into the sky. He fell heavily in front of the city gate and smashed a big hole in the ground. Joan immediately chased down put away the iron virgin, and strode close to the winged white dragon. After being hit hard by fireball and iron virgin one after another, and falling down from a thousand feet, the white dragon's physique can no longer be strong, and he is dying. The evil dragon raised his head hard from the pool of blood, his face covered with blood, and stared at the approaching young mage with all his strength. With his last effort, he spit out the cold dragon breath and tried to die with the young mage that had hit him hard. Joan pulled down his cloak and hood, striding forward in the cold. There are double protections provided by cold enchantment and snow monster cloak. On the way to chase down the evil dragon, Kiao and Hun started the mythical transfiguration technique, and every time he took a step, his body became swelled. When he walked up to Bei Long, he had changed from a kinksy U teenager into a mutant snow monster that was taller than Frost Giant and stronger than Bei Long. The gap between the adult white dragon and the mutant snow monster is like a big white goose facing a gorilla. The healthy white dragon didn't dare to fight the mutant snow monster head, not to mention that he was seriously injured at this time, and after struggling twice, Joan was knocked down to the ground and could not move. Joan straddled on the back of the white dragon protruding a pair of furry giant palms and strangling his neck. His arms struck with force, and with a click, he stiffly twisted off the dragon's thick neck and pulled his head down softly. Joan jumped off the dragon's back, changed back to human form, cast a shrinkage on the white dragon's body unattended, and then shoved the shrunken body into his backpack. From the city head to the river bank, both the enemy and our camps were silent, shocked by Joan's feat of killing the dragon with empty hands. Joan didn't want to be the focus of attention. He quickly packed the big backpack containing the dragon corpse into the storage bag and returned to the small enclosed space inside the Iron Virgin. Instead, he felt more comfortable and comfortable. Just then, there was a sudden commotion on the city's head, and people looked back seemingly aware of some abnormal signs. Joan was also attracted by the commotion on the city's head, looked up, and soon saw a swaying figure, climbed the city head along the stairs, and his faltering steps were like a drunk, making people worry that he would footsteps fell to the tower. Joan was too far away to see the man's appearance, but he had a familiar feeling, as if he had seen each other before. When in doubt, the man was already on the head of the city. Compared with the people around him, he was taller and taller, and his body was also surprisingly magnificent. His white complexion showed that he had a relationship with the Winter Castle Knights outside the city. The same bloodline is also a frost giant. In a human town that is resisting the invasion of the frost giant, a frost giant suddenly appears next to the human warrior who is defending the city which of course will cause commotion. However, what is more surprising than this is that the Azap people in the city did not try to attack the frost giant who was staggering, but instead reached out and helped, showing a concerned attitude, and seemed to pay special respect to the frost giant. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1144 Mad The more Joan looked at the tall figure on the city's head, the more familiar he felt and could not help tightening his heart, 
a long lost figure appeared in his mind. Mr. Henil, what are you doing here? Elder Hunt quickly hurried to the frost giant, his face eager. Go back. This is not where you should come. Clark Henil. Joan couldn't help but tremble. Brother Clark, is it really you? After the battle in the Cloud Castle, Joan and the frost giant Clark Henil were separated. So far, half a year has passed, there has been no Clark's news but he did not expect to meet him again in Elktown, and his heart is full of surprises. Clark seemed to hear Joan's call, ignoring Elder Hunt's dissuasion, and walked directly to the front of the stack, his hands leaning against the wall and watching. Joan looked up at the city head, and the moment he looked at Clark, the ecstasy in his heart immediately disappeared, replaced by doubt and anxiety, compared with when he was traveling together. Clark's face looked haggard. What made Joan worry was that the other party's eyes were sluggish and indifferent. It seemed to be sleepwalking, looking at himself, but he could not recognize his little brother. Brother Clark, what's wrong with you? Joan couldn't help asking. Clark didn't make a sound, his haggard face cramped slightly, and seemed to endure some kind of sickness that was so intense that it was tormenting the soul. He took a deep breath and looked at Joan's eyes with a little more warmth. It seemed to finally recognize him, and when he was about to speak, he was interrupted by a violent gasp, his hands supporting the city wall, as if to be collapsed. Joan saw Clark's physical condition was very bad, he could not consider why he appeared in Elktown, hurriedly took off in the air just want to return to Clark as soon as possible, to find out what he was sick. However, at this moment, a huge stone suddenly flew behind him, hitting the Iron Virgin heavily, hitting Joan even led the tower to the wall, and rebounded after the collision. Fortunately, the defense of Iron Virgin is strong enough to be bombarded with stones and still tightly protects Joan, just a false alarm. Joan hurriedly stabilized her body not looking for Clark, driving the Iron Virgin to wander in midair, avoiding the boulders thrown by hail. Don't worry about that human kid first. Opposite the winter hold Cavalier's position, the captain of the Cavaliers walked to the front of the position regardless of the fracture of his right arm. He waved his hand to stop the subordinate stone from attacking Joan. He stared straight at Clark Henil on the opposite city's head. Then, exhilarating, he turned and yelled at the people behind him. Yes, that's the man. Quickly, hold him. Don't let him run away. The frost giants followed the captain's instructions, leaving Joan to ignore it, and instead held the stone high, aiming at the most prominent Clark on the city head and throwing it. Clark Hennill, who was sick and could faint at any time, was at this critical juncture, like suddenly waking up, standing up suddenly, waving a seemingly inadvertent wave, and flying the two boulders in front of him, grabbed firmly in his hand, and then threw the stone back again, just hitting the subsequent flying stone. The four boulders collided in the air and only made a roar. All of them shattered into powder, and the dust was flying all over the sky, blocking the vision of both the offense and defense. Clark supported the city head with both hands, and in the exclamation of the people around, he turned and jumped down, thumped, and fell in front of the city gate. That guy jumped down on his own, but it saved us trouble. The Captain Cavaliers was overjoyed and urged his men to step forward and catch Clark as soon as possible. Joan has been paying close attention to the dynamics on the battlefield. Clark's sudden jump in the building was completely beyond his expectations. After the consternation, he quickly urged the Iron Virgin to fly to Clark intending to him back before the Winter Castle Knights were killed. City Head, the boulders flying behind him forced Joan to dodge, and for this reason he spent a lot of time. The two Winterberg Knights took the opportunity to rush to Clark first, rushed fiercely, and each clasped Clark's arm. He got up from the ground and dragged towards his side. Get away from me. Joan was so anxious that he almost burst into flames driving the Iron Virgin to rush towards the two Winterberg knights who tried to kidnap Clark. When the two frost giants saw the huge crystal steel tower flying along with the breaking wind, they were all frightened and changed their faces. They all hid behind Clark, 
and pushed Clark up as a meat shield. In order to avoid accidentally hurting Clark, Joan can only tolerate his anger and steer the Iron Virgin around them, racking his brains, thinking about how to rescue Clark, who was taken hostage, from the hands of those two mean villains. At this moment, Clark suddenly woke up from a coma. His eyes were covered with bloodshot eyes, and his expression became abnormally fierce, like a dehumanized beast, shaking his arms, throwing away the winter hold night holding him, lightning with two punches, they hit the faces of the two. The two winter castle knights focused their attention on Joan. Unexpectedly, the dead tiger held by themselves came to life again, and each face was hit with a heavy punch. The nose was interrupted on the spot and screamed upward, fall. Clark somehow frantically rushed to a nearby winter castle knight. His hands choked the opponent's throat, and the pinched opponent's eyes turned white, and there was blood at the corner of his mouth. After strangling the enemies, Clark continued to wave his arms like a knife, splitting the arms of the corpse, forcibly pulling off the blood-stained breastplate from his body, throwing it away aside, and then slashing with a hand knife. The chest of the body was cut open, and the probing hand went in and groped a few times and then pulled out violently, holding a still beating heart in his hand. Brother Clark, calm down. Joan flew to Clark beside the Iron Virgin and shouted loudly into his ears. Clark turned his head slowly, and looked at him blankly. The bloodshot eyes could not see the slightest humanity. At the moment of eye contact, Joan couldn't help his scalp numb, and a cold rose from the bottom of his heart. Clark withdrew his gaze from Joan and stared at the heart in his hand. His eyes changed from dull to greedy, burying his head to bite the heart, crunching and chewing, and instantly swallowed the heart. Clark clicked the blood on his hand. The bloodthirsty desire had not been satisfied, and his crazy eyes looked at another Winterberger knight who was knocked down by him. The man just woke up from the dizziness clutching the nose bridge, and looked up to see the horror scene of Clark's cannibalism, frightened, and struggling to get up and try to escape. But as soon as he turned around, Clark swooped up like a beast and pushed him to the ground. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest. Chapter 1145 Cannibal Clark held the back of the Knights of Winterhold with his knees, hugged his head with both hands, and pulled back with a force, snapping his neck, and his head formed a strange acute angle with the back. Witnessing this extremely massacre, both warring parties couldn't help but take a breath looked at Clark's gaze, and showed fear from the bottom of their hearts. Clark ignored the people's eyes and treated the body of the Knights of Winterhold just like he did just now, the horn sounded on the position of the Knights of Winterhold opposite. The Captain Cavaliers led the team to withdraw to the other side of the glacier and camped on the spot. The siege was frustrated, and a white dragon was damaged. The two men, the Captain of the Cavaliers, also abandoned an arm and his face became particularly gloomy. Retreating to the opposite bank of the river, Captain Cavaliers hurriedly took out a communication stone and reported to the White Prince Vinya. Your Highness, we have confirmed that the gold the Lord Lord is looking for is in Elk Town. How to act next, at your command. Not long after, Vinya sent a reply. I'm going to report to my father and adults. If nothing unexpected happens, I will lead the White Dragon Guard to Elk Town at the latest tomorrow afternoon to completely solve the problem about the man. Before I arrive, you must closely monitor Elk Town and don't let that man run away. Comply. The Cavalier's captain responded abruptly. Dot. Joan stood beside Clark and watched the Winter Castle Knights withdraw to the other side of the canal, secretly relieved. Looking back at Clark, who was burying his head in the cannibalism, his newly relaxed heart tightened again. For half a year, Joan has no idea what kind of suffering Clark has suffered, but from his crazy state, trying to persuade him to recover his consciousness is in vain, and may even stimulate his already abnormal nerves attracting him hostility and even attack. With a deep sigh, Kiao Ankian was patient, and took out a capsule from the casting material bag, made a casting gesture, 
and shot a negative energy ray toward Clark who was facing away from himself. Using the three ring poison strike as a medium, Joan injects the drow toxin in the capsule after dilution into Clark's body, trying to make him fall asleep. Poison strike hit the giant frost giant's back, but failed to receive the effect that Joan expected. Clark just yawned, shook his head, and continued to devour his blood. Joan frowned, guessing that poison strike was resisted by Clark's strong physique, and the medicine failed to penetrate into his body. Most types of toxins cannot be guaranteed to be 100% effective against any organism. The specific effectiveness depends mainly on the physical structure and physical strength of the poisoned person. The stronger the person, the stronger the resistance to toxins. Although Clark is unconscious, his strong body is not affected by his spirit, and it is not worth fussing to resist the erosion of poison strike. Joan took out two more capsules encapsulating the sleeping potions, and cast poison strike on Clark again. The previous cast, although he failed to break through Clark's resistance, had injected a sleeping agent strengthened with spells into his body, and a person's resistance was always limited. As long as the dose of toxin continued to increase, then the strong resistance will eventually be defeated. In the second poison strike, Joan used double casting materials. The double dose sleeping agent was amplified by the spell and injected into Clark, plus the remaining power in the body just after the previous casting, combined to suppress Clark. The resistance finally made this crazy frost giant fall down and fall into a lethargic state. Joan raised his hand to remotely control the master's nether palm, picked up Clark, who was in a coma, and flew into the city. Captain Stone took Hayla, Audrey and Holden out of the crowd and hurried to Joan to see him safe. Joan, what are you doing bringing this madman back? Captain Stone pointed to Clark, who was sleeping with hatred and fear in his eyes. Not to mention that this guy is a frost giant, it is likely to have grudges with the group of Dong Bao. He can be seen from his maddened cannibal behavior just now. It is not a good person. Why do you bother to bring back such a perverted monster? Let the cavaliers take him away. Joan could understand Captain Stone's displeasure, but he couldn't leave Clark behind. Sorry, Mr. Captain, he is my friend. Your friend. That cannibalistic monster? Captain Stone was stunned in disbelief. Hayala and Zion also looked at each other with confusion in their eyes. Joan, where did you know this frost giant? Why haven't you heard of it before? Holden tentatively asked. Friends we met on the trip to the north half a year ago. We used to travel together and take risks together. Joan briefly explained two sentences and he was stuck in his heart and could not continue. Holden nodded sympathetically and said softly around his shoulders, Your friend is everyone's friend, don't worry, let's take care of this Mr. Frost Giant together, we can always try to help him wake up. I look choke. This guy is not sick enough. Captain Stone rubbed his chin and grinned. Uncle, you shouldn't be nagging. Hey Isla glared at Mr. Captain Crow's mouth angrily. At this time, Elder Hunt came hurriedly, holding Joan's hand tightly, grateful, Mr. Master, thank you for saving Mr. Hina. Clark is my old friend, you don't have to be polite. Joan noticed that Elder Hunt seemed to care about Clark and asked him, Elder, what's wrong with brother Clark, that's what makes this crazy look. Dot. Elder Hunter stopped talking, sighed, and said bitterly, it's not clear what a sentence or two are about this matter. Let's take Mr. Hina back to rest first, then sit down and talk slowly. Joan nodded, and remotely controlled the mage ghost palm to hold Clark, following Elder Hunter down the tower. Captain Stone, Hayla, Audrey, and Holden also followed with curiosity. Going through the courtyard of the Elder's house and entering a big house, Joan immediately smelled the smell of herbal medicine, and there was a special large bed directly opposite the door, apparently Clark's bed. Joan helped Clark lie on the bed, and when he saw that he was still awake, he took a chair and sat by the bed. Elder Hunter took care of the guests, then sat down and began to talk about his meeting with Clark Hennill. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, 
www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1146 Strange Disease 1 at the turn of spring and summer every year. Our Elk Town General will pack the leather trucks accumulated last year and sell them to the Freeport in the South for exchange, such as food, salt and spirits. This year is no exception. I led the caravan on the road in early April. The journey south was smooth. After the goods were delivered in the Freeport, the caravan returned with the bulk of the purchased materials. The first part of the return journey was also relatively smooth. Until the beginning of June, when the caravan entered the Fangshan Mountain, it was frequently harassed by snow monsters and terror wolves, and a lot of people were damaged. One evening, we hurried in a snow-covered canyon, and suddenly a large group of monsters poured out on the hillsides on both sides launching a crazy siege on our caravan. Speaking of the original encounter, Elder Hunt's face flashed with a flutter of throbbing, and he still felt scared after a few days. Just when we were almost unstoppable, a tall figure came in the snow and flew the fierce snow monster freely with one punch. Thanks to his help, the people of my family and I were able to survive. A life-saving benefactor is Clark Hine. Elder Hunter gave a grateful glance to the sleeping giant Frost on the bed, and then told about his later experience. Mr. Hino happened to pass by the snowy mountains at that time and saw that we were besieged by monsters. He saved us and said he was going to Nilfheim, although we don't know why he wanted to go to the Mist Kingdom in the Arctic Circle, where monsters are rampant. But everyone's destination is in the north, I invited him to go with him, and there was a good care during the journey. Mr. Hinner accepted my invitation and revealed to me that he suffered from an unknown strange disease and often fell into a lethargy without warning. If he is seen, he need not be fussed. At first I didn't pay much attention to the strange disease he said, but during the subsequent journey, Mr. Hinner often collapsed inexplicably. We had to carry him to the truck to rest usually for a day or two. He will wake up on his own. It seems no big deal. During the trip, I also noticed a strange thing. Elder Hunter lowered his voice and his expression became somewhat mysterious. During Mr. Hindle's lethargy, we occasionally encounter monster harassment. Whenever this happens, Mr. Hindle always wakes up suddenly. His expression is dull, his eyes are blank, he calls his name. He should not it was sleepwalking silently rushing towards the monster and punching hard. It's as strong as a mutant snow monster, and it's not Mr. Hinner's opponent. He was knocked down every three punches and two feet. The rest of the monsters were scared and fled when they saw him so brave. When the crisis was lifted, even stranger things happened. Mr. Hinner seemed to be suddenly withdrawn from his soul, fell straight on the battlefield, and fell into a lethargy again. This happened three times during the trip which made me very worried. Elder Hunter sighed and said anxiously, after returning to Elk Town, I will keep Mr. Hyle for a few more days. At that time, his condition had seriously deteriorated and he was not suitable for traveling alone. He had to accept my request to repair and heal in the town. Mr. Hinner came to Elk Town at the end of June, and for almost half a month later, he spent half of his time in a lethargic state. Sometimes he fell asleep for three or four days, and his body became weaker and more conscious. Unclear symptoms are also getting worse. Mr. Hinner was always friendly to people when he was awake. The young people and children in the town loved him and respected him very much. Unfortunately, we have tried everything we can to help Mr. Hinner cure the unknown sleeping sickness. For more than half a month, I tried feeding him herbal medicine, and tried to remove disease and shift except for curse treatments like curse, the results were all ineffective, and Mr. Hyle's condition still showed no signs of improvement. To this day, he probably felt that Elk Town was on the verge of destruction, and he woke up from his sleep, just like sleepwalking as usual. Fortunately, it was still clear who was a friend and who was an enemy, but after the enemy was killed, he was cut heart. This is an unprecedented symptom, which shows that his condition has deteriorated to a very dangerous stage. Elder Hunt said anxiously, Elder, listening to you saying, we already know Mr. Hyle's situation, 
but there is still a question that needs to be answered, Audrey observed Elder Hunt's look and asked softly, Winter is the reason why the fort sent troops to siege Elk Town? The question she asked happened to be the same question shared by Joan, Captain Stone, Hayla and Holden. The eyes of everyone gathered on the face of Elder Hunt, and he was expected to give a positive answer. Elder Hunt's tired face seemed hesitant, and it took a long time before he answered. Actually, I don't understand any grudges between Winter Castle and Mr. Heinil, but four days ago, I did receive a magic letter from Winter Castle, the sender was the adopted son of Winterberg Lord Rim. His Highness Vinya, the Winter Prince's White Prince asked me in the letter if there is a frost giant carrying a silver collar with him in Elk Town, if the answer is yes, he asks me to send this frost giant to Winter Castle, sent to his father, I don't understand what Trim and Vinya's sons and sons have done to Mr. Hina, and I have never seen any silver collar on Mr. Hina, but the letter from Vinil's letter is not it's hard to see that the frost giant he was looking for was Clark Hennil and most of them weren't well intentioned, of course I don't want to offend Winter Castle, but Mr. Hinl is my life saving benefactor after all, and he cannot be handed over to the demonic believers of Winter Castle in any case, after some hard consideration, I finally returned to Vegneal Lyde and told him that Mr. Hinl had left Elk Town two days ago and went to the Temple of Stygian in the area of Nvolheim, you don't have to say that you can guess, Prince White doesn't believe my lies at all. The second letter is more severely worded and makes a naked threat, claiming that if I refuse to hand over Mr. Heil, the whole Elk Town have to be buried with him. Nothing to hide. When I received the second letter, I was already a little shaken, and I even regretted taking Mr. Heil, but Elder Hunt shook his head, tears in his eyes seemed to flash, no matter how can I betray a life-saving benefactor which I really can't do, now it seems that Vinia's threat will never stop at the verbal level, the Winterhold Cavaliers stationed outside the town are an obvious signal that more enemies will come to siege the town, this disaster is not over, like master Mr. Joan, please collect, www.ntlnovel.com master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest, chapter 1147 strange disease 2 am wholeheartedly repaying my gratitude, but I can't affect the compatriots in the town, let alone the good hearted people who are your supporters, Elder Hunt raised his head and resolutely said, tonight, I will take Mr. Hyle in Elk Town, we will bear all the consequences, and will never involve others. Elder, I admire your integrity and courage, but your decision is not sensible. Audrey warned Elder Hunter. At this point, it is not affordable for you alone. Even if you take Mr. Heinier away, the father and son of Trim will not let go of the elk town that angered them, otherwise the Lord of Winterberg and the White where is the prince's face? I am afraid that only by completely destroying this town will they be able to restore their face. Elder Hunt shook his head, just about to refute, Joan opened the mouth first. Elder, if you insist on leaving, please allow me to go with you. Young man, it's none of your business. Brother Clark is my friend and I can't just watch him fall into the claws of the believers in Koska. Joan looked firm and couldn't refuse. After listening to the elder hunter, he has basically guessed the origin of the grudge between Winter Castle and Clark. White Prince Vinya secretly mentioned a silver collar in the letter, but he did not know exactly what kind of collar he was, nor did he explain how Clark would carry such a collar with him. Hunt the elders were puzzled but Joan had already seen through the mysteries. The so-called silver collar refers to the Koschi collar he and Clark obtained during the treasure hunt in the city of clouds the artifact that the abyss lord Koschi had worn. Winterborg Lord Trim is a devout believer in Coe's church, and is also the leader of the Coe's church church in the new world and the entire Vale's world. He is a high-level pastor and is comparable to the mainstream church. Of course, he was able to get some kind of revelation from the idol he worshipped, and then learned that the Koschi collar fell into Clark's hands. The Koschi church collar is like the supreme sacred object in the minds of all members of the church church. How can it be tolerated by the pagan Clark, whether it is out of the oracles of Koschi himself, or to practice fanatical religious beliefs? 
Trim will reclaim this artifact collar from Clark at all costs. Judging from Trim's initial move, this person was still very suffocated. In order to avoid the expansion of events, Trim did not personally break into Elk Town to seize the collar, and did not even personally come forward. Instead, he entrusted his adopted son, Venia, to negotiate with the Elder Hunter by letter. After the negotiation failed, he vigorously launched a siege. So far, the actions of the Winter Castle side have been relatively restrained, and this is precisely the most terrible place. The unreasonable fanatics are not worthy of fear. It is really the sleepy and cautious old fox trim, who is hard to get out of when he is stared at. Joan, if you insist on doing this, then I will also miss a hile to escape from Elk Town. Holden solemnly said his decision, don't say it has nothing to do with me, how do you treat friends, how friends treat you. Audrey glared at her brother angrily, complaining about his recklessness, but when it was her turn, she could only make the same choice. Hey Isla is no exception. I really don't know what to say about you, can crazy be contagious? Captain Stone looked at Joan, hey Isla, Audrey and Holden shaking his hair angrily. You little guys, don't know how terrible the winter hold Lord Trim. Your impulsive decision will only kill your life in vain, and ultimately you won't be able to save Clark Henya. Why bother? You don't care. Hey Isla shouted back angrily. Captain Stone sighed forehead, not knowing what to say. Elder Hunter stood up and said to everyone, it's past noon. Let's go get some food and then discuss what to do next. Captain Stone nodded and got up and walked out the door. Hey Isla, Audrey and Holden also followed, except that Joan was sitting still in front of the bed. Joanne, you. Audrey stood in front of the door and cast a worried glance back. Relax, I won't sneak away, just want to stay here and accompany brother Clark more. Joan said quietly. Okay. He'll give you food later. Audrey sighed, closing the door lightly, and the ward became dim, as if it was wiped out by the endless haze, making it breathless. Joan returned to the hospital bed and silently observed Clark, who was sleeping, except for his pale and haggard appearance, and he could not see any other obvious symptoms. What strange disease did Clark suffer? Why did he faint without warning, and began to sleepwalk inexplicably? even madly in the state of sleepwalking, swallowing people's hearts. Joan wanted to wake Clark and ask these questions to him. However, he knew clearly that even if Clark woke up, most of them were still unconscious, and he might not be able to help himself to answer doubts, and he could not even recognize his old friend. Considering all the uncontrollable risks, Joan had to give up Clark's plan to awaken Clark and instead performed two rings of higher endoscopy to directly check his health. Dot. Health status, critically ill infected with unknown supernatural disease. Attributes, strength 36 belt plus 4, dexterity 14, constitution 24, intellect 11, wisdom 6 disease 10, charisma 12. Dot. The results of the interview showed that Clark was infected with a supernatural disease, which was what Joan expected, but Clark's sensory attributes were severely weakened by the disease, which was an unusual symptom. During his research on insecticides, Joan, by the way, read a lot of literature about various supernatural diseases, and found that most of the diseases cause harm to the human body, mainly in terms of physique making people become weaker and weaker. In addition, there are also individual diseases that have little effect on the patient's physical attributes, but will damage the brain, weaken the patient's intellectual attributes, and eventually eventually completely lose the ability to think and become an idiot. But the disease that Clark is infected at the moment is different from the above two situations. It is not the physique or intelligence that is affected by the virus, but the perception attribute. After being surprised, Joan recalled Clark's crazy performance on the battlefield this morning, and then linked his perception attribute to being severely weakened by the virus, and the doubt in his mind gradually unraveled. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1148 Dragon Blood 1 If a person's perception attribute is too low, 
even if the intelligence level is not bad, it is difficult to communicate normally with the person, either it seems numb and indifferent, lacks compassion, or it is impossible to control its emotions, sometimes moody, and sometimes hysterical, and often makes unintelligible grotesque behaviors. A person with below average intelligence may seem a little silly, but there is no lack of emotion and humanity, and a person with severely below average perception has no human nature at all, and cannot separate the boundary between and madness. Everything can be done. Clark's behavior has already shown signs of madness. If his condition deteriorates according to this trend, I am afraid that it will not be long before his perception attribute will be reduced to zero. If it were that day, Clark would never wake up again. Even if there was still breathing and heartbeat, it was just a living dead person who would never sleep. Joan raised his hand to evoke the tears of God, soaked the water, and made a potion. It took a lot of time to feed Carrot to overcome the potion. A potion containing mythical energy has a certain antiviral function, and Joan hopes to relieve Clark's disease. After feeding him the medicine, Joan again observed Clark's physical condition through higher endoscopy but unfortunately there was no change compared to the previous one. This shows that this potion, which can only be used to prevent and treat common diseases, is not very helpful for the treatment of unknown supernatural diseases infected by Clark. Joan couldn't help but feel disappointed, sighed, took a needle from the storage bag, plunged into Clark's arm, took a tube of blood, took a few drops as a sample and cooperated with number 4 Unru Nansius to perform mythical blood interpretation ceremony. Supernatural diseases can also be understood as a negative supernatural ability, which can also be resolved from blood samples in a magical way. Joan has more than one or two magic marks resolved from Clark's blood samples. Part of this comes from his professional abilities, such as frost rage and frost armor, as well as the innate cold subspecies feature of the frost giant from lie immune to cold damage and fear of fire, and finally it is a magic mark corresponding to an unknown disease. Joan carefully observes the last magic mark, but its structure is too complicated and abstract, and after studying for a long time, he can only see a little bit of detail. When the patient's sensory attributes are reduced to zero, the soul will be completely eroded by the virus, and the flesh will be completely changed. What does it look like? Joanne couldn't understand it, and he didn't dare to make a conclusion. Joan wrote the magic mark representing the unknown strange disease into his spell book according to the Gord painting. Afterwards, he carefully read it twice. As a result, the more he looked at the brain, the more chaotic it was. This feeling reminded him that not long ago, Holden copied a contemporary painting for him, pointed to the pile of stiff and messy colorful lines on the canvas, and vowed to him to declare, this is an angry bull. However, Joan looked left and right, and looked up and down, and he couldn't see the bull's image anyway. Holden told him, don't use your reason to understand modern art, completely put aside prejudices, use your body to feel and associate so that you can truly appreciate the beauty of modern art. Joan worked hard as he said, but to no avail, he just couldn't feel the bull's presence on the canvas. Moreover, how can we prove that what is shown on the canvas must be the bull? Anyway, it's just a group of children's graffiti lines. You can think of a bull. I can think of it as a ram or wildebeest. Is there any theorem or formula to conclude that my understanding is wrong? And are you correct? It doesn't seem to be. Holden said that artistic feeling is a very personal thing. In addition to truth, there are endless black boxes, and what is contained in the black boxes is aesthetics. Joanne admits he lacks artistic cells, but he is willing to believe that Holden is right, at least in part. For example, in the face of this extremely chaotic abstract magic mark, he felt the boundary of reason. For objects that are not based on logic, logical thinking is powerless and can only give up thinking. Of course, Joanne also feels that the boundaries of knowledge are not static, and rational cognition is always in a spiraling state. Some things can't be understood now, it may just because the knowledge reserve is not rich enough. When your knowledge grows to a certain extent in the future, 
your horizons will become broader, and you may be able to understand those expressions that are too abstract whether it is modern art or mark of magic. Joan sighed, put down the pen, and returned to the bed. Clark is still sleeping, although his condition has not improved, at least there is no sign of deterioration. Joan felt relieved and went back to his desk to put Clark's blood sample in the Kingbing blood storage box. After he decided to return to school, he asked Professor Moriarty to help analyze the blood sample, maybe he could understand the magic mark he didn't understand, and find a cure for Clark. Of course, the premise is to ensure that Clark escapes the pursuit of the Winter Castle, which is not an easy task. Kiaun was standing alone in the ward and had nothing to do. Thinking of the white dragon he had killed before, he took the dragon corpse out of his backpack and placed it in the center of the floor. After visually inspecting the indoor space, he felt that it was enough to accommodate the white dragon corpse. Temporarily suppress shrinkage to restore the body to its original size. The rapid expansion of the dragon corpse forced Joan to retreat again and again until he was in front of the hospital bed. The corpse stopped expanding and stabilized exuding bitter cold. Joan rubbed his frozen hands and cast a ring of protection spells on his body to endure the environment. The cold feeling was immediately relieved. The blood flowing in Bei Long's body is always below the freezing point and contains abundant cold magic power. Even after death, this magic power will still be preserved in the corpse for a long time, so Bei Long's corpse will not rot and deteriorate. In addition to blood, dragon skin, Dragon scales, dragon bones, dragon teeth and dragon meat also have extremely high academic and commercial value. Dragon skin and dragon scales can be used to make magic armor. Dragon teeth and dragon bones are also used to make magic guides. Good embryo material, dragon meat and dragon blood are widely used alchemy materials. If Joan sells the body of the white dragon to a golf business firm, he wouldn't dare to say more and 20,000 gold dugo is still not a problem. However, Joanne's current economic situation is okay. For the time being, it is not necessary to sell the dragon corpse for money, and it is more inclined to keep this dragon corpse as a research sample. Maybe it will be used when writing a paper in the future. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest. Chapter 1149 Dragon Blood 2 Joan likes money and papers. If the two can only choose the same, he will always prefer the latter unless he is starving to death. Joan took out the largest needle tube. The spine was against the wall, moved the footsteps carefully, circled around the body of the white dragon, found a wound with scales falling off and broken dragon skin, from which the needle was dropped and penetrated deeply into the blood vessel, draw a tube full of dragon blood, as soon as the needle is pulled out, the water vapor near the needle hole automatically condenses into frost, preventing blood from flowing out, Joan held the frosted needle tube on the outer wall of the glass and found that the needle had been twisted into a curved shape, he could not help secretly marveling at the toughness of the dragon skin. He specially found a place where the dragon scales did not protect the needle and still received great resistance. Dot. Joan injects the blood from the needle into the reagent bottle and takes out a few drops as a sample for analysis. A cloud of blood rises from the mouth of the test tube. Compared with other blood samples that Joan has analyzed before, the cloud formed by the white dragon blood sample has a unique characteristic that the cloud is surrounded by a beautiful pale blue luster. Kiaan looked closely at the blood cloud, and first distinguished ten spell configurations from it. Except for wind creation and cloud mist, the others were first and zero ring spells and there was nothing new. White Dragon is not well known for its ability to cast spells, nor does Joan expect to learn new spells from it. His research focuses on the supernatural ability of White Dragon. Joan just observed the magic mark of Clark's supernatural disease, which was contaminated by spirit. Looking back at these magic marks resolved in the dragon blood, although they also have abstract ingredients, they look much more comfortable. At least they can carrying out a logical analysis, the more he looked at the more intimate, 
and even made him feel a sense of being cured. This adult white dragon's blood sample has resolved a total of five sets of magic marks. Joan first observed from the most familiar, and at a glance recognized that this group of magic marks corresponded to the characteristics of cold subspecies. This is not a unique ability of the white dragon. Frost giants, snow monsters, and winter wolves also have similar attributes. The effect is to be immune to cold damage and also suffer double fire damage. This set of magic marks is too common. Joan has transcribed more than once, so he is too lazy to move on and continue to the next set. Joan is no stranger to the next set of magic marks. If you compare in the supernatural ability category, this set of magic marks is almost the same as Fear Aura. If compared horizontally with the spell configuration, this set of magical imprints is similar to the three ring fear of six or seven points, but the occupied magic energy level is higher. Obviously, the supernatural abilities corresponding to this set of magical imprints are the common ferocious in dragons, and there is a more well-known common name called Long Y. Joan copied the magical imprint of ferocious and then observed the third group of magical imprints. Well, this is also a familiar face. The supernatural ability corresponding to this set of magic marks is the frozen breath of an adult white dragon, commonly known as Dragon Breath which can cause six levels of cold damage to all creatures in a 40-foot cone in front of it. In the blood samples of mutated snow monster and winter wolf, Joan has analyzed similar breathing abilities. The adult white dragon's dragon breath is more powerful than the winter wolf, but weaker than the mutant snow monster. As a true dragon with pure blood, I have to say that it is a bit embarrassing. In fact, this is normal. After all, among all the real dragons, the white dragon is almost the weakest chicken breed, and it can be called the shame of the dragon race. It is no wonder that the frost giant was caught as a pet. The fourth set of magic marks passed by Joan from the blood sample of the white dragon corresponds to the supernatural immunity generally possessed by dragon creatures. Specifically, it is not affected by any paralysis or sleep effects. The symptoms of paralysis and sleep caused by poisoning, spellcasting, or other supernatural abilities are ineffective against the dragon race. The last set of magic marks in the white dragon blood sample is the highlight of Joan's research. This set of magic marks is attached to the white dragon's body surface and is closely dependent on dragon scales and dragon skins. If the dragon scales and dragon skins are peeled off, this supernatural ability called true dragon armor will no longer exist. The magic mark of true dragon armor is more complicated and can be subdivided into three functional modules. The first module, corresponding to the natural defense of the adult white dragon, is actually a dragon skin with dense scales attached. With dragon scales and dragon skins, the equivalent defense level is up to level 17. What level of defense is this? For example, put two sets of stainless steel forged knight plate armor together and then cover them with a layer of cowhide. The defensive effect added together is almost equivalent to a dragon skin with scales. Ordinary people put on two sets of plate armor, and then covered with a layer of leather, basically can't move. On the other hand, dragon skin is not much different from ordinary leather. The armor made of it has tough defense and light texture, and it is worthy of being the top armor material in the world. The second functional module of true dragon armor corresponds to a layer of invisible magic enchantment. Attacking an adult white dragon with all iron weapons will be hindered by magic enchantment, reducing some damage, while enchanted weapons will not be affected. The third functional module of true dragon armor corresponds to spell resistance. When the caster attacks the true dragon, the spells released may be resisted by the dragon scales, and will not exert its destructive power. True dragons of different types and ages have different spell resistance. Adult white dragon's magic resistance is not too high, so when Joan first cast fireball to bombard this evil dragon, he didn't bless the precise casting specifically for cracking the magic resistance in advance, and he was confident to strike with his own mana. Where the opponent's magic resistance, in the end, as he wished, the white dragon failed to resist the fireball technique, and his scorched head was shattered. Looking back now, 
Joanne must admit that, in addition to his strength, his luck was not bad at the time, although the adult white dragon had a low resistance, it actually had a certain probability of resisting the fireball bombardment. Joan transcribed the magic seal of true dragon armor into his spell book, and then collected the blood sample of white dragon into the Kingbing blood storage box. He was planning to shrink the dragon corpse, withdraw the storage bag, and there was a brisk footsteps outside the door as well as familiar laughter. Joan, we bring you two hot pumpkin pie, and two guests from Shizu Township they claim to be your old friends, I heard that you are here, specially came to visit. Outside the door, Hayala shouted with great energy. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect, www.ntlnovel.com Master Mr. Joan's literature update is the fastest. Chapter 1150 Old Friend What is Self-Proclaimed? We were originally Joan's old friends. Another girl's voice came from outside the door, and the tone of the conversation showed a hearty personality. Go and ask Joan, I don't believe it. The Yankee dare not recognize me as a friend. Joan heard the familiar voice, and the face of a pretty young girl with short hair immediately appeared in front of her. Isn't that really the Iron Rose of Shizu Town? He hurried around the dragon corpse and pushed open the door. Sure enough, in addition to the sisters of Hayala and Zion, there were two young men and women dressed in Azar hunting suits. There were the old friends whom I met when I was traveling in the Fangshan Mountains, the two brothers and sisters of the Wall Sunj family, Hakang, Saluda, long time no see, old friend. I'm so happy to see you here. Hakan Walsung rushed over excitedly and hugged Joan. Slud Walsinger glanced at Hayala proudly, saying half jokingly and half launtingly, How about, I said Joan you us. Hayala didn't care. He threw around pumpkin pie in his hands and whirled it fast at his fingertips, as if he was playing acrobatics. Since everyone is a friend, don't see you outside hurry into the house. Hayala flew into the house, almost hit the huge dragon corpse, scared her yelling, jumped out hurriedly, and then shouted at a double volume, cake. Pumpkin pie ran away. Slud's eyes were fast and he grabbed the pumpkin pie before it fell to the ground and handed it to Joan. Hurry up and eat, otherwise it will be used as a juggling toy. What do you mean, little girl, I suspect you are mocking me. Hayala stared at Slud her high ponytails faithfully reflecting her mood. Ha, ah, with your small size, I'm so sorry to say that I am a little girl, Slude, with her hands on her hips, looked down on a pair of ponytail girls who were shorter than herself. It seemed that she was much more mature than the other, although the age advantage was only one year old. The two of you were arguing non-stop as soon as you met each other. It was inexplicable. Audrey shook her head helplessly. Joanne felt that Sluder and Hayala seemed to fit together, otherwise a Slud's personality was unlikely to quarrel with someone he had just met. He turned and waved at the white dragon's body, restarted the shrinkage technique applied to the dragon's body, and then reduced the volume of the dragon's body to on Tifeth to recover the storage bag and free up indoor space to entertain the guests. After everyone was seated, Joan finally had the opportunity to ask Hakan and Sluder, How did you come here? Elk Town has always had a good relationship with our Shizu Town. Most of the residents in the town are our fellow Asa tribes. Elder Hunter was born in the Walsunch family. My father heard that this town was under siege by monsters and sent me and Sluder came over to look at the situation here, maybe it can help. Hakang replied. Did you be blocked by the frost giant in Winterhold when you came in? We flew in directly by riding a crow, and those frost giants outside the town wouldn't be able to fly, even if I found out that Sluder and I couldn't stop it. Pekang smiled smugly. This is also thanks to Joan killing the white dragon at Dongbao this morning, otherwise you will not be able to fly in so easily. Audrey said seriously. Yeah, Joan. You are so powerful. You actually killed an adult white dragon by hand. If you are our Azat tribe, the merit of this dragon slaughter is enough to become a big bard hero. Pekang threw a slap on Joan's shoulder excitedly. Holden coughed twice, 
Speaking of the minstrel, the man is planning to write a narrative poem describing the Battle of Elk Town. Joan is the protagonist. I don't want to be a protagonist. Joan shook his head embarrassedly. Besides the war is not over, Dragon Hero may not live to the end. After listening to him, everyone's emotions also fell and the room fell silent. Joan realized that he had said something disappointing and was very disappointed. He took the initiative to break the deadlock and introduce the current difficulties of Elk Town to the Walsinger brothers and sisters, hoping that they could move more rescuers from Shizu Town and save Elk Town from destroy. Joan, although Shizu Town and Dongbao are not allies, we have never had a head and conflict. The situation in Elk Town is similar to Shizu Town. Why did Dong Bao want to besiege Elk Town in a big way? Trim and what do Vinya and his son want in this small town? Slud's face was grim, and the question he raised was extremely sharp. If it's just for looting livestock, food and slaves, frankly speaking, even if Dong Bao can finally break through Elk Town. The price paid is far greater than the gains. The old fox of Trim is very smart, I don't think he will do this kind of loss trading. Joan thought about it and felt that there was no need to hide the truth from his brothers and sisters, so he briefly described the grudges between Winter Castle and Clark. The details related to the Koshirch collar were too sensitive. Before Clark's consent was obtained, he was inconvenient to disclose to outsiders and he took it in a single word. For Elder Hunt, the current situation is indeed very difficult. Slud showed sympathy, Mr. Hinner is the benefactor of Elder Hunt and even the Elk Town. If he succumbs to the pressure of Winter Castle, betray the benefactor he is really ashamed of his conscience, but if he insists on sheltering Mr. Hinner, he angers the Lord of the East Fort and all the townsmen may suffer the destruction. Should we sacrifice our lives to protect the benefactors at all costs, or bow our heads to reality and would rather forget to be ungrateful and try to preserve more relatives and friends? This is a difficult multiple choice question. Confined to this framework, no matter what choices are made, it is still difficult to feel comfortable. So, is it possible to break the limits and get rid of the situation of being forced to choose one from the other? In terms of the current situation of Elk Town, the possibility of withstanding the pressure of Dong Bao is very small. If you want to get rid of the predicament, you can only ask for assistance from the outside world. With such a thought, Joan simply pointed out to the brothers and sisters of Wal Sanj, Hakang, Slau, relying solely on the defensive strength of Elk Town cannot withstand the offensive of Dong Bao. Can Shizu Town be seen in the same race? For the sake of reinforcement, send reinforcements to help Elk Town resist the invasion of the Frost Giant? Of course it is. Ha Kang was about to speak, but was stopped by the sister's harsh eyes, and he had to close his mouth sadly. Joan, we also want to save Elk Town. However, this matter is too extensive. It is not up to me and Ha Kang to decide. I will send a letter to my father as soon as possible and tell the truth about the situation in Elk Town. Please ask my father to try to convince the elders of the clan agreed to send troops to rescue. Slud sighed and said apologetically, Sorry, that's all we can do. Like Master Mr. Joan, please collect www.mtlnovel.com Master Mr. Jones Literature Update is the fastest.